Okay? Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Bill Trainer. I'm the Dean of Georgetown Law. Uh, and it's a privilege to welcome you to 10 years after the financial crisis, closing loopholes and avoiding blind spots. Um, actually, if I, if I could have everyone's attention. Um, we were originally going to have, be, have as our opening speaker uh, Paul Volcker, uh, who's, of course, two-term chair of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve and one of the great figures in the history of the country. Uh, but we just found out that uh, for reasons of health, he would not be able to be here today. Um, so please keep him in your thoughts. And, and we're here uh, beginning a little late. But it's really it's an extraordinary program. And it's a topic of the greatest import. Um, you know, as I was, I was coming in today, I was thinking back on 10 years ago. Uh, when I was in New York. And I think everybody can remember, it was a time of almost palpable panic. Um, you know, I lived, lived in Manhattan, and I just remember in the second half of September and October, you know, walking down the streets and how eerily quiet it was. Uh, people weren't shopping, they weren't going out to eat. Uh, there was a sense that we were on the cusp of a Great Depression. Uh, and it, you know, it affected everybody. You know, I think every sector was grappling with, you know, the, the day that Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy, the Dow went down four and a half points. Later in September, it went down, actually on, on basically this day 10 years ago, the Dow went down 7%. Uh, and we all thought, this might be the next Great Depression. Um, you know, and, and it didn't just affect finance. It didn't just affect industry. I mean, I remember meetings, you know, 10 years ago as a university leader, you know, where we thought, you know, we budgeted on the basis of endowment spending out. You know, and now the, not only is the endowment cut in half, but under state laws, we can't touch the endowment because all, all of the accounts are underwater. So, Every great university in the country was thinking, are we going to be able to pay, make our payroll? Are we going to be able to pay the people who work here? And if we can't, what happens? So it was something that was pervasive and powerful and touched everyone and has had an extraordinary legacy for a decade. You know, it obviously has transformed economics. It's transformed economic regulation. It's transformed politics. You know, I think, you know, most of the commentators think that the people who lost out in 2008, who've never come back, industries, sectors of the country, vulnerable people, you know, were the key to President Trump's election in 2016. But I think it was also, it was also the key to, or could have been the key to President Obama's election in 2008. I actually looked this morning uh, if you look at the polls in the first half of September uh, of 2008, actually in most of the polls, you know, Senator McCain was in the lead in the first half of 2008. He was ahead in, by 10 points in the Gallup poll. And then after October 1st, it was then Senator Obama in literally every poll. So it's had the most profound economic change. It has the most profound political ramifications. And this is a moment in which 10 years afterwards, we're now grappling with, where are we now? What are the lessons we've learned? What are the lessons we've forgotten? And what's the path forward for the economy, for justice, for nation, and for the world? And we have really an extraordinary group of speakers and participants today. Uh, and I just want to thank everybody here in this room. It's really, it's extraordinary for me to look at the list of participants. Uh, and I particularly want to thank, and I'll turn matters over, uh, Professor Emma Jordan. You know, I think, you know, we're all so privileged to have Professor Jordan as a colleague. I'd like a round of applause for Professor Jordan. <laughs> You know, she is 
one of the great voices in our time for justice. In every dimension she has fought throughout her career, her career to make this world a more just place. And one great focus of her work, one area in which she's had the most powerful influence has been in economic justice and civil rights. So, um, you know, she put together this conference brilliantly and it's a privilege to call her to the stage to lay our groundwork for the day, Professor Jordan. With a brilliant dean like that and support, how can you fail? You really can't. It's amazing. He's remembering his experience in New York, uh, which was, in fact, the center of the crisis on Wall Street. We know things Dean Trainer has reminded us of all the cross-cutting impacts of the failure of Lehman Brothers, but we also know that there is a period between March of 2008 and September of 2008. Bear Stearns nearly failed in 2008 in March, and there was a hastily structured rescue in which that firm was sold to a Wall Street firm, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, and the sale was structured to take away all of the bad assets, put them on the government books, and give the good assets at a fire sale price to J.P. Morgan Chase. This structure was done by way of a trust. It was the Maiden Lane uh, Trust, and that trust was um, an ad hoc structure that was created because at that point the government didn't quite know what its powers were under uh, Section 13.3 of the Federal Reserve Act. So they were just uh, experimenting and trying to do something that would stave off sure disaster. Now, the record of Bear Stearns at that time showed signs for anybody who was paying attention they were doing what is called taking haircuts on uh, repo transactions. They were taking less than their ordinary fee. Now, you know, on Wall Street, they don't leave money on the table unless there's a reason. And so that uh, fact that Bear Stearns, leading up to this period in 2000, March of 2008, was taking these haircuts was a signal that something was wrong. And then the intervention of the government. First, uh, there was a bid of uh, $2 a share. Then there was a, a bid uh, when the employee said, that's not even enough to cover the headquarters building, that uh, it went up to $10 a share, whoopee. So we have, in fact, uh, a harbinger of the total collapse uh, with Lehman Brothers. And so this anniversary is one that many in the industry said they could not have foreseen. Let me just remind you about some of the voices that we heard uh, in this period. There were those who said, oh, we couldn't have foreseen it. We heard from Prince, who was then head of uh, Citibank, oh, we couldn't have foreseen it. There were those who used the natural disaster metaphor. Even Chairman Bernanke said uh, in his testimony to the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, he said, uh, this was like a storm, unpredictable storm. And there were others who used the natural disaster metaphor. Well, uh, the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, when it published its report, said this crisis was completely unavoidable, uh, completely avoidable, and uh, it wasn't a natural disaster. It wasn't an unexpected storm. 
It was instead the product of many variables, many forces. Here, 10 years later, our collective memory of the damage caused by that crisis has faded. And that is the genesis for this conference. I'll get to introduce Sheila there later. And my introduction of Sheila, I'll give you a preview of one of the things I'll say about her, is she is an unindicted co-conspirator for the creation of this conference. She, <laughs> she and I talked, and you know when somebody says, why don't we do uh, X or Y, you should really go in the opposite direction. Even at my age, I was not smart enough to take that wisdom. I said, sure, we can do it. And of course, um, we put it together and she was an important collaborator and supporter of this project. So we were concerned that an amnesia had set in, that the deregulatory philosophy that was so much a cause of the collapse and of the crisis, where the non banking sector had assets that were higher in value at one point in 2007, higher than the regulated banking sector. And uh, all of that data is in the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission report. So that unregulated sector is the product of a philosophy. It wasn't accidental. It was a philosophy, and the philosophy was that markets work and let them work their magic. There were uh, people from the consumer sector who came to Alan Greenspan, who was chair at that time of the uh, Federal Reserve, and told him about the targeting of minority communities with bad loans, told him about problems that were cropping up in California. And he said, that's not evidence. Those are anecdotes. And uh, kept going with the deregulatory philosophy. And I use the word philosophy uh, very loosely. It was more like a religion. It was a commitment uh, in the face of contrary evidence. And so Sheila and I, are concerned that it appears that crisis amnesia is bringing back the deregulatory commitments. The Consumer Financial Protection Board is under attack in its structure and with the uh, departure of the uh, Richard Cordray, the original head of the agency, uh, Rick Mulvaney, has come in temporarily uh, to uh, set the agenda, but it's a deregulatory agenda and a commitment to deregulation is a part of it. You heard the Dean express our disappointment that Paul Volcker won't be here, but Paul Volcker is a legendary former chair of the Federal Reserve. And Paul, uh, has a rule, you know you're famous when the rule is named after you. There's no rule named after most of us, right? But the Volcker rule is a rule that expresses a contrary philosophy, which is that if you as a financial intermediary are getting insured deposits as your source of funding, or at least one of your sources of funding, you should not be in the business of putting investments gambling on Wall Street. And so he set up a series of uh, rules that were designed to uh, address that issue. Well, that's now being rolled back slowly, and we've yet to see, maybe coming in the future, this may be a problem. Let me give you a few facts about what the searing political, economic, and emotional losses of the crisis that every American has sustained. 
more than $23 trillion of wealth disappeared during the crisis years. By 2010, 42 million citizens had fallen into poverty. This is the largest number since the Census Bureau first published these estimates in 1959. The San Francisco Federal Reserve just this summer published a study looking at the crisis and what did they find? The crisis had imposed losses, economic losses on every single American, not every family, not every adult, every single American of $70,000. And it was the judgment of the Federal Reserve in San Francisco that this $70,000 of losses would be permanent. So those are the economic losses. The crisis in addition to the economic losses, uh, brought emotional damage. We have the study that was done by Case and Deaton. They did a study looking at excess morbidity uh, and mortality rates. Here's what they found, that there was a pattern of increased deaths. This started before the crisis, but spiked uh, during the crisis years. Uh, they found that there were increased deaths from suicide, opioid addiction, and alcohol-related liver disease among middle-aged whites uh, with less than a high school education. That's startling. Uh, Dean Trainer referred to the political consequence. So this emotional damage is still there in our society. And we are in a state of amnesia as we go forward that we've recovered from the crisis even as new deregulatory initiatives are being launched. So um, these deaths of despair identified by um, Case and Deaton are a part of the fabric of our nation. We're in a fragile point in our politics, need I remind you, <laughs> here in Washington, as we sit here today, there are consequential decisions being made about appointments that show deep fractures in political philosophy, political commitments uh, in our nation. And in our conversation today, we are going to explore whether or not we are headed for another financial panic, there have been valuable changes that have been made, but those changes have not been tested in the crucible of financial panic. So this is a conversation. It's not intended to be the solution, but I'm hoping that our brilliant contributors, including our moderators who are here uh, representing Georgetown Law Center, will, in the course of their uh, discussion, produce some ideas that will be valuable as we go forward. So um, here are some questions that we should consider. One of them is, will the Volcker rule be diluted? Will this pose risk to the financial stability of institutions with insured deposit? What about one of the interventions and uh, restructuring efforts, the stress test? Uh, this was uh, designed to diagnose institutional weakness, initially to restore public confidence during the panic. So. Um, we have reason to be concerned about the stress test. Wall Street Journal reported that some of the largest banks, two of the largest financial institutions, were coached to pass the test. Uh, that doesn't give me confidence. I don't know about you, it didn't give me confidence 
that these that that particular me mechanism is one that's going to be a fail-safe, a protection against future collapse. So the capital requirements, the preparation of living wills, these are all things that were adopted to make sure that we don't have a, another collapse. Well, I want to say that this conference has the unindicted co-conspirator of Sheila Bear, but there is an indicted co-conspirator sitting in the room. And you see the banners, the Institute for New Economic Thinking was a generous supporter and sponsor of this conference. And more than money, but you know, we don't laugh at the money, uh, more than the financial support, the moral support of the Institute for New Economic Thinking under the leadership of Rob Johnson. So um, I want to thank uh, the Institute for New Economic Thinking. And while I'm at it, I want to thank my uh, dean, John McKay, was the first one to get my visit to his office and say, how about this? And he gave me free reign to do what I could, as long as it didn't cost any money. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, we, we managed to pull this together and with the indicted co-conspirator of the Institute for New Economic Thinking, we've been able to make this work. So let me stop and we'll turn to the first of our panels. Um, our moderator is Adam Levitin, one of our esteemed colleagues here who is in the field of banking, contracts, financial, and consumer regulation. And uh, I'm sure I've left something off. He is prolific. He does bankruptcy, uh, so many uh, things. But he is going to lead a panel, and I'll leave it to him to tell you more about that. But we have a fabulous day here in store for you. One of the things that I've mentioned to every moderator is be ruthless in keeping the speakers to their time slot, leave enough time for questions and answers. I want everyone here to participate in this conversation. I am a senior colleague, uh -huh. and I know that when people are involved in subjects about which they're passionate, it's hard to get them to stop talking. And so that's the role of our moderators. Don't think they're being uh, rude. Uh, they're following my guidance. So Adam, would you come up? And we'll start looking at the rules. Uh, what are the rules that were adopted? Adam knows better than anyone. Let's give Adam a round of applause, and we'll get started. Well, go ahead. Okay. Panelists, said, yeah. come up. So we're really honored today to have this wonderful pa panel batting lead off. Um, we have Rob Johnson, who needs no introduction, especially since Emma has already introduced him. Uh, we have Professor Edward Kane from Boston College, and we have Jesse Eisinger from, from ProPublica. And <clears throat> this, uh, this panel is really meant to kind of lay, lay some groundwork for the, discussion in the uh, for the discussion for the remainder of the day. And there's a lot of stuff that we, that, that there's just so much stuff to cover because the crisis laid bare a range of problems in U.S. financial markets, in the regulation of those markets, and in the rule of law more generally. And I, uh, Rob is going to start off by um, providing really kind of an, uh, a big picture overview of, I think, where, where, thing, where he thinks things went wrong and the degree to which we've, started, we've been addressing them. Then uh, I, I think the, the order will be that, uh, that Ed will um, be talking about the, the, the madness of doing the same thing over again um, and the degree to which we have not, he thinks we've not really changed things. 
And I think that some of Ed's comments set up uh, Jesse's comments about the, uh, really about law enforcement and its role in, in, in regulation. So with that, I will turn it over to Rob. Do you want to come up here? Oh, wow, I'm sitting up here. I know there's a Volcker rule. I don't think there's a Johnson rule. <laughs> but there is a guy named Robert Johnson that has lyrics. <laughs> And so I thought long and hard as I was coming down here last night and everybody on the Amtrak train was watching these hearings about the Supreme Court. And I kind of came to the conclusion that no good deed goes unpunished. And I couldn't conceive of how with the echoes of history and that yesterday and this today that Emma Jordan was able to juggle all these dimensions and carry all of this and I'm very grateful to you. So but the lyric that came to mind from Robert Johnson's Crossroads was you can run you can run tell my friend Willie Brown you can run you can run tell my friend Willie Brown but I got the crossroad blues this morning Lord and babe I'm sinking down. I think the Supreme Court and the Senate Judiciary Committee should be singing that along with me. At any rate, I uh, wanted to chat with you a little bit. Uh, it's, it is haunting that the Supreme Court plays such a large role in rulemaking and rule interpretation, and that sits like a cloud over these conversations. But I think there's, uh, I guess what I want to dwell on here a little bit is the, the history of how people came to the place where we are. Let me see if I can make this. Uh, uh, okay. This is about a month ago. Steve Bannon was asked, what did he think was the legacy of 2008? I don't know if the font's large enough, but he said from long-term credit crisis in the late 90s to the implosion of the stock market in 2000 on the internet, to then the financial crisis. Every couple of years we've had another financial crisis and they're building in intensity. The one in 2008 was three orders of magnitude worse than the crash of 29. So write this down. He was speaking to his interviewer. The match that got lit led to November 9th, this was 2016, at 2.30 in the morning when Donald Trump was named President of the United States. He very clearly believes that the disintegration of trust and the disintegration of legitimacy and faith in the United States government was the precursor, was the catalyst that led to Donald Trump's election. George Soros and I co-founded INET in reaction to the crisis of 2008. And I would say to you that I don't often agree with Steve Bannon about anything, but if I'm pulling back the blinds, we sat together the night the TARP legislation passed, and George said to me, I grew up in the after effects of the Austrian and German banking crisis of 1931. And when the best and the brightest, when the people who are said to be most disciplined and farsighted make a mistake of this scale, nobody knows what to believe in, and things can come unwound and we have to do something. The process went on for a better part of nine months before we crystallized uh, with the help of other scholars, including George Akerlof, who's here, begin our endeavor. But uh, it, it, it's, it's very hard now, 10 years later. You know, John Kenneth Galbraith wrote a wonderful book I wanna to recommend to you all. It's called The Short History of Financial Euphoria. And in the book he says, the, everybody makes the same mistakes, crisis after crisis, but you do get a little window of time. You get about 20 years before everybody forgets what happened previously. Well, allegedly it were, we're at halftime, but if I watch the legislative agenda right now, we're no, it, it feels like we are forgetting at halftime. We we're accelerating our forgetting. <coughs> uh, but we have a, a problem in society 
when the best and the brightest are unmasked, and when the damage is enormous, and when people don't pay the price, the polluters don't pay. Tomasa Patias Gilpa gave our first concluding speech at our conference in 2010. And he talked about how long it took to sort out the separation between church and state at the time of the Industrial Revolution that led to what I'll call a scientific administrative technocracy. Tommaso concluded his speech by talking about that there were three types of sustainability in society, financial sustainability, resource sustainability, and social sustainability. He sat down next to me, and he had not written the text, which is before you. That came a couple months later at the Per Jacobson lecture, but it's, it was the same speech. And he looked at me, and he said, you're at this conference, April 2010. Everybody's concerned about financial sustainability. It's all going to flow into social unsustainability. And he sat down. As he framed it in his lecture, the emperor and Croesus are now fighting like the church and state used to have to fight. And he concludes that for a successful exit of the present problems can only be found rethinking the relationship between markets and government in a global world. And that global world piece, I think, is very important because the nation state is not insulated from things beyond its borders, as we all know. Tommaso concluded his speech by talking about that there were three types of sustainability in society, financial sustainability, resource sustainability, and social sustainability. He sat down next to me, and he had not written the text, which is before you. That came up. But he said, I'm sorry, this font is probably uh, not dark enough for you able to see, is that global political leadership had become much more diversified, particularly with the rise of China as a geopolitical power. And in the context of leadership, the G20 was lacking an internal unity. There were different philosophical and historical traditions at the table, as distinct from the G7 that was largely run by the Judeo-Christian tradition, the Enlightenment uh, framework in the North Atlantic. And then Brzezinski went on to talk about how the financial crisis had awakened everyone to the importance of politics. And he said, for the first time in all human history, mankind is politically awakened. And that's a total new real totally new reality. It has not been so far for most of human history. Now, what he's essentially saying, and I was there to, to watch this, and you can see it on film on the internet. He's saying the capacity of leaders to restore coherence and order is going to be challenged at precisely the time when people are anxious about whether there can be such an order and when there is a need for a reestablishment of order because people are, are quite unhappy. So my, this was my critique. I actually gave this speech to the Tuesday group here in Washington the day after TARP passed. And I talked about how I've changed to the past tense here in the slides, but uh, 2008 wasn't just a crisis in the financial sector. And the money politics, the influence of lobbying, campaign contributions, and so forth in capturing the rules was very important. By the way, this is a little asterisk that relates to some of the debates I've been involved in in Project Syndicate in recent days. I don't think this is about demonic people. I think this is about systemic failure 
and whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, and we all have moral license in the small in between certain cracks, but we have a systemic failure on our hands that was unmasked in 2008. And it is somewhat unfair, and I know if Paul Volcker was here today, I know uh, Garov will be here, I haven't seen him, but uh, I know he's gonna join us. Uh, we did an event with Paul recently, and uh, his view right now, and I'll, I'll come back to this when we uh, join another panel later in the day, his view right now is that everybody is so afraid of another financial crisis because the Congress wouldn't do anything, and they'd let us go over the cliff. And then the responsibility would fall to the Federal Reserve, which is at the intersection between markets and the body politic. And the displeasure that people feel in support of a financial system when people are not buying municipal bonds or not buying, how do you say, supporting the means to keep police force, infrastructure, schools, and health together uh, leads to a very, very high level of stress on the Federal Reserve and its independence, which has been cherished for many years, uh, it would be very much at risk. Uh, Paul also said something very funny to me uh, recently. He said, when I came to Washington, there was one five-star hotel and one three-star restaurant. Why are there so many now? Uh, I'll, but, uh, I'll let him address that. Going back in history, Adam Smith had some thoughts about when government worked, right? Adam Smith, who's cited as a free marketeer, he said, uh, a government of the exclusive company of merchants is perhaps the worst of all governments for any country whatsoever. Now, he didn't get to watch the Soviet Union disintegrate before he said that. The proposal of any new law or regulation of commerce that arises from merchant class ought always be listened to with great precaution. And I believe both those things should be listened to in great precaution. At the time, this is another of my older slides uh, from a work I did with Tom Ferguson comparing the New Deal and now is that uh, the Democrat, Democratic Party which administered this bailout has really lost its mass-based credibility and uh, as we saw when uh, Edward Kennedy's seat went to Scott Brown before Elizabeth Warren rebounded and took it back Right after Wall Street bonuses were paid in 2010, they elected a Republican in Massachusetts, and the pollster, Selinda Lake, who's a good friend of mine, called me and said, she's going down, and it's all about the bank bailouts. The uh, piece that you see, there's a graph up here. Horizontal axis is voter turnout. To the right side is countries at the time of a financial crisis that high, had a higher level of turnout. Vertical axis is the percentage that the labor or socialist party exists as a proportion of the uh, body politic. And what we tend to see is that clustered to the northeast with high voter turnout and a high labor presence are stronger reforms that have to do with controlling the moral hazard in too big to fail like issues. And this is a scatter plot of the 30s, the 90s, 2000, Japan in the 90s, and 2008. If you look all the way in the southwest corner of that diagram is one dot, that's the United States of America, with almost no labor or socialist party and very, very low voter turnout. And I think this uh, is not necessarily a cause, it may be a result, but it is a symptom of the sickness of our political system. Another thing that is difficult, and this also comes from work with Tom Ferguson, we call it the opportunity cost of doing good, is how regulators are compensated in relation to high income people. Very, very sophisticated and capable people working inside the Fed, the SEC and so forth, are underpaid and under-supported. I you always use the Singapore government in contrast, but you can't tell people not to finance their children going to a good college in the United States and to continue in the name of the goodness of society to 
how do I say, just ignored the fortunes of their family. I don't think this is to be rectified necessarily by taxing the wealthy, but I do think society would benefit tremendously from support for the, not, not so much the design of the rules, but for the enforcement of the rules. I've often, I'll come back later today when we talk about what the new rules should be, but I don't think there's ever been a better, better advertisement for the importance of public financing elections. When I started in Washington, D.C. in 1984, I worked with Pete Domenici, which meant during budget deliberations, I got to sit down and talk to Bob Dole on the floor late at night. And we used to argue about whether public financing of elections would save money for the American people. I think this crisis alone shows that it could have saved probably decades worth of public budgets and economic losses. Finally, I don't want to be too despairing. I'm very fond of blues music, and the archetype of blues music is a song called Trouble in Mind. And the song goes, Trouble in Mind, I'm blue, but I won't be blue always. The sun's gonna shine out my back door again someday. James Cone, a theologian at Union Theological Seminary who passed away this year, and a very dear friend of mine, talked about, in his book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, how was it that the wives and mothers of African Americans who were being lynched engaged in reform. They didn't have recourse to the, to the police chief or the sergeant or what have you. But at one point, society, in this case, African-American society, decides it cannot live in indignity and be what economists call rational. And as David uh, Brooks says in this article, you fall through the floorboards. You fall to a place where your suffering is like a coiled spring and helps the society to overcome uh, uh, what you might call a hideous chapter. And I think that's where we sit right now. Thank you. I'm gonna put you back, I'll hold you back in. Somebody else is going to have to help me pick which one is yours. So you'd say madness. Uh, hmm. Is it the end of the list? Send, send them one. Uh, hmm. Is there somebody that helps with the, the AV? Uh, that might be me. <laughs> I just, I'm not seeing. There are a whole series of PowerPoints here. What's the final call? Madness. Madness. Okay, let's 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 sort it by. <coughs> Get a quick access survey there. Put that down. Here. Let's just use the flash drive. Good I idea. There's a bunch of feel like a pit crew at the Indy 500. Yeah, I know. That's right. right. Changing tires. <laughs> Okay, and probably by date mad madness three yep. madness and new rules. Yeah, okay. okay, way to go. Thank oh, you. this is this is how I earn my keep. Uh, slideshow from the beginning. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I I'm grateful for this help, and I'm grateful to be on this program, and grateful to uh, Rob especially for supporting my research on these issues. Uh, let me explain the title first of all. We talk about too big to fail banks, and it's not that they're too big to fail. They've failed in some important way, but we're un unable to unwind them. They're too complex. They're, it just scares everybody to death who might step into the task of, of unwinding them. And we, so that's the first point. And the next point is madness. We all know the definition of Einstein gave us of doing the same thing again and again. Now, what 
I'm saying is that these so-called new rules are almost are only slightly different from the old rules, and just enough to try to convince us, as uh, Emma Jordan said, that these were important rules and would really make a difference. Now, I don't believe this, and I'm going to try to convince you of that. Now, my first slide here just gives you a framework for analyzing the rules that are supposed to come out of this Dodd-Frank Act, which was you know, so incredibly large that you probably had to have a wagon to carry it around the halls of Congress. But anyway, the perp every change in regulation or laws uh, has both ostensible purposes, that's what everyone is bragging about, and hidden purposes which go unacknowledged and you, you get punished even for mentioning them. Now, all laws have loopholes, and the capital requirements focus on a ratio of assets minus liabilities divided by net worth, okay? Each of those definitions, each of those items is uh, badly full of, of loopholes. So you can think a little bit about speed limits. You know, we have very clear laws here in D.C., 25 miles an hour, unless posted otherwise. Alleys, 7 miles per hour. School districts, 15 miles per hour. All right. Are those the enforced limits? Of course not. There are these bright line limits and then additional supervisory leeway. So if you're stopped, I'll just give you some history. I was talking to, to uh, George beforehand. In, as a teenager growing up in Washington, D.C., the first time I was stopped by the police, their first question was, was not how did you know how fast you were going? They said, where does your father work? This was a sexist question. Actually, my mother worked in Congress. If I had enough sense to understand that question as a 17-year-old, I would have answered it by her saying what she did, and I would have gotten off. So. You know, th this is important to learn these things. So part of it is the norms of regulatory culture. The regulatory culture in the United States, the bank regulatory culture, is to be friendly to the big banks, to help them out, help them to compete with foreign banks, and to be merciful when they get in trouble. You're not supposed to just uh, step in and punish them when they violate in various ways. In fact, you cooperate with them. All right, then, now, what the penalty structure tells us a lot about it, too. Think of the kinds of penalties you can have. Administrative sanctions, civil liability for the corporations and for the bankers, and then criminal exposure. And, of course, in the United States, everything has been, this is required for real justice, is rights of appeal. So here's the application to these complex capital requirements and the stress test. The ostensible purpose is what? People have been praying, uh, what Emma Jordan pray, uh, praised, to avoid future financial crises by preventing dividends and stock buybacks from driving bank leverage to dangerous levels. All right? The hidden purpose is to bullshit the citizenry about the long run effectiveness of these post crisis tweaks in this basically defective framework of control. You, you can make capital ratios meaningful and higher, but you cannot keep them that way. Not in the regulatory culture we have, not in the government we have here in the United States. So the basic loophole is uh, in the definitions that are used to deal with the capital ratios that are supposed to be enforced. Um, what it, we're supposed to have in the numerator, the, the difference between assets and liabilities, something called loss absorbing capital. In fact, there are some bogus intangible assets such as tax loss, carry forwards, and core deposit intangibles that are not available in the case of a creditor run. They're not of any use. So if you're trying to measure the ability of institutions to withstand risk and, and runs, which is always a problem in banking, banking is inherently unstable. Uh, if people want to test whether the bank can pay, and that's why we have a safety net. All right. So, we had a lot of trouble. It turned out that people discovered that when we lowered taxes, lowered taxes, we greatly lowered the capital at uh, the biggest banks in our country because much of their capital was loss, was uh, lo tax loss carry forwards. So if the tax rate goes from, say, 40% to 20%, these are half as valuable as they were before. And so the government went and said, see, that's not important. But what's important is the rest of the 
is still on the books and still being treated as part of their capital. And, and then we had this uh, permission, blanket permission. Anybody who failed the, the um, stress test was allowed to do a retake knowing what the questions were. And this usually doesn't turn out in a failure. So, and those that had a little trouble, they promised that things would be better if they could just give some uh, dividends uh, or so they say stock buybacks is another way to, to get capital out of the bank. Now, the risk weighting of assets used in the net worth to risk weighted asset denom uh, fraction, the denominator underweights politically sensitive ac assets such as mortgages and sovereign bonds. So you, you are raising the, uh, you are creating loopholes by which to avoid the intent of, of these higher capital requirements. So, and then the other question is, where do they get these bright line standards? We know something about uh, miles per hour in cars and how uh, certain speeds are inherently dangerous, but this is all negotiated. These are negotiated ratios, and, and who has all the power in the negotiations? Uh, the very largest banks. So what we should have is meaningful and reproducible statistical techniques related to the definitions we're using. So finally, uh, uh, penalties are very important. And all we have now are administrative sanctions, which are softened by norms of mercy and helpfulness. We offer retests to allow dividends and buybacks based on hot air. And there are civil fines for the corporations but we're not, almost no, none of our big bankers, none of the people who made the decisions that ultimately brought on the crisis have been punished. There are no criminal standards for, ex, for exposure for reckless endangerment or what I call theft by safety net. That is putting all the responsibility on taxpayers to save them in tough times is a form of theft. We aren't paid anything for those guarantees uh, considering the, the value. And as for the appeal rights, they've already begun to lobby fiercely for relief. And in this uh, industry, I mean, in, in this political climate in Washington, D.C., they are going to win and we are going to lose. The, one of the points to consider, I didn't bring this slide along, but what has been the effect of the crisis on the banking industry? Well, the very biggest banks and investment banks have become way bigger. Their, their proportion of assets has gone up about 50% of the assets in the industry. So if you can say that this whole system is designed to help the big banks, which would simplify the task of regulation. You don't have to look at so many. But uh, given that they have the terrible uh, value uh, of free uh, taxpayer capital, uh, it doesn't bode well. So I'm certainly in, in Rob's camp. Now, I have a cartoon here just to uh, illustrate what I've just said. If you didn't understand it, this is the point. They say, look here, you've got a, a, a con man running a shell game. Looks an awful like an, like an elephant. Uh, he'll let you figure that out. And he, this is a Tom Tolles cartoon. He says, see, we're putting new regulations on banks to protect the world's ordinary citizens. That, that's the ostensible purpose. And he, Underneath, there's this little kicker that Tom Tolles always includes and says, now watch, I shall demonstrate, which is to say that there's no capital being put under any of these shells. So when you, no matter which shell you lift, you won't find any real capital there. You're going to find the government supporting the banking system. So here's my major point, that banks don't abuse the safety net. Bankers do. This, the current control framework exemplifies the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. That is, we punish banks because banks do things. But it's bankers that make these decisions, these reckless decisions, that increase their tail risk, increase the systemic risk of the country. So efforts to monitor and sanction risky bank behavior we can see that, have met with little success. As, as Rob was saying, things are getting worse, not better, in terms of vulnerability. And if I could talk about Europe, I would really be able to scare you. The, the European banks are walking down the same roads we walked with in the SNL industry, but their stakes are much higher. All right, so the incentives of bank decision makers to avoid the rules are strong. All of this change doesn't touch that idea. 
that they still have the incentives to find the way around the rules in order to take money from taxpayers and pump, pump up their profits, distribute those profits quickly so that they, they're not on there to absorb losses when times get hard. So if we're going to have any success in regulation, we must create some links between the regulation and the justice system. That just as we tell drivers, you can't drive recklessly, and we recklessly isn't terribly well defined, uh, but we can sort that out in a court if we have to. But the rules must discipline the behavior by the individual bank executives that conceive and control the level of a bank's riskiness. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ed. Uh, before Jesse, um, we hear Jesse's remarks. I just wanted to say a brief comment based on on, on what you what you said. It made me um, really think about the fundamental moral hazard that exists throughout the financial system. And there's there's sort of a parallel to what happened in the corporate law space around 100 years ago, when we saw the rise of limited liability. Uh, for corporations. And with limited liability, shareholders have unlimited upside and a cap downside. That kind of, that creates a heads I win, tails you lose environment where it encourages greater risk taking. And it's, you can see this sort of being like a call option where you actually, the value of the option goes up with greater volatility. So economically, this is uh, as if financial institutions actually do better in a, if they're too big to fail in a volatile environment that it's not just that they're that they may not want to be regulated because it's annoying lack of regulation increases volatility and actually increases the value of being too big to fail because you get all the upside <laughs> when the market does well and you're not having the downside and there's another layer to this which is there is a essentially a too big to fail tax that's on the non too big to fail institutions that, that having a more volatile economy means that there's going to be a systemic risk premium placed in the economy but it doesn't fall on the big institutions because they're not because they're going to be they're going to always get uh, be bailed out it falls on the smaller ones so this further encourages larger institutions to push for deregulation. And it's, uh, I think there's a real question about how can we break out of that cycle? And I think just some of Jesse's comments may, um, I think, point to at least one tool for doing so. Um, great, well, thank you. Thank you, Adam. And I, uh, I don't have any slides, I don't have any music, so I might as well just sit for my initial comments. But um, uh, yes, I've been focused on a, um, uh, a a narrow question, a narrow but important question um, since the financial crisis, which is um, why don't we put people in jail anymore? Why didn't any bankers go to prison? And to sort of take off from um, Professor Kane's comments um, a little bit, uh, I have explored this question for a while um, because in my journalism and in others, we found evidence of crimes. Um, and one of the great lies of the financial crisis is, uh, you know, there were no crimes committed. It was just from Dick Fold and Jamie Dimon and Lloyd Blankfein and Jimmy Kane. We were just really stupid and reckless, which is um, such a great uh, uh, relief to all of us, uh, I think. Um, and you know, causes us perhaps to reflect on why we're paying these guys so much money. But um, but in fact, it wasn't just stupidity and recklessness. There were there were crimes committed. Um, there were crimes committed by the bankers in the lead up to the financial crisis. Schemes to defraud investors. My colleague and I explored a series of that um, those schemes in the CDO business with. Uh, hedge funds, particularly a hedge fund called Magnetar, building CDOs secretly in um, schemes, a conspiracy with the banks uh, to stuff them with toxic 
mortgage securities um, and then selling them unwittingly, going on and having the bank sell them um, to uh, unwitting customers um, who had no control over the assets and didn't really even know what the assets were and the assets were misrepresented to them. Um, that's just one thing that I think could have been potentially criminal, but you have a whole host of other potential crimes, um, basic uh, traditional crimes like lying to the public, lying to your banks about your liquidity, about your asset values, um, about your debt. Uh, Lehman Brothers made a whole series of misrepresentations um, from, you know, uh, experts uh, about their liquidity, saying they had uh, billions of dollars in liquid assets, um, readily available assets, and they were circulating charts internally saying um, these are actually pledged to other people and uh, are not actually uh, something that we can call um, in any common uh, understanding of the word liquid. They were not remotely liquid. Uh, I consider that a potential crime. So this was a puzzle to me, um, a puzzle that was um, uh, nagged at me. How did this happen? Um, why did the Justice Department not prosecute any top bankers in the wake of the greatest calamity since the Great Depression? Um, and what I found was what I think of as uh, actually a much larger problem, um, which is that we have lost, the Justice Department in this country has lost the will and ability to prosecute top corporate executives. Um, and this was a problem that was building before the financial crisis and persists to today and involves not just the big banks, um, which of course is the subject today, um, but uh, large companies of every stripe, uh, industrial companies, pharmaceutical companies, tech companies. Um, we do not have the ability to prosecute uh, these people. And in fact, I think um, this is what my book is about, but uh, I think I underestimated the problem. Um, and um, it turns out, you know, when you look at the investigation that Robert Mueller is um, pursuing, um, what he is revealing is that there are whole swaths of the economy um, outside the large corporations that uh, have gone uh, unpoliced, like um, lobbying, corporate and uh, political lobbying, uh, like um, campaign finance and high-end real estate, just three things that he's revealing. Um, so I think we have a white-collar prosecution crisis. Uh, in this country that has yet to be solved. So the, um, you know, the old Warren Buffett adage, uh, you, um, when the tide goes out, you get to see who's swimming naked. Um, tide went out in 2008, and we got to see that our prosecutors are swimming naked. Um, and so uh, I'll just very briefly go through sort of how this happened. Um, first, I'll give you uh, a few statistics just to give you some framework. In the early 1990s, white collar crime made up about a fifth of the DOJ's prosecutions. Um, today, it makes up le fewer, you know, less than 10%. Um, we have, uh, we're doing fewer prosecutions of individual white collar criminals. Uh, at any time in about 22 years today. Uh, what prosecutions of corporations have gone down about a third in the last decade. Um, and that really overstates the um, issue because most of the companies that um, get prosecuted, get convicted, um, get charged are small, inconsequential companies. Um, and so uh, we don't go after the large corporations with any, uh, it, with any degree of ferocity um, or uh, large you know, corporate officers, executives, CEOs. No CEO, CFO, or chair of a Fortune 500 company has been prosecuted um, in uh, over a decade in the United States. Now, maybe you think that those many thousands of people are all innocent of crimes um, who served in those positions, but I don't. Um, so, uh, so what happened to create this um, this enormous problem? Well. Um, 
very briefly, there was a, um, a successful wave of prosecutions in the wake of the NASDAQ bubble bursting, and almost all the top corporate executives from almost all the companies that um, were involved in that um, were prosecuted. Enron, WorldCom, Adelphia, Tyco, uh, Global Crossing, we remember, some of you will remember these names. Um, and then there was an enormous backlash and lobbying effort from uh, corporations and the white collar bar to uh, depict those prosecutions as um, as uh, out of control. The prosecutors were cowboys. They uh, made business aggressive business decisions illegal um, or you know, labeled uh, uh, aggressive business decisions as crimes um, and uh, focused particularly on the prosecution of Arthur Anderson, which was the accounting firm for Enron, um, undermining the legitimacy of that prosecution. Um, in my book, I seek to rehabilitate that prosecution. Um, the Department of Justice was going through a period where they were uh, shifting resources away from white collar crime. The FBI was shifting resources away from white collar crime to terrorism. So there was um, a move away from uh, focusing on this, the Department of Justice had a series of losses, uh, marquee losses in the courts, and also fiascos, um, internal kind of bureaucratic fiascos that undermine their ability to prosecute. Um, and then the largest thing is there was a shift. And you know, this panel is about the rules, um, and, and we were sort of asked to talk about the rules that were in place uh, around the financial crisis or, and, and beyond. But actually, um, a lot of this is about practices and norms, um, the tools and rules that prosecutors have to prosecute white collar criminals are there. Um, the statutes are written, um, the prosecutors don't use them. And what instead today we have is a practice where uh, instead of prosecuting corporations or prosecuting individuals, we settle with corporations for money. They pay in dollars instead of liberty of their top executives. Um, and so this was a regime that did not exist in the uh, before the 1990s. Um, we have a series of names for these kinds of settlements, deferred prosecution agreements, non-prosecution agreements. Sometimes we have guilty pleas that have no effect, um, no consequences for the uh, ongoing consequences for the companies, and then the companies pay big fines. Um, and so in the first decade of their existence, the DOJ does about 18 of these. Um, and then since the uh, mid to early 2000s, they've done about over 425 of them. So this is the way we prosecute, um, we, the way we enforce uh, corporate law breaking in the United States is through settlements. Um, and the way settlements are reached is that the Department of Justice has outsourced and privatized this system. So what we do in this country is when a company is run into problems, uh, the uh, company investigates itself. It hires a law firm, and the law firm conducts an internal investigation. It's sort of, if you imagine this, um, just to take a random example, it would be like uh, if the president of a large Western democracy um, was being investigated for colluding with a foreign power and decided to hire Rudy Giuliani's firm to investigate the question, uh, and then Giuliani presented his report to the um, the body politic. I don't think it's a regime that would work necessarily. Um, this is what we do with corporations. So corporations provide an internal investigation to the Department of Justice. It is a a dazzling piece of work. It's very impressive. It looks thorough. Um, it was produced by some of the brightest minds um, and best paid um, young associates with their blood, sweat, and many hours. Um, but they're studiously and curious about culpability at the top um, and designed to be that way. And they're presented to prosecutors. So who are these prosecutors? Well, the prosecutors are, uh, by and large, um, uh, extremely capable, well-intentioned 
um, devoted public servants, very smart people from uh, mostly from the best law schools in the country, and they um, got there by going to the best elementary schools and middle schools and uh, almost Kavanaugh-like resumes. Um, and, um, uh, and and then um, yeah, what <laughs> exactly? Um, and uh, and the most important thing to understand about these young prosecutors is that they're going to be future corporate defense lawyers. Most of the, them are going to leave to go to the top law firms in the country. Um, the Department of Justice today has effectively become a training ground for future co uh, corporate defense lawyers. Um, it's a broken system. Um, it's unfortunately a racket, a corrupt system that doesn't work, and it doesn't work fundamentally to um, uh, police corporations, and we know this because the re corporations are recidivists. They um, repeatedly break the law even though they pay fines. Wells Fargo, BP, Pfizer, the list goes on and on of um, companies that have run into legal problems and uh, continue to break the law. Um, so what are the consequences of this regime? Well, um, we've sort of all alluded to them here, but uh, that undermined the reform efforts um, when we didn't send anybody to prison uh, I don't think anybody it, it corroded the belief that Dodd Frank was reigning in the banks from by uh, you know the average Joe on the street saw the um, reform efforts as fundamentally weak because there was no accountability um, piece that went to it um, I think it uh, has eroded the rule of law um, we have a two-tier justice system in this country, as most of you understand. Um, most of that has been focused on kind of our mass incarceration problem, uh, punishing disproportionately the poor and people of color, often for nonviolent crimes. Well, this is the flip side, which is that we have a system where uh, a certain class, mostly wealthy, mostly powerful, mostly white, mostly male, can um, commit crimes with impunity. Uh, and so we have a system that lacks legitimacy, uh, and I think that it is certainly one of the things that contributed to um, the populist uprising that eventually led to Donald Trump's presidency. So I, I know Emma tasked me to be ruthless and keep the trains on time. Um, I have trouble channeling my inner uh, Charles Grassley, though. So uh, I, I, I think we might have time for a couple questions. Uh, and uh, if we uh, don't get all of our questions in in this section, what we can do is uh, fold some of your questions into at the end of the next one. Right, Anthony? Oh, right. <laughs> Here. That's Professor Cook. Then Anna Pond. Uh, and then Ann Keller. Anna Pond. Yes. Is it Chandler? Chandler. Chandler. Perfect. No worries. Yeah. Uh, you can't see it. Yeah. I'm happy with it. <laughs> I am Peter. Your presentation is perfect. I'm not sure. Um, Anthony, do you want to go in the program order, or what? Huh? Do you want to go in program order? order? Yeah, exactly. Okay. I'm third. So Dennis and then Peter. Okay. Dennis, Peter is last. Yes. Okay. So you get the cup. Okay. This and. Hi. Does anyone else, Roger, have any uh, slides? Hi, hey, Peter. How are nice you? to meet you. 
I only know you by Not at this time. Okay, so I'm, I'm, this. I'm one of the few. I actually read a paper. Uh, and then I know, I do too. You have to be over a certain age. <laughs> yeah, and I'm way over. Are we good? All right, fantastic. What is the board? Okay, it's not first. Good. Yeah. <laughs> you will not run out of time. <laughs> I will. Good morning, everyone. My name is Anthony Cook. I'm a law professor here at Georgetown Law Center, and I am delighted to be able to moderate this second panel, which will focus on persistent and pervasive predation. Um, our panelists consist of the following um, individuals. Anna Palm um, Kander is a professor here at Georgetown Law. Much of his scholarship focuses on the uh, global regulation of new technologies. His book, The Electronic Silk Road, seeks to dismantle the logistical and regulatory barriers to trade, while at the same time ensuring that public policy objectives cannot easily be evaded through a simple jurisdictional sleight of hand or keystroke. Uh, Professor Candler will focus on what he calls the racist algorithm. Uh, Anne Fleming, uh, Fleming is an associate professor here at Georgetown as well. Her research interests include commercial law and American legal history with a focus on the relationship between law and poverty. Her first book, City of Debtors, A Century of Fringe Finance, explores the history of the fringe lending, of fringe lending and, its, uh, and its regulation in the 20th century. Uh, she will focus her remarks around her work, City of Debtors. Dennis Kelleher is the president and CEO of Better Markets, an independent nonpartisan nonprofit that promotes the economic security, opportunity, and prosperity of American people by advocating for the public interest in financial reform, the markets, and the economy. Mr. Kelleher will talk on, the, on, on hiding risk and the predatory aspects of subprime loans. Finally, Peter, uh, uh, Peter Wariski has been a staff writer for the Washington Post since 2001, covering a wide range of topics, uh, including financial inequality, the pharmaceutical industry, and the recession. His series on the role of pharmaceutical companies influencing drug research won a George Polk Award in 2013, and his previous coverage of Hurricane Andrew, Andrew was awarded a Pulitzer Prize for public service and resulted in an overhaul of the federal construction standards for mobile homes. Mr. Um, Mr. Wariski will take a brief look at monetizing poverty with pre-printed uh, checks. So each of the panelists will take about seven minutes or so to present, at which time we hope to have uh, much time to engage the audience in lively discussion. Anapa. Thanks very much, Professor Cook. So a decade ago, uh, computer models helped precipitate a global crisis. Uh, the entire market of structured finance and derivatives depended on finely honed computer models, which turned out to be divorced from reality. That's the words of the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission. Um, so a decade ago, we relied too heavily on com poor computer models to assess the credit worthiness of of financial instruments. And what I want to do is ask a slightly different question. Uh, what about re a reliance on computer models to assess the credit worthiness of individuals? Um, and especially in the context of the uh, particular moves today, um, at Frank Pasquale has, just, Frank is in the back over there, uh, and uh, he has labeled the computer models that are driving decisions about us as indivisible black boxes. So they're promoted by companies that hold them secret using law to protect their proprietary algorithms and data sets. Uh, and Daniel Citron and Frank have worried about the emergence of a scored society where we're all subject to ranking by secret algorithms that make decisions about the, whether we can access credit, jobs, or even dates. Uh, the risks of such systems are not likely to fall equally on all members of society. Uh, so I want to return to the dawn of the computer age and when large databases were first beginning to be assembled to, to discuss how we might approach these things. So we realized then that credit scoring systems were unlikely to treat men and women uh, alike. Women were more likely to have changed their names upon marriage and thereby lose uh, any credit history they might have had, um, or to not have, have credit histories at all, 
even if they were the ones who ensured their household's excellent credit rating. So at times, credit scores were based on explicit decisions by credit bureaus that resulted in disadvantages for women, such as refusing to permit separate credit accounts for married couples uh, or discounting the earnings of women who were ch of childbearing age. So the original uh, law, uh, literally, um, the, the Federal Reserve proposed in implementing this law that I'm going to talk about, um, proposed banning the collection by financial institutions, by creditors, of your birth control practices, okay? So, and the idea was that if you were of childbearing age uh, and a woman, uh, that meant that you were likely to be taken, go, uh, leave uh, the, uh, the workplace and thereby have no income. That was the theory of, uh, of lenders at the time. Uh, so after a campaign by women to give credit to a woman where credit is due, Congress enacted the Equal Credit Opportunity Act in 1974, banning uh, sex and marital status discrimination in the awarding of credit. In 1974, I might note in the hearings, it's not even clear what to call databases. Uh, they are called by one congressman, data banks. Uh, and so we don't even, uh, we haven't even come up with a consistent vocabulary for what we're dealing with. Two years later, Congress would expand the restrictions, uh, the, the bars, to include additional categories of discrimination such as race, religion, and age. Um, and of course, this was long overdue. Uh, but a simple ban on such discrimination is not enough by itself. How do you know if you were denied a loan uh, while an equally qualified man or person with different skin color received the loan? Um, so oh, sorry. Um, the risk is that the algorithm will produce systematically biased results, but that you may not know about those, uh, the fact that there is, in fact, this difference. The, the possibility of creating an invisible apartheid by algorithm, a society of second-class citizens who receive fewer opportunities and are subjected to more serious punishments for their mistakes. The fact that these decisions are produced by computers will make will allow their owners to claim that the results are not discriminatory, but really the result of science some impartial computer. This has the makings of an ultimate Kafkaesque nightmare, where there's no one to blame except the ghost in the machine. But the reality is that even if the machine was not programmed to be racist or sexist, it can learn racism and sexism from the world at large. So here's a little model of, a very simplified model of these kind of machine learning algorithms, um, where the algorithm is functioning based, uh, it's trained uh, to uh, make decisions, classifications, um, and it's trained on real world data, uh, and then it operates uh, on the real world. And in both those sets of data, there, it's of course replicating the inequalities of the real world. Uh, and so the, world, the possibility is that like a virus, the discrimination spreads. And unfortunately, in this context, uh, the virus is hidden and, and becomes invisible. And it's made invisible by the operation of this, these uh, black boxes. So all of this will require, so how should we respond? Um, so I first think that companies um, should practice a kind of algorithmic affirmative action, actively designing and reviewing their systems to ensure that they are egalitarian. Second, government agencies and individuals should actively monitor what these uh, companies are doing to hold them to account. All of this will require active collection of data. Um, now, this data will include the very stuff that we might think that the algorithm should not be operating upon, things like race and gender uh, or age. So, so this is the kind of uh, irony in this space. In order to find out whether you're discriminating on the basis of race, you have to find out the race or the gender of the people involved. Now, so the Equal Credit Opportunity Act um, uh, takes a kind of confused approach to data gathering. It tells companies, um, so it tells companies at the same time that they must collect information, that they can collect information, and they must not collect information. 
okay, um, with in in kind of unclear and um, uh, largely unreasoned uh, distinctions. So originally, the drafters thought that banks should inquire about gender or marital status. So this should just be prohibited. Uh, and so 1974, this was the original uh, uh, idea. We'll just prohibit the collection of this data. Um, so they wrote that into the law. But uh, so, so anyway, I'll uh, conclude very quickly. Thank you. Um, so uh, the, the, um, what happened is that subsequently, they decided that you should be able to allow companies to collect the data so they can test themselves for how they are performing along these metrics. Uh, finally, in Dodd-Frank, and this will be your first positive thing that you've heard about Dodd-Frank this, this morning, uh, uh, the Congress passed a law that, as part of Dodd-Frank that said you must collect information. Uh, and so th this was with respect to small business uh, loans. Uh, Unfortunately, that Dodd-Frank uh, provision has not yet been implemented in actually a, a CFPB regulation. The controversy has raged on over the last uh, eight years as to what as to how to implement this. And I will leave it at that, and we'll, we can come back to this. Well, in thanks, Anna And okay. Oh. Can you hear me? I don't know why this is not. Oh. Maybe I'm just not close enough to it. <laughs> OK, um, so uh, even though I was working um, in uh, foreclosure prevention in 2008, um, my research really relates to smaller loans, um, which was, as we know, were not the source of the financial crisis in, in 2008. Um, but I think they're worth thinking about because the history of the small sum lending industry and its regulation uh, holds some lessons for how we think about financial predation um, and preventing it. Um, so in my book, I describe how Americans over the past century have struggled with how to regulate small dollar loans. And to me, this is really... Uh, a particular instance of a broader struggle, which is the struggle to define the meaning of justice within capitalism. Um, or we could also think of it, the flip side is, to define the meaning of predation within American capitalism. The term predatory lending is actually a relatively new one. I haven't found any uh, evidence of its use before the 1980s. But Americans have always had a similar concept. So in the early 20th century, uh, we referred to it as loan sharking, um, which today can convey illegal lending, but can also just mean lending that while it may be technically legal is in some way objectionable, um, that we view it as predatory. So with consumer financial products like mortgages or small dollar loans, I think there are really two questions that regulators need to address. Um, and the first is just defining what does predation mean within the context of a particular industry or, um, or market. Uh, and then second, how to prevent that kind of predatory behavior. Um, so what I want to focus on this morning is this first question of how we actually go about defining what constitutes predation um, and also who gets to define it. So one of the major changes since the, the 2008 crisis has been the increased involvement of um, federal uh, authorities in defining what predation is for consumer financial services and particularly for small dollar loans. Uh, and for most of the past century, um, certainly before the 1960s, the task of figuring out what constituted predatory behavior was a state level issue. And so each state got to decide for itself um, what types of loans were acceptable and what types of lending was going to be illegal or, or out of bounds. Um, so there were some efforts before 2008 to create national standards uh, in the small dollar loan market, um, but those efforts were really at the level of adopting or proposing uniform or model legislation. 
Um, so there was an effort, for example, in the 19-teens and 1920s, it was a joint project by the Russell Sage Foundation and the Trade Association for Small Dollar Lenders um, to put together what they called the Uniform Small Loan Law, uh, which they drafted and then went state by state attempting to get states to adopt it. Uh, and at that point in time, pretty much all small dollar lending, uh, loans of less than $300, uh, was essentially outlawed in most states because states had strict usury laws that said you couldn't charge more than 6 or 7% interest per year. Uh, and those low levels of interest were just um, not feasible for loans of, of such small amounts. Um, so the uniform law, loan law was an effort, I think, to shift the um, national conversation on a state-by-state -state basis about what predation looked like uh, and to argue that for a particular category of loans um, that those rules didn't make sense. Uh, and so what they proposed and many states adopted was that the industry should be put under state supervision, it should be licensed, uh, and that lenders should be limited to charging no more than three and a half percent of the principal balance per month um, and that the loans would be capped at $300. And so many states adopted these rules, but even at that time, this definition of what should be legal um, was contested. So you had people like New York City Mayor Fiorella LaGuardia saying um, that this was too much, that he could not understand why anyone should be able to charge what he called 42% interest per year. So he referred to the uniform law as the swine law uh, and viewed those who argued for its passage as predators, as loan sharks. Um, so at a certain point in time, by the 1930s, there was some national consensus about what the standards should be, what the boundary between predation uh, and, uh, and acceptable conduct was. But then, as with many financial products, the regulatory landscape and the industry shifted. So by the time we get to the 1970s and 80s, states have to revisit this question again because as a result of the deregulation uh, of interest rates in the late 1970s and 80s through the Supreme Court uh, decision in Marquette and then through congressional action, um, suddenly there's competition between states to get rid of their um, usury laws to attract banks to locate there. Um, and so uh, states have to decide again uh, what is the boundary? Um, and so you see new forms of lending developing. Payday loans um, start in the 1990s. States have to decide if they're going to allow these loans or not, um, which by the point we get to 2008, it remains a state-level issue, and there's still a split between the states as to what constitutes predation and what's acceptable, which is when we get the financial crisis, and one of the um, uh, outcomes of that crisis, Dodd-Frank, creates the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. So we could think that maybe this is a moment at which there's going to, again, be some sort of national consensus about what the boundaries are, what constitutes predatory behavior, um, and what is acceptable. Um, and we do, for the first time, have a federal rulemaking, um, I'm just going to finish up, a federal rulemaking uh, uh, which sets new boundaries, saying payday lenders have to consider the ability of borrowers to repay the loan um, if they want to extend this form of credit. Um, but even after this moment in October 2017, by January 2018, the CFPB has changed its position. So under new direction, even the CFPB cannot agree on what constitutes pr predation and are going to revisit this rulemaking. Um, so I think the lessons that we can take away from this are, um, first of all, that the challenge for policymakers is not merely in figuring out how to stamp out predatory behavior. Um, in some ways, that's the easy task. The harder task is um, reaching some agreement on the meaning of predation, which I think has always been a contested idea. Okay, thank you. All right, Dennis. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm like Jesse. I don't have uh, slides and, uh, or music. 
Uh, I need to coordinate better with Rob Johnson in the future. <laughs> uh, but thanks for the inviting me and thanks for this conference. Uh, there is, you know, kind of the beginning of it, and Emma talked about this, was the amnesia. Unfortunately, we, we think of it at Better Marcus as a, as a created and purchased amnesia, not actually clinical amnesia. But if uh, you know anybody who's getting amnesia or you're having amnesia, uh, I don't have a book, but I, I didn't write a book, but I have a book. You've got to read Crashed by Adam Tooze. It will remind you in a laborious detail of what happened and some very novel and good theories about why it happened. Um, so, because what's remarkable is when you read about what he talks about is happening and being said in the uh, 1990s, in the early 2000s, the exact same things are being said today. The exact same things are being done today for the exact same bogus reasons. I, I could quote my friend, friend uh, Ed Kane and say, for the same bullshit reasons, <laughs> um, but I won't. Uh, <laughs> uh, so Better Markets is an advocacy group. We participated in, um, I spent, well, you know, I was a, a Jesse, a defense lawyer at Skadden Arps for about 20 years, uh, participating in many of the things that he talks about in a very different era, though, uh, pre-crash, uh, pre-Enron, pre-Arthur Anderson. And then I spent eight years in the United States Senate, and we founded Better Markets in 2010 after the um, a Dodd-Frank law was passed because we realized there was no organization that was professional to be a counterweight to the industry. Because when you talk about there can't be agreement on what predation is, it's because the predators are at the table helping to find uh, that their conduct is not predation. And so you, you alluded to it very quickly, but it was a very important comment about how uh, somebody got together with the trade groups to define how uh, they're making their money and their profits. So since 2010, we've participated in over 200 rulemakings and about 30 litigations. And in those 250 rulemakings or so, uh, about 70% 70 of, 70 of them, we're the only non-industry participant. When you get into derivatives and the complicated issues, over 90% of the time, we're the only non-industry participant. Who's writing these rules? And for what purpose? So. Uh, I've been asked to talk about hiding risk. So you want to talk about hiding risk. Um, there's uh, a massive deregulation going on, not 10 years as uh, was alluded to earlier, not 10 years after the crash. And there's been some studies that say usually it takes 20 years. I was with Ken Rogoff from Harvard recently who made the comment that this is who, and Ken knows, I mean, he's only looked over 800 years or something. I forget what it is that crashes. Uh, he said this is the fastest in history, in history, between a major crash and the time at which the rules that were supposed to prevent the next crash were already being taken down before they were implemented. And that's the other thing, over half the rules aren't even implemented. Mm. I mean, it's just shocking how fast this has happened. Um, it's not shocking if you think about the money that's at stake, though. So hiding risk is really the flip side of bonuses, right? Profits and bonuses on the other side of hiding risk. So why do, why do I say that? Well, later on, you're going to hear a panel about innovation um, with some of my good friends on it, Gary and um, some others. Um, innovation, in my view, is one of um, the primary words and tools for hiding risk. Because nobody wants to be against innovation. Innovation, what's better than innovation? Nothing. Um, but I'd submit that innovation in finance is very different than innovation elsewhere, and red flags should always go up when you hear them. Mm. Most financial innovation turns out to be another way to separate you from your money. <laughs> um, often, it's just another way to get somebody else to take the risk of the innovation they don't want. I'm not going to go into this much. I don't know if they're going to talk about it later. But credit default swaps is a wonderful innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, CDOs, collateralized debt obligations. Uh, you want to, uh, Jesse alluded to Magnetar. And synthetic CDOs, by the way, because we couldn't milk enough money by ripping people off with CDOs, so we created a synthetic CDO. Um, it's just astonishing when you go through and you look at the product, the innovations in finance. You, now, you know, Paul, my good friend Paul Volcker, who was talked about earlier today, has a line widely quoted, usually meaning to dismiss him, where he said, the only financial innovation in the last 20 years I can think of is the ATM. <laughs> and all, all the smart guys in the suits on Wall Street go, oh, that guy, old guy, doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, you know, if he's wrong, he's not wrong by much. There may be another innovation besides the ATM, uh, that makes sense. But most of the innovations are meant to hide risk and shift risk. And when you hear innovation, a red flag should go up. 
Hiding risk happens in a lot of places. There's three primary arenas that you should look on, only one of which gets any attention. There's the legislative, regulatory, and judicial arenas. The legislative arena gets all the attention because it's this big clash between Republicans and Democrats, and you get to see it, and the cameras love following it around. You know, some hiding risk happens there. The recently passed deregulation bill, 2155, that was signed earlier this year, um, deregulated a whole bunch of things. Importantly, banks, poor little banks, between $100 billion and $250 billion in assets. You know your little neighborhood bank. Everybody here who's hanging out with somebody with $250 billion, raise your hand. So that bill was focused on, when you look at asset size, there are 5,800 banks in the United States, roughly, let's call it. Um, and I'm leaving aside the shadow banking system and other financial institutions, you look at banks. And this bill was focused on de deregulating banks. At the time the bill was considered and passed, there were only 41 banks in the entire country with more than $50 billion in assets. All the energy, really, 90% of the energy in all of that bill was focused on deregulating 23 of those 41 banks. Hmm. Um, and what did that mean? When you're deregulated, you move not only away from regulation, you move away from um, transparency, accountability, and oversight. Hence, predation. Um, quickly, and everybody knows what it is, frankly, it's not how they do it may be a mystery, but you just look at the bonus numbers. That's where you find out where often, not always, there's a lot of uh, legitimate financial services being provided that support the real economy. The problem is that that is not as lucrative as the high-risk, high-leveraged trading, non-social aspect of finance. And that's where the real money is. So you've got this massive deregulation that kind of hides risks, juices bonuses, creates leverage, and creates systemic instability that leads to both predation, it leads to the corruption of the judicial system, it leads to the corruption of the political system, it leads to the delegitimization of all of it. Because you end up with two tiers in this country where the people have got a lot of money and get away with it, and the people who don't. And that has, as Rob pointed out pretty well, social, political, cultural consequences that we're seeing in the election, uh, among other places. And that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Last but not least, Peter. Uh, good morning. Um, I am going to talk about uh, one of the glories of uh, 21st century capitalism, a project we put together uh, and published, I think it was this summer. Um, for my soundtrack, I didn't bring any, but I prefer Sex Pistols, something angrier than Bob Dylan, or Ghostface Killer. You have to imagine it. Though. Um, I'm, I wrote about a company, uh, and I should say my story touches on many of the issues here, um, although it takes a little bit to get to them. It touches on amnesia, it touches on faith in free markets and uh, predation. Um, what we wrote about was a company that was giving out millions of uh, free checks every year, or just saying, sending checks to millions of people and say, for 1,200 bucks, sometimes they're 2,400, the really big ones were about $3,000, millions of them every year. And if you cashed them, um, you were obliged to pay fairly high interest rates. Sometimes it was 36%, sometimes it was 33%. If you defaulted on the loans, you were required to pay their attorney fees to sue you. Um, there was also other, you know, punitive fees, and, and we, we, they were almost always targeted at people of very modest means. Um, among the people that I talked to, and um, I think this, you know, the, the, the argument from that company was, you know, we're just, you know, helping people. You know, they can sign it, or the check, or not sign it. You know, they're rational actors. But when you take a closer look, and I think there is, uh, you know, th that argument is, is not completely without merit. But if you look, as I did, at the people who are getting these checks and why they signed them, the circumstances that they were in when they signed them, you begin to look askance at that, that argument. I'm just going to give you some of the examples of the people that I talked to who got into big trouble, um, you know, got dragged into court, um, had their uh, wages garnished. And I would ask them, why in the world did you sign this dumb check? 
And you know, I, there's so many different stories, all of them sad. Um, and you realize people don't have the choices that the people making the laws have, you know, in their financial lives. There was one woman from Southeast Asia that said, my mom died, I had to go back there. She, you know, it's a $6,000 trip. So she gets $3,000 in the mail, she did it. She got to go to her mom's funeral. There's another guy, his truck, he gets the check, he says, mm, I'm not gonna sign it, this looks dicey. His truck gets a, uh, has a tr problem with his truck, goes into the garage, he needs to, the truck to get to work, he needs to take his kids to work, he signs the check. Uh, there's another old woman in um, Prince William. She'd been a janitor her whole life in the school system. Um, she didn't have teeth, and she needed teeth, and she had hospital bills. So I said, why'd you sign? She said, I needed teeth. And, and finally, I mean, the one that kind of summed up the, the, sort of the sadness of it for me, uh, and I did not use it because the woman was so ashamed, she didn't want her name used, in the paper was this woman uh, Nashville, and I said, why'd you sign it? And she said, well, I was having trouble paying my rent, and uh, so I prayed on it, and uh, I prayed a lot that night, and then the next morning, the check came in the mail. It was as if it was like a sign from God that this predator's check had arrived in the mail, and she signed it, and she, she admitted in, in retrospect that this might not be the way the Lord works. Um, so these are the kinds of people that when they talk about rational actors, we should keep in mind, I think. Um, the, now, the, the, the part of the story that has to do with amnesia is um, the fact, who owns this firm? Um, this is a very large firm, by the way, it, uh, and it's getting bigger very quickly. It had 50 outlets in 2013. It's over 450 outlets. They're in super uh, in shopping malls all over the country. Um, so they're growing very fast. The owner of this is a private equity firm uh, called Warburg Pincus. And who is the president of Warburg Pincus? Um, our former Treasury Secretary, Tim Geithner, who, as we all know, um, criticized predatory uh, lending as when he was Treasury Secretary. So um, if that's not amnesia, I'm not sure what is. Uh, you know, and many people who commented on the story uh, uh, in our comment sections had much, much harsher words than that. Um, the, uh, you know, some of the uh, arguments that you hear about uh, from the economists. I studied economics as well, and. There is this idea, and Anne brings it up in her book, you know, where, where is justice in capitalism? And if you're an economist, you say, oh, it's right where uh, the price and quantity lines meet. You know, that's the price that everybody's willing to pay, and it's fair, and, and that's the argument here, um, that, look, uh, we have to charge this much because these people are risky. But, I mean, it reminds me so much of, of uh, you know, I was, I'm actually more of a math guy than anything else, was the Euclidean geometry, which we had so much faith in until, you know, this century when they decided that, you know, actually there are other ways of construing geometry than Euclidean. It's the same thing with, with capitalism. I don't think that those, these free market arguments that you hear over and over again will prove to be credible or the only way to approach um, these issues. And that's all I have. Thank you. So we do have time for questions. We finished very efficiently on time, I think. So please, questions, discussion. Hi, my name is Urshka Vilikonia. I'm a professor of law here at Georgetown. Um, and uh, I'm going to follow Emma's invitation to try to connect the two panels together with a question to, I guess, panelists on both panels. Um, so, Anupam, you talked about algorithms and how algorithms may be used to put people into boxes and how creditworthy they are, or are they eligible for a certain loan, and so forth. Um, and you reflected on how algorithms can build in persistence biases that disadvantage people versus others. But algorithms, when they're used, they're not used sort of in the, in the absence. 
they're replacing some other person who is making that decision, who also might be biased and perhaps more so than an algorithm. So I'm wondering here whether alg using algorithms is not so much a problem of biases, even though that it is, but a bigger concern is one that I believe Jesse Isinger raised in the earlier panel, which is that they deflect responsibility, right? That algorithms allow those who make choices to say, hey, it's not me, it's the algorithm who make that decision, further um, diffusing liability and further making it difficult to go after people who made the choices uh, that are, say, bad. Okay, thank you. Hmm. Okay, so great question, and I, I totally agree that um, the algorithms are replacing racist and sexist decision makers typically, right? Uh, and so uh, uh, you have to compare the baseline, compare them against the baseline. Um, the worry, of course, is that the algorithms are doing so, one, at larger scale, uh, and so they're making more decisions than humans have made before. Uh, second, um, which is the one that you pointed out, they are doing so in ways that make it harder to identify um, where the problem emerged. Uh, and it makes it easier, as you've just pointed out, for the those responsible, the human beings responsible, to uh, avert responsibility for for this behavior, so I think that's exactly right. I do think it's important when we when we uh, criticize these algorithms, and because the time I didn't have much, um, uh, you know, I think it's important that we recognize that uh, there are times that algorithms can be better than humans, uh, uh, but we have to be. Uh, that's why getting information is like the most important thing, uh, and to, to to figure out whether or not they are actually. Uh, doing things. And we may be able to find out what algorithms are doing more than we can find out what humans are doing in some cases. Uh, and so, uh, so anyway, I'll leave it at that. Yes. Hi. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Alexander Martone. I'm a was class of 15 here at Georgetown. Um, what I wanted to ask is something that Mr. Ruska, you sort of alluded to in, in your last comment, but it's a, it's a general question. One of the counter arguments towards stricter regulations, especially in the lending space, is that if you um, have tighter rules about what's predatory and what's not, people, especially low-income people, will lose access to necessary credit for any number of sort of important, you know, um, uh, life items. And you sort of wind up hurting people more if you have sort of this sort of restriction to access. I'm not sure if I buy that trade-off myself, but I wonder if you think that is a, a, an accurate description of the trade-off, and then if there's a, a way around that to have better protections and still help people who are in low-income situations and may need access to credit to get involved in the financial system in a safe way. Yeah, I, I think that's a really important issue and one that um, we have to give a lot of thought to. It, it's a great question. Um, the way I've looked at it, uh, is that I wanted to mention this when I was speaking. Uh, the uh, states regulate these. These are called consumer installment lenders, by the way, the ones that I'm talking about, not payday, uh, which is a different, you know, regime. But they, um, if you look at consumer installment laws across the states, they're all over the map. They're like, no, you know, whatever interest rate you want to charge is fine. Um, some are 36 percent. Uh, I think Maryland might be 28 percent. And they measure interest rates differently. It could be APR, could be. Um, and what I noticed is that these companies are eager to go into any state, no matter what the current rules. Nobody's veering away from the, the Maryland's, which might have in my in my reporting was the um, strictest. Uh, there are probably others that are even more strict, maybe Massachusetts, but um, it tells me that there's money to be made even at the you know strictest uh, level of regulation. Um, so if we're making an error right now, it's uh, it's in the direction of being too lenient and too open to to these lending 
Okay, well, Chris, Can I just make one Steve. quick comment on that too, which is not all pre not all predatory actions the same. So I think you have to think about it in context. So subprime lending in the lead up to the uh, crash is very different than the predatory lending that you're talking about, and it's different actually than the small dollar lending too. So I think we have to put it more in context to really think about how we regulate it, or if we regulate it, what the rules are and at what level. Okay, Chris. Thanks. Uh, Chris Frommer, I'm a professor here over at uh, Georgetown. I want to follow up um, just a little bit on Ushka's... <laughs> <laughs> it's not mine. It's not mine. It's not mine. <laughs> You're good. You're not being Your tough. time's oh, up. No! <laughs> <laughs> All right, Frommer, get out of here. Uh, but but um, so I, I spent a little bit of uh, my, my summer going through uh, East and West Africa and, and um, uh, Brazil and giving a talk over in Bogota thinking about um, financial inclusion. <laughs> And one of the things that I, I think uh, people see is that financial innovation can take all kinds of forms in the world. You have mobile banking, microfinance, um, crowdfunding, it's different kinds of, iter that's not mine, uh, crowdfunding is <laughs> different uh, um, iterations. And for the relevance, I think, of this panel in particular, you have this question of, of alternative data, right? And the question is uh, not just the algorithms in terms of the programming of the causal relationships sort of between uh, different inputs for the purposes of programming, but also uh, what, what the actual substantive um, inputs are. And so I was just wondering if you had any, any thoughts about that. Um, and it looks like you did. Thanks. So, so um, the question here, I think, um, it, it, to interpret it in one way at least, um, there are ways that we can measure credit uh, that might not be the traditional ways to measure your credit worthiness. Um, so rather than look at your credit history, we might look at your social network, or we might look at your activities. And you, this is the kind of activities that, you know, uh, machine learning algorithms tell us are likely to be uh, associated with, highly correlated with, uh, better credit risky uh, risk uh, uh, folks. Um, so I do think that actually that kind of innovation can be useful. So I'm not against you know changing the complex of things that uh, the credit bureaus have used. I I find the stuff that the credit bureaus use often incredibly stupid. Uh, the fact that I've opened up another credit card or closed a credit card, how the hell does that mean that I'm like suddenly become, you know, like closing an old credit card is reducing your, your credit standing? Uh, like what? Um, so anyway, so uh, so I think that we need innovation in these spaces because the current uh, models are are broken. Okay, we have time for one last question, Steve. Yeah, um, I actually want to, I think, follow up on what Dennis just said. I, I'd, I'd like comments on, your, your panel seems to be concerned with individuals, whereas the previous panel was concerned with the behavior of, of, of banks, Jamie Dimon. I, you know, I don't really see how um, an individual b b uh, taking a payday loan uh, because they need teeth and dealing with that issue has a lot to do with how we should be dealing with banks buying CDOs or synthetic CDOs. It seems to be a totally different mechanism. I mean, the, an individual could, might be able to protect themselves, but an investment bank deciding whether to buy a CDO, they may be following the Ponzi scheme of the market and just assuming that they're going to get out first. So I'd, I'd like you to comment on the the difference between the type of regulation that you guys are calling for and the type of regulation that would be called for to prevent the next meltdown? It is a great question. And in fact, it's a continuum. And at the same time, they're quite distinct. So if you think about the subprime mortgage uh, bubble, uh, when subprime mortgages really started taking off, like most mass consumer predatory action, it gets, a, it gets addressed at the municipal and state level. And that happened in subprime loans when whole neighborhoods were being victimized in this country, including in the state of Georgia. And so Georgia and other states started enforcing their state consumer protection laws on these individual cases, OK? And then what happened is the federal banking regulators came in, stomped on them in court, claimed preemption, and got shut down the state enforcement across the country of their consumer protection laws of the subprime, the massive predatory subprime lending activities in the country. And that then took off like crazy. 
to be expected, right? Because the feds did nothing. I know there are some who disagree with that, but I think the objective evidence is pretty clear. And then what you have is you have subprime mortgages being poured into the system. And then on top of that, when you have the originate to distribute model, which uh, incentivized fraud and crime. And then you have it all upstreamed. And then the big banks want to make money off them. So they then start creating, maybe at the beginning, legitimate CDOs, but very quickly fraudulent CDOs that were literally built to blow up, as we put in uh, detailed in the SECB Citigroup case in front of Judge Rakoff, how that particular CDO was literally designed to blow up, and it was also structured to um, fraudulently induce the purchasers to purchase the CDO. So the layer of fraud happens there at the CDO, and then, of course, they built fraudulent, worthless CDOs on top of them. Now, that's a way a continuum can happen from what you have is predation, consumer protection predation at the local level, but in fact has serious systemic implications. And the same thing happened if you look at this over history, when you look at major financial crashes and you go all the way back, you often find that they begin with basically consumer fraud. Look at dot com. It was inducing people fraudulently to buy stock in a company. And it worked so well they just started selling a bunch of more based on, you know, Companies that didn't have earnings, didn't have profits, and you can only get so much money there, so what did you do? It just amps up. Once the money starts coming in, if the predatory conduct at this level isn't stopped, it amps up all the way up. Well, sometimes it's a yeah. crash and sometimes it's Absolutely. not. I, I would add the, the company that I, I wrote about issued bonds based on the, the, the loans that they issued. So it goes from, I mean, it goes from the person who needs teeth through the bond system up to Warburg Pincus. Well, in the wholesale funding system, right? I mean, these, this takes an enormous amount of money to actually put out $1,000, $2,000, $3,000 loans through 450 outlets. And same thing in subprime. This money is coming from Wall Street. The biggest banks on Wall Street are providing the funding ultimately. They may do it through bankruptcy remotes, SIVs, or companies like this, but there is an interlocking network that funds the predatory the predatory companies have yeah. to get this massive amount of funding, which Warburg Pincus doesn't even have a balance sheet. I, I know we're out of time, but Anne, with your work on French financing, any uh, reflections on the bridge between the micro and the macro? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I just wanted to sort of acknowledge um, Steve's point that in some ways these two concerns do diverge at a point, right? So consumer protection versus concern about the systemic risk and the safety and soundness of the financial system. I mean, part of the reason for the creation of the CFPB was the sense that there was no federal agency that was looking after the consumer protection concerns and that to the extent agencies were charged with that, they were also charged with looking after safety and soundness. And when those two, uh, pursuit of those two goals diverged, they were more concerned with safety and soundness, which is why in, in um, the logic of Dodd-Frank is that you need an agency whose sole concern is the focus on the consumer transactions, even if they do have ripple effects for the system as, as a whole, you can't um, trust those who are looking out for the system to look out for the individual. Okay, great discussion, guys. Join me in thanking the panelists for this wonderful panel. She did exactly. You know, yeah, like right. this and is the kind of I want to participate in the discussion. You see what I'm saying? But we got the job done. Thank you, my man. As you're, as we're making the transition from this wonderful panel, thank you very much for being so mean. I loved it. Uh, we are setting up a conversation that I had with Jack Bogle, a legendary investor. Uh, financial leader, and a man who's focused his life, his uh, values on ethics, as well as limiting the expectation of excessive compensation. He is from a wealthy family uh, that suffered severe losses when he was a child uh, during the Great Depression. 
And as a result, he had to work in high school and in college. And he had a number of student jobs, that it, several of which were being a waiter, athletic department manager, a runner at a brokerage, reporter on a police beat, and a pin setter at a bowling alley, which he says was a terrible job. So he is someone who's worked with his hands. But he invented, in his 67 years in the industry, he invented the mutual fund with shared profit and the index fund. The combination of those two has done away with the idea of the highly compensated star uh, stock picker, uh, superstar stock picker, uh, using index funds instead of uh, the superstar stock picker. So he's received loads of accolades. Uh, I won't go through all of them, but he did get one from Warren Buffett. He said that if, Warren Buffett said, if there was a, ever a statute erected to the person who has done the most to protect the investor, Jack Bogle would get that hands down. Well, He's also been called a lot of names uh, by people in the industry. His index fund and his idea of having uh, no uh, star stock picker. A hedge fund manager last year called him and the idea of the index fund worse than Marxism. Uh, Bogle's Folly is another name he's been called. And you will see in this conversation, I went up to uh, Vanguard campus headquarters in Melbourne, Pennsylvania, spent time talking with him. I'm looking for Alex Martone. He must have stepped out. Uh, Jack Bogle has been generous to Georgetown. He gave an address uh, to the undergraduate school. He came here at my invitation and spoke to a conference on public-private partnerships. And when I asked him to do this interview, he said, of course. So uh, you'll see that Jack and I are having fun. Uh, our views converged quite a bit. So we're ready to uh, start that. And uh, we will hear that conversation about values in finance and the financial crisis of 2008. Should we, Jack, we're here to talk with you, have a conversation. Let's start with your background and experience. You're a business person, and you've been that for 67 years. That sounds awfully long. <laughs> well, it's a short time when you're having fun as you did. So what do you see going forward? What are your thoughts about the future in our current financial system. Well, Professor Jordan, it's great to be with you, Emma, and uh, all of you down in Georgetown. I'm sorry I can't make that trek. Uh, it's not that bad, but I just don't move so well. well and so I'm glad to be here and be with you by video. And I enjoy doing that. I've admired Professor Jordan for a long time. So it's fun to be doing it with you. Jack, we're here to talk with you, have a conversation. Let's start with your background and experience. You're a business person, and you've been that for 67 years. That sounds awfully long. <laughs> well, it's short time when you're having fun as you did. So what do you see going forward? What are your thoughts about the future in our current financial system? Well, Professor Jordan, it's great to be with you, Emma. And uh, all of you down in Georgetown, I'm sorry I can't make that trick. Uh, it's not that bad, but I just don't move so well. well and so I'm delighted. glad to be here and be with you by video. And I enjoy doing that. I've admired Professor Jordan for a long time. So it's fun to be doing it with you, Emma, too. So where are we now? Uh, let me take a look at, very quickly, where we were and what caused the crisis. Of course it was human beings. And it doesn't take any genius to figure out. And it was largely uh, mortgages that were sold to people that couldn't afford to have mortgages. 
and that is still with us today. Uh, the down payments of the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, uh, more U, U, U.S. government agencies, uh, runs about 3% on houses. That's not enough. And back then, the credit was much worse than it is today. I don't want to make any mistakes about that. But anybody that had gone out on the road with, with the mortgage sellers and seen the loans they were making with no backing at all uh, would, would have been scared to death of what was happening. The problem is all of us in financial were up in this ivory tower and didn't see that. That was the proximate cause. And leverage is almost always the cause of the cause of uh, financial breakdowns. High debt to capital breakdowns. liquidity. Yep, capital and liquidity mm -hmm. going all the way back in time mm -hmm. uh, and as, as far as we can go and measuring this, but even to the Roman Empire, for heaven's sake. So um, we still have, how, how are things today? Uh, let me first say, if you look at where we are at this moment, it's hard to be anything but completely bullish about the stock market and about America. Uh, our gross national product is starting to grow more rapidly than most expected. Our unemployment rate is down to an all-time low or very close to an all-time low. Uh, wages at last started to rise a little bit. Uh, the stock market is ebullient. And so what's the problem? The problem is that we don't live in the short term. We live for the long term. I don't know about anybody else, but I, <laughs> I don't know what the long term is for me. But for most of you in the audience, uh, the long term is a long way down the road. And we are cultivating a series of problems uh, that the market seems to be able to ignore, which is kind of surprising. But when, and on the other hand, the stock market has always ignored the long term and focused on the short term. And that's a very unfortunate aspect of it. So what do we have here today in the long term that's troubling me? Uh, number one, we have a di diminution of consumer protections. Uh, number two, we have some of the things in the Dodd-Frank Act uh, that are being taken away from us, some protections that were put in there to, to make sure we didn't have a crisis like the last one, including particularly, sadly, the Volca Rule. Absolutely. Uh, trying to, in the most <laughs> tentative way, trying to separate banking from investment banking. There's a lot of risk in investment banking that was thrown over into banking, and that's why I think every bank... With nation, deposit insurance backing it up. That sure. was the big and, issue for uh, Paul Volcker. The, I think just about every bank in America eliminated their dividends back in 2008. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something that's never happened before in history. So uh, we, I don't think we're back at that point, but we've given up some of the things that, we, that, we, that came along there. And then when you look more broadly, some of the long-term problems that affect our nation are being, I think, ignored. One, of course, is climate change. There's a lot going on out there. We hardly need to belabor that. And it seems to be accelerating. And there's a point of no return and all that. So that's a very scary thing. And maybe in a little softer or more subtle way, uh, two things that should not happen in our country, or three actually, uh, are happening. Um, one is the division between the wealthy and the not wealthy, or even those that are in poverty, uh, has widened. We should be narrowing that gap, but it's been widening. And part of the reason it's been wi widening is because we have done something that's great for corporations and wealthy people, but means very, actually negative for the average taxpayer. I read a piece of data the other day. You mean the recent tax cuts? Yeah, the recent tax cut. The recent tax cut for corporations. For, that are permanent. Yeah, for, that are permanent. And uh, that, over the next 10 years, that saves the corporation something like $50 billion. Yeah. How do we individuals come out of that? Because the present tax cuts are going to be repealed in a few years. Temporary. But assuming, assuming that happens. And that is the corporation's got $50 billion of tax benefit over the next 10 years. And individuals get a benefit of minus $83 billion. I mean, that is shocking. It's inexcusable. Uh, it's, I think, more hidden than it should be. And yet you see the Treasury Department talking about another $2 trillion of tax savings when... That yeah. they're going to do by regulation. <laughs> yeah. And okay. there's a, a legal opinion in the Bush administration that says that is illegal. You can't do it that way. No. Well, it, it, to me, it's, 
I'm very unhappy with what's going on in Washington, not so much as a political matter, but as an economic matter. This is not good for America. Uh, nothing the situation with Social Security and Medicare has gotten even worse. Uh, there seems to be no backbone to stand up and be counted and fix it. And it would take so little. If I could add a little anecdote about that, I was interviewed a few years ago, uh, and Paul Volcker was on the stage with me. And I, I said, I was asked about Social Security. And I said, look, uh, if you'd make me and Paul czars, we could fix Social Security in a matter of hours. Just wow. little fixes here and there. And Paul looked up and he said, couldn't we fix everything? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So we have that going on. Can we appoint you as ours <laughs> just by fiat among friends? <laughs> I, I think we're, we're, we're both getting a little old for czarships. Uh, oh, uh, well. We might be able to name some candidates. And then another thing that's deeply troubling is the seeming growth in racial division in the country. This is a multi cultural country. It is getting increasingly so, and yet we seem to be fighting uh, to keep things the way they were. And the way they are going to be here is going to be different than the way they were. And I'm not taking any position on whether I like the old way better or the new way better, but it's, the world is going to change, and this nation is just going to have to, have to do it, change with it. Uh, you know, you can't well, we're a nation of constant change. Yeah, of course From we the are. beginning, that momentum is the renewal of the American purpose. Yeah. And uh, we're also trying to seem to be limiting America's greatest strength in terms of population growth. I mean, this nation has had for a long time virtually no, if not no, population growth. And we're trying to make immigration much tougher. Uh, all these things <laughs> seem to me to be kind of surprising. And uh, just one more thing, talking about the debt side, the federal government's going to have a deficit of a trillion dollars this year. A trillion dollars. What, what does it consist of? Well, it, that debt consists of bonds mm -hmm. uh, and uh, owned often by 60% of, I think, the Treasury bonds are owned by foreign countries. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot up in the air. And uh, the long-run outlook is quite concerning unless we summon the courage to act on it and the political will to act on it. And it doesn't look like that's going to happen today or tomorrow or this year, but at some point we have to reconcile uh, the problems of the country with the realities that we face. Um, going back to 2008, where were you in September of 2008 when Lehman failed? What were your thoughts? and sources of information about this dramatic failure. Well, I was probably sitting right in this office, just as I am today. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's where I usually am, although I do some traveling. But that's probably a good guess. And I didn't think the fallout would be as great as it was, to be honest with you. And I didn't think, I don't hold to the position, that Lehman should have been bailed out. Why? Mm -hmm. They have all this leverage. They made all mistakes. Uh, it, it really um, it troubled me back then. I think this is a quote I gave to Gretchen Morganson at the New York Times. Uh, we got to all this, this public policy of too big to fail. And yet the people who were hurt by all this were, if you will, too small to bail. People with the bad That's mortgages. a wonderful uh, <laughs> way of capturing and, the contrast. And that's still a big problem in the country because the highly wealthy, the top of probably not even the top uh, tenth of one percent, but the top one hundredth of one percent, has such influence, such political influence. Uh, we'll see what happens in the fall election. Money is being poured into it. Uh, and, and the, uh, a uh, power that is shocking and far greater than it ever should have been allowed to be. And we see this in a lot of places. Uh, see a lot of it in the financial business. We see chief executive salaries that are a joke, an absolute joke. Uh, their salaries in the, say, last 25 or 30 years in real terms have gone up maybe three or four or five times. And the average wage of the people that are doing all the hard work, to be honest with you, uh, have gone up zero in, in real dollars uh, in weekly, weekly compensation. And that spread, and, and why, why are people, why are we holding back wages in order to pay off executives. 
and I don't and stockholders too. You know, I always thought, and I felt like they feel like this still for Vanguard. The most important asset we have is the crew that comes in here uh, to work every day, committed to our mission, uh, wanting to do the best job they can, having a high level of integrity. That's the way to build a business. And uh, yet corporations ignore that. Why? Because again, I keep coming back to this, because it's a, it's a long run problem and not so much a short run problem. It's called right sizing. Absolutely. And I know one of your pet peeves is the carried interest uh, deduction. Could you say a few words about that and your thoughts about that? Carried interest, and I think everybody in the audience knows this, is the ability to, um, to um, turn what any normal person would call income into capital gains. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's, it stretches your credulity as well as stretches the law, and there have been efforts to change it. Uh, at some point, both sides of the aisle in Congress were in favor of changing it, but somehow it didn't make it through this last tax law. I think there may have been some small adjustments in it, but uh, why? You know, why are we? Yeah. <laughs> First, it makes no economic sense and no logical sense, but second, as a matter of public policy, it enriches the rich, uh, and <laughs> I, I don't see what the point of that is. I want to go to that period of March to September. We have one failure, don't know what's happening next. What, what were your thoughts? And looking back, what are your thoughts about what could have been done in that period? What is the meaning of that period? Well, a couple of things. One, I don't remember at my age exactly what happened from one month to the next back then. Uh, but I do remember a couple of things very well. And that is, at, at Bear Stearns, there was some funny business, for the want of a better word, among the hedge fund managers who were able to get out their own money out and leave the money in for, the, for their clients, right. and they got in no trouble at all, right. which takes me to a broader issue. With all this, I would say, criminal behavior, although I can't cite chapter and verse in the law, but certainly uh, extremely bad behavior uh, by the executives, and even all the way down the line, department heads, nobody went to jail. Nobody. Vanguard is a major institutional investor. You've talked about the long term, and I must say I've grown wealthy with Vanguard. All right. Yeah. Nice I believed in Vanguard from an early age, and it's been wonderful. But I, the, in, Index fund combined with the patient investor approach means you don't do proxy fights, you don't do get rid of the CEO, but you have a policy of engagement. Could you talk a bit about that? It's, yeah. it, it's not you, but the yeah, firm. No, I'm happy to talk about it. Yeah, engagement. Uh, what is that? What, what would be included? For at least a decade, I have been talking about uh, the lack of governance by funds. I have a speech I gave some years ago called The Silence of the Funds. And uh, it was deeply disturbing to me to see that these con new controllers of American business were doing essentially nothing. And uh, I, I tried to get a group of institutional investors who were long-term holders. And let me pause there and say that most mutual funds are more like renters of stocks mm -hmm. than owners of stocks. Because they're trading. Yeah, and when, when you rent stocks, you really don't give a darn about corporate governance. And I would almost argue, shouldn't give a darn. What do you care if you're only holding the stock for a week or a month or a year? Mm -hmm. So um, we need the long-term holders, the owners, to really step up. And I wanted to try to create an association of mutual fund, um, long-term mutual fund people. Mm -hmm. And I tried very hard. Uh, to put one together, and uh, Warren Buffett told me that if I could get the group together, he would join. That would have been a huge asset. Huge. But I couldn't get a single fund to join the group. Why not? <laughs> well, if you vested interest, probably because the idea comes from Bogle. This is not something that's with, without uh, precedent in American business. 
Uh, you know, you don't like the deliverer of the message, so you don't like the message. Um, but th that went aborting. But since then, and that's probably eight or nine years ago anyway, no, maybe 12 years, uh, maybe 15, uh, we've come a long, long way here. Uh, I had the temerity to be a little critical, or not very critical, of our own proxy votes, and even led a fight to make sure that mutual funds under a new SEC proposal, that the proposal got implemented, and that mutual funds would be required to report to their own shareholders how they voted their shares. I mean, That's it's so funny. There was a huge outcry from the industry. Yeah. This will ruin the industry. I mean, yeah. it's so hard if you're all you in the audience, you lawyers know, are familiar with agency theory. <laughs> and uh, if the mutual fund manager is the agent and your shareholder is the principal, for the agent to tell the principal, I'm not going to tell you how I voted, <laughs> would be laughable. <laughs> so yeah. since then, Vanguard has come a long way, a positive way. Uh, and in corporate engagement, uh, we, and we vote the proxies uh, normally for the management, no question about that. I don't see anything the matter with that. Uh, but when there's a proxy fight like the Hewlett, Hewlett Packard one, we stand up and be counted for what we believe. Mm -hmm. I think we stood up with the management of Hewlett Packard at that time, I can't remember, uh, who, who wanted to, to do a merger. Uh, it turned out not to be a good idea, but that's another story. And uh, we report in the stewardship report every year, must be 15 or 20 pages, exactly how we voted everything, all the areas we're working in. Mm -hmm. So I love that improvement. Mm -hmm. And other people are going to have to engage. And I don't know if your audience realizes this, how substantial this control is. And that is, Vanguard owns 8.5% of every company in America. That's right. And BlackRock probably owns about 8.5%. That's 17%. And State Street probably owns 4%. That's 22%. That's a quarter of all the stock in America in three firms. And that has right. its own dangers. That yeah. has its own dangers. What would and, those be? Well, the danger is, is a concentration of economic power. Yes. And uh, it hasn't been abused yet. But uh, we want to be with a very watchful eye because all these three firms, the three biggest firms, or essentially the three biggest firms in the field, are index firms. And, you know, there's the old Wall Street rule, if you don't like the manager, sell the stock. But the index fund cannot follow that rule because That's it holds right. the stock. So it's ruled, and logic, all logic would tell you, if you don't like the management, change the management or work to improve the management. Uh, that's logic, and we're now starting to do that to the extent we can. You are starting to do that. Grow and grow and grow. You have five dreams for the future for our nation based on trust, ethics, and the regulation of the fiduciary role of the finance industry. Tell us about your five dreams. I thought that was just brilliant to lay out what your dreams are for the future of finance. Well, <laughs> you have to remake the human soul to get all this done. Let me acknowledge that. Uh, so it will not be easy and it will take time. But sooner or later, I mean, what does fiduciary duty mean? It means putting the client first. If you run a hardware store down the street, you have to put the client first. Right, or you'll be out uh, of business. It's, or you'll be out of business. In, this, in the financial industry, that doesn't seem to happen because the stock market goes like this. And uh, let me say, I won't bore you with all the arithmetic, but if you don't index fund over the last, say, 35 years, I can't remember the number, you would have made 60 times on your money. Mm -hmm. And if you don't actively manage fund, you would have owned 40, 40 times. A tremendous difference. Uh, but um, nobody's unhappy. Why would I be unhappy if I made 40 times of my money? Right. So we, we need people to study this. We need people to realize, see comparisons about how this works compared to how they've done and how they've cost it down. But okay. I'm an idealist. Mm -hmm. I've always been an idealist. Uh, I have lived an idealist and I will die an idealist. Uh, I can't help that. So these, these rules, these hopes and goals, of an integrity-laden industry that puts clients first, fiduciary duty, uh, responsible corporate voting, um, long-term focus on your investments, not turnover all the time. We know that that doesn't work. It can't work. 
and the, the, the numbers take. It works for A, but not for B. So um, that will happen someday. For you, the financial crisis of 2008 was an ethical crisis. I want you to give us a bit more of enough. Uh, in one part of that book, you say enough is one dollar more than <laughs> what I need. That's a, that's a quote from somebody else, maybe John D. Rockefeller. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So, but you you picked it up and uh, included it. So what's your thinking about what is enough and the role of money in measuring your value? in the world. Well, I, it would be a tragedy if your only objective in this world were to make money. Uh, you know, work itself is valuable. Work itself is fulfilling. How much you get paid is part of the system. Uh, how much you spend. Uh, one reason I don't care so much about money is that both Eve and I, or my wife and I, uh, really don't like to spend. I don't like to go into stores. I do sneak a sweater out of the L.L. Bean catalog every once in a while. I hear you uh, fly coach. Is that right? <laughs> hmm? I hear that you fly coach. Yes. Oh, my God. That is so well, why impressive. Why not? Why not? I, that's what I do. I mean, but I'm not you, <laughs> legendary investor. But that's your thinking. Yep. Well, well it's, it's, I want to meet shareholders back there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Back in steerage, as we used to call it. And... Uh, it, it suits me fine. I don't need any more than that. I don't do much flying anymore because that's airports are troublesome and yeah. uh, for me to get around in. Uh, but I, I, I just can't imagine spending all that extra money for first class. I just can't imagine that, particularly with the company's money. Right. I mean, I can spend my own money on anything I want, and no one should complain about it. But it just seems like throwing money away. Yeah. Everybody tells me I'm totally wrong, by the way. Some one of my pals. Has a, has, claims to have a license plate that says, fly first class or your children will. Ah, <laughs> oh boy. Speaking of children, maybe we can wrap up with this thought. You have six children, 12 grandchildren. What do you see in the democratic process to control finance, to ensure greater equality, that every person is born equal, the Declaration of Independence. What do you see as the opportunity for some of your dreams, your five dreams as a starting point, uh, to be realized for your family? I know your family is a key part of your identity in your life. Well, what, what I've tried to do, or did try and do with my family when they were younger, and by the way, I should add bragging a little bit, we also have Go six, ahead. six great grandchildren. Great grands. Oh, I yeah. didn't know about that. <laughs> six great grands. I knew um, about the twelve grandchildren, but not the six great grands. Well, I, I, my wife's a fabulous person and a fabulous mother. This is and Eve. I was, of course, doing a lot this of work, traveling, uh, maybe doing a little less family things than I should have been doing. I accept that criticism, uh, but I thought my role was to live the kind of a life that my children could observe and say, that is the kind of life I want to live. Okay, I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Our keynote speaker has arrived. And assemble yourselves toward the front, if you don't mind. You can leave those dirty dishes on the place where they are and come toward the front. That would be great. Uh, if you would do that, I know there are people coming in and out. Some are here for part of it and not for others. But uh, I'll give you a chance to get settled down, and then I'll say a few words about Sheila Bear. Okay, we are pleased to have Sheila Bear here with us today. And Sheila, while you were not here, I talked behind your back. I said that you are an unindicted co-conspirator of this conference. <laughs> and that the two of us cooked up this project and with your support and help, I was able to go forward. 
Um, Sheila Bear was chair of the FDIC between 2006, 2006 and 2011. She had the crisis, and she led the agency skillfully during one of the nation's most challenging financial panics. Uh, she is one of the first officials to warn about the oncoming subprime mortgage failure. Uh, she worked relentlessly to represent the interests of homeowners, bank customers, and taxpayers as the crisis played out. She chronicled her five years at the FDIC in this best-selling book, and as you can see, mine is tab front to back. I've read every word and underlined it. It is full of wisdom. Um, she said in this book, the year 2008 would bring with it economic Armageddon. Trillions of dollars worth of investor losses, the largest bank failures in history, and a chokehold on credit flows to the real economy that would end up costing more than 8 million people jobs. It didn't have to be the, that way. And she was one of the early uh, proponents of rescuing homeowners first, rather than the bailout of the large financial institutions. And that endeared her to me completely, is thinking about homeowners as opposed to the large institutions that the other financial regulators were so focused on. Now, this book, Sheila is a woman who is strategic and thinks about the future. This book is now published for younger readers. And the title of it is Bullies of Wall Street. So she's uh, making the audience in the future as wise as we have become by reading her work, Fearless. In fact, she has a chapter in this book called The Audacity of That Woman. Uh, she was one of the few women who was in that top regulatory role at the table and uh, the bullies of Wall Street, I'll let her tell you stories of her interaction there. So she uh, continues to chair a systemic risk council, a public interest group that monitors the implementation of financial reforms. We are delighted to have her with us, and she will share her wisdom with us. What are the lessons that we must learn from the financial crisis. Well, thank you, Emma. And uh, let me apologize in advance. I've got a terrible cold, so I'm going to try to make it through this without uh, coughing and hacking in your ear through this microphone, hopefully. Um, it's really, it's nice to be here, and uh, when uh, Emma called me with the idea of have, having a conference um, uh, of this nature, um, you know, I, I thought it was a great idea. Um, there have been a lot of financial crises conferences, as, as you might have imagined. Uh, I was at one last night in Chicago, but I think this one is special because of the diversity of thought it's trying to elicit. And uh, to, uh, you know, groupthink really was one of the things that got us into trouble in 2008, right? Everybody was, you know, all the, all the elites were saying it's fine, you know, how home prices don't go down, banks know how to manage risk. And boy, did we uh, all get it wrong. And so I think uh, having a diversity of viewpoints and listening to a diversity of viewpoints, particularly from outside the financial sector, is important. Um, let me start, uh, I want to talk about the lessons I don't think we've learned, uh, the title of this talk, but, but let me, I don't want to be too pessimistic, so let me begin with things that I think we got right uh, in Dodd-Frank, because I, I do think we got a lot of things right in Dodd-Frank. It was a very important bill. Um, one thing uh, we got was, and unfortunately it's, it's deteriorating now, but we got a bipartisan uh, consensus in favor of uh, strong capital requirements, a general recognition by both Republicans and Democrats that a key part of the problem was uh, financial institutions were just relying too much on borrowed money, were relying too much on short-term borrowed money, 
Uh, so they didn't have an equity cushion to absorb losses when the crisis came, and then they had trouble funding themselves because they were relying, they were having to roll debt uh, in, a, in a time when the investors were very skeptical about um, their financial integrity. So even Republicans, and uh, even though Republicans did not support Dodd Frank, I'm a Republican, I think a lot of you probably know that. Um, the alternatives all featured capital. That was the centerpiece. So there, there was a strong uh, bipartisan consensus that there needed to be more capital in the banking system. That was uh, reflected uh, in several places in Dodd-Frank. And then, of course, it also institutionalized stress testing, which said, well, not only do we need more capital, we need to make sure the capital is good through the cycle. So, you know, sure, anybody can, can look good. Anybody's balance sheet can look good in, uh, in healthy times with a growing economy and very low uh, delinquencies and defaults. But uh, what does that uh, capital look like in downturns when the value of assets are deteriorating and credit quality is deteriorating? So we, the Dodd-Frank institutionalized stress test so that large financial institutions in particular could demonstrate they were resilient through a cycle, not just in good times. And then we also uh, instituted better resolution tools. This is something I pushed for uh, quite vigorously and was pleased it was included in Dodd-Frank. It's called Title II, Orderly Liquidation Authority. And basically it provides the FDIC working with the Treasury and the Fed authority that no one had uh, during the crisis, which was to resolve a large financial institution, the organization itself. There was authority that the FDIC had to resolve individual banks, right? And then we use that for smaller banks and mid-sized banks like, uh, like WAMU. <clears throat> but for the very largest institutions, uh, they had significant activity going on outside their insured bank. And then, of course, investment banks like Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns, were, uh, their activities were almost completely, they had teeny tiny little insured thrifts. So um, there was no tool that would allow the government to manage a, a, a it's basically a bankruptcy process, but it's, it's managed by the FDIC, where what would happen is what should happen, which is if an institution gets into trouble, its shareholders and its unsecured creditors take the losses. That's what they do. That's the, that's the way markets work. And if you invest, uh, you need to have your eyes open and, and make sure you know uh, what kind of institution you're investing in. And if you invest in their shares or buy their debt, uh, you should assume the risk of uh, that institution uh, may get itself into trouble and guard against that. It's called market discipline, which uh, we didn't have a lot of uh, prior to uh, prior to the crisis. So with Title II, we now have a, a credible process that says, okay, the government is going to take you into resolution. We understand there's some tricky things about financial institutions. So we want to have this backstop tool available to be able to manage your, your, bank, your failure, but your shareholders and unsecured creditors are going to take losses. You know, we're going to leave your bad assets behind with them and let them absorb those losses. We'll clean you up and uh, probably break you up too and create a healthy bank which will recapitalize. And um, oh, by the way, your all your top management and your board leadership will lose their jobs and we're gonna claw back three years of your compensation as well. So it was, a, it was a, it's a punitive, it's more punitive actually than bankruptcy and I think appropriately so because one of the things, uh, things that troubled me most about all the bailouts was that people were not held to account for their actions. And uh, some of that was just, we were flying by our, uh, you just making it up as we went along because there really was no tool, there was no playbook for large non-banking institutions. But we needed a framework and we needed something that would be consistently applied too because a lot of the, uh, you know, another criticism, which I think is fair, is the inconsistency. So we lavish, uh, you know, assistance on Citigroup. Uh, we let Lehman fail. We support a Bear Stearns uh, merger or a J.P. Morgan Chase acquisition of, of, of Bear Stearns. Uh, but we basically assert government control over AIG. I mean, it was it was all over the place. The markets were um, confused. And again, uh, you know, I think people did the best they could because there really was no playbook. But going forward, there is a consistent set of rules now in terms of what should happen. And uh, in conjunction with Title II, uh, Dodd-Frank banned the Fed, prohibited the Fed from doing any kind of one-off bailouts with its 13-3 authority. Now, 13.3 is something that had hardly ever been used uh, prior to the crisis. And there was one tiny situation. It's, it's basically it's authority for the Fed in extraordinary circumstances to lend to non-bank entities. And, but the Fed really used it. They spent trillions of dollars of credit facilities using 13.3. And those facilities helped a lot. They helped stabilize the system and, and make sure there was uh, enough uh, liquidity in the system. But uh, but it was all also used or for one-off assistance, and uh, the Congress, I think, quite rightly said, well, we have Title II now, which is basically a bankruptcy-type process, so if you have 
a mismanaged institution that is insolvent, we want you to use Title II. We don't want you to bail that institution out because that's bad for markets. That's bad for economic recovery. They said the Fed could still use 13 p for, for generally available supports. If you got in a truly systemic situation where everybody was seizing up, they could provide, make generally available support uh, to everybody, but no one off bailouts. And I think uh, I think that was uh, completely appropriate. Now, probably you've heard <laughs> that uh, some of my uh, colleagues uh, during that time, uh, led by Tim Geithner, uh, are very upset about that uh, limitation and want to um, want Congress to lift it. And uh, I think that's a very bad idea. They also uh, want to lift the limits on the use of the Exchange Stabilization Fund and uh, the FDIC debt guarantees, which were also two extraordinary tools. The FDIC had never done that before. And we did that, and I was uncomfortable, but we did do that. It was a successful program from the standpoint of we were able to put them on, put the guarantees on, we were able to take them off. Um, there, was not, uh, there were not uh, financial losses. There was some financial gain um, in the program. Not that that justifies that it doesn't. But it was in terms of addressing the immediate problem of banks not being able to roll their debt, right? They were relying on all the short-term financing. They couldn't access the credit markets to roll their own debt. So we gave them a guarantee on their liabilities, basically designed limited so that they could roll what they currently have. They couldn't expand their balance sheet um, with that program. Um, so Congress uh, basically said neither one of those tools can be used now uh, without a congressional resolution. So. Whether that's effectively still available, I don't know. I think, you know, with so many uh, members getting in trouble with their TARP votes, um, whether they would support it, I don't know. I will say one thing uh, that, uh, first of all, I think I'm going to spend about two more minutes on this and get off of it because I think the last thing we should be talking about right now is bailout tools. Right? <laughs> we should be talking about prevention and accountability. We shouldn't be talking about uh, bailout tools. Um, but I, I would say that it's... Um, <clears throat> If you're, if you're going to limit something, you know, liability guarantees are less politically sensitive because they don't involve the transfer of government money into an institution. So you, you, liability, you guarantee the debt for a, a specified period of time, we charge a fee, take it off, that's it. So it, it doesn't add to the money supply, it doesn't involve government money going into institutions. So ironically, these, these liability guarantees were somewhat less controversial than the, certainly the TARP capital investments or all the Fed lending. But Congress uh, chose to limit those, so you know I think that's fine. It's not. I think it's. I, I mean, I'm not sure why they picked those two. It's not a priority with me to 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 take them off. But um, I think the most important thing was that they started in the new paradigm going forward is no more one-off bailouts, and if you get into trouble, you go into Title II. So I think those are the things I think we got right. Now, what did we not? quite get right. Well, capital was something we got right, but but not enough in my book. And I think there are a lot of other people who agree with me. We still have, you know, allow a lot of high levels of leverage. You know, it just it just drives me crazy when I read in the press. You know, and sophisticated reporters, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, just kind of take it as fact that we've got all this capital in the banking system now, right? Oh, we're well, well capitalized. We've got all this new capital in the banking system. So the leverage ratio, which in my view is the most credible measure of how well capitalized a bank is, still allows large financial entities to fund themselves with 95% debt, right? So only 5% of their funding has to come from common equity. That's a lot of leverage. So to say that we've gone too far on this, I think, uh, and, and that is being used now to try to you know, roll back some of these rules, which I, I'm, I'm very concerned about. To say that we went too far on capital is just ludicrous. And especially given how well the... U.S. banks have been do, uh, doing vis-a-vis -vis European banks, where the European banks were much more thinly capitalized than our banks were going into the crisis, still have not uh, re aggressively recapitalized, still continue to struggle. You know, I just, uh, the FT had a, a really good article recently about how U.S. banks have come to dominate the global financial system, right? So J.P. Morgan Chase's market capitalization by itself is greater than the five largest European banks. So that was not the, crazy, uh, the, the uh, situation prior to the crisis. So why bank lobbyists are coming to Washington and saying that we are stronger capital rules are hurting their competitive position when they're just, you know, they're, they're eating the lunch of their competition is, uh, is just, uh, I think, uh, is beyond disingenuous. And, and it's, it's shocking to me that there are members of Congress, Republican members of Congress, who are buying into this and trying to put pressure on the Fed um, to ease up on the capital rules. So I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned about that, and hopefully uh, the Fed will hold firm. I hope they do. 
housing finance is another area where we really didn't address. I don't know if that's at the top of my priority list. A lot of people talk about it. Um, you know, Fannie and Freddie are still in conservatorship. They're still a big part of the mortgage market. People have different ideological views about whether that's right or not. But the mortgage market, you know, of all the risks that are out there in the economy, the mortgage market seems to be one of the safer places right now. <laughs> I don't know if that's high on my priority list to, for Congress to turn to. Um, non-banks, though. I think non-banks are a significant uh, source of uncertainty, a lot as we've enhanced uh, supervision appropriately on regulated banks. Uh, more credit intermediation has gone into the non-bank sector. Um, Dodd-Frank provided some rules and powers for non-banks, which really have not been used much. One was Title I authority to designate non-banks as systemic. The current administration has uh, you know, said they're not wild about Title I, so that's not really been aggressively used. Then Title VIII uh, has uh, the ability to regulate activities in the non-bank sector. Uh, but there again, that was invoked uh, to push, prod the SEC to do some money market uh, fund reforms. But other than that, we really haven't seen aggressive use of the new authorities uh, regulators have uh, to, uh, to oversee uh, non-banks. And of course, we also have the FSOC, the Financial Stability Oversight Council, which is made up of all the, the major regulators within in the Office of Financial Research, which again has kind of been weakened under the current administration. The idea was that you would have you know, a, a, coordinated, a coordinating authority along with OFR, uh, um, a, a research office is mandated to look across the system for systemic risks. But there again, disappointing. We haven't done much. There's still a lot of inconsistency in reports. Regulators aren't sharing information with each other uh, as well as they should. Um, uh, so, um, you know, the Volcker Rule, I think, is, is a prime example of that, where each agency still has their own trading data reports, and they're not <laughs> they're in inconsistent formats, and they're not consolidating them and, and reading them in a meaningful way, when they could get some probably pretty good data if they did. So that that has been, um, those are the things I don't think we've done particularly well. And then more broadly, for our economic recovery, uh, we pretty much use, try, have been using debt to fuel our recovery. So, you know, we had a crisis that was come by too much borrowing, and then we implemented very aggressive monetary policy to encourage people to borrow to, to uh, come back from that crisis. So we used debt to uh, fuel a recovery uh, and from uh, coming out of a crisis that was caused by too much debt. And uh, I am, you know, I, I just think across the board, uh, assets are overvalued. Um, we've got more leverage than ever. If you look at it as a percentage of GDP, relatively simple metric, you know, on a nominal dollar basis, we, we're way above historic highs in almost all categories. As a percentage of GDP, though, we're the historic highs for government debt, for corporate debt, Non-mortgage consumer debt is also at historic highs, uh, fueled heavily by, um, to, uh, well, student loans, obviously, and that student loan concentration is heavily in lower-income families. Subprime auto as well, I think, been out of control for a few years now. So we've got a lot of debt out there. Uh, we've been fueling growth with debt. Uh, that's not sustainable at some point. You know, you can only, you need, you need real wage growth, and we're seeing a little bit of that now. This has been a problem for a long time. Finally, this recovery is trickling down a bit. Uh, I, I worry it's coming at the end of the cycle. But uh, that's if you want a sustainable economy, you've got to grow your middle class. You do that with real wage growth. You don't do that by letting them borrow money that they can't afford to pay back. I thought we learned that in 2008. Uh, maybe, maybe not. But uh, anyway, uh, a lot of debt out there, uh, a lot of inflated asset valuations. And uh, I think uh, at some point those chickens are going to come home to roost. So, so what's Washington doing about this? So, you know, people ask me, are we ready for a next crisis? And I said, well, you know, the cycle is probably about ready to turn because Washington is deregulating. <laughs> because, you know, government policymakers typically are pro-cyclical, right? So when you have a crisis and a deep recession and the economy is crying out for credit, oh, golly, we just had a crisis. So they tighten up on the banks, they tighten up on lending, and that's when they start regulating it. And then when you get into a boom cycle or towards the end of a boom cycle and things started getting frothy and lending standards start to loosen and asset valuations uh, get into nosebleed levels, they're saying, oh, my gosh, we've had this recovery for so many years. We don't need all this regulation. And that's exactly what happened in 2006 and what I sense is, is starting to happen now. So um, the ball got rolling with S2155. And uh, to, uh, in fair dis full disclosure, 
The parts of S2155 that dealt with the regional and smaller banks, I didn't really have a problem with. I was always concerned that we, for, for an automatic trigger for enhanced prudential standards, raising that the automatic trigger did not bother me. Because I think by casting the net so wide for enhanced prudential standards, we were diluting somewhat the focus on the truly the 68 truly systemic uh, institutions. So, so that didn't really bother me. And I kind of looked the other way uh, for a while, which I hadn't, because lo and behold, once the you know the deal was uh, done and the the bill popped up in the Senate, it had a nice little sweetener for large custody banks. Basically reducing their leverage ratio for well, for the three largest custody banks, uh, reducing the leverage ratio by twenty percent, and they did it in a way. Not only did they take you know reduce their capital buffers by twenty percent or their capital minimums, but they did it in a way that really adulterates the integrity of the leverage ratio because they basically said, well, we think that you know money you have on reserve uh, in your reserve deposits at the Fed is super safe, so you don't need to have that in your leverage ratio calculation. Well. The whole idea of a leverage ratio is to not make risk judgments, period. The whole idea of a leverage ratio is to say, we don't care what your business model is. If you're a safety net institution, if you've got deposit insurance, if you've got access to the Fed, there's a certain amount of leverage beyond which we don't think you should go. And for big systemic institutions, we've set that you know, 5% minimum equity requirement. And is it true that, that uh, Mellon or Northern Trust uh, has uh, you know very little risk in their deposits they have at the Fed? You bet it is. But I'll bet you dollars to donuts and their trading books and the derivatives exposures, they've got risks that are where 5% is not nearly enough. <laughs> so to say, you know, to say in isolation, oh well I've got this money in, on reserve deposits, so they must be safe. We're going to take that at a leverage ratio. Again, adulterated, I think, that the purity of the leverage ratio is a non-risk weighted measure. And I think it starts a very dangerous precedent because now what else are we going to start? And, you know, it complicates, uh, complicates the leverage ratio, too, because another um, important benefit of the leverage ratio is that it is simple and it should be simple. It's the only thing that markets were looking at in 2008. Nobody trusted these just risk-based capital requirements. They're too complex. They're, we've improved them a lot, but they're still heavily reliant on, on uh, opaque models, both used by the bank and by the Fed. And so, uh, you know, it's very important, I think, to maintain the uh, the integrity of the leverage ratio. And and this is a very uh, bad uh, precedent, I think, that was set by S2155. And of course, then once we had S2155, then that signaled the Fed. So then they went they went, they went ahead with the rule that reduced uh, by 20 percent uh, the minimum leverage ratio requirement for the eight biggest FDIC insured banks. So that's 120 billion dollars of capital, and they they admit that that's in their NPR. Nobody's disputing that number. They say at the holding company level, the capital will still say the same. But at the insured bank level, which is where the primary exposure of the government is and, and also where the, the operating subs are, where the really essential functions to the economy, like you know payment processing, lending, financing, those are all done in the insured bank, uh, this proposal would, would potentially release $120 billion out of those uh, FDIC insured banks. So you know what is up with that? Um, this is at a time, you know, we're at the end of the cycle where I think uh, pe other people like Don Cohn and Jason Furman and a bunch of regional uh, Fed bank heads are saying, well, actually, since we're at the end of the cycle, we maybe we should be raising capital requirements. So they're talking about raising the risk-based requirements, which would be fine. Any, you know, any metric they want to use is, is fine with me, but kind of assaulting the leverage ratio now. And what happens is the, the argument, so we have risk-based ratios and we have leverage ratios. And when you get into very benign economic times, or at least times where you don't, you have very few credit losses, what happens is your risk-weighted measure will start to reflect a, a lower capital requirement because your assets look so safe. You know, all my delinquencies are so low and all my car loans and my credit cards, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what happens at the end of the cycle. The risk-based ratio will let you uh, lower your capital minimum. And the leverage ratio is there to be a constraint on that. So it's not surprising the leverage ratio is now kicking in. But people are arguing, well, that's a bad thing. We've got to lower the leverage ratio. Um, and no, that's the wrong response. The right response would be what Don Cohn and others have said. Let's, let's increase the risk-based standards through a count, what's called a counter-cyclical capital buffer. And, and so far, the Fed, uh, Jay Powell's been asking about that several times. He was asking about it this week again. He uh, doesn't seem to think uh, the time is ripe yet. I'm concerned that he feels that we really need to wait until we have some you know, strong warning signs. Uh, before they institute it, and then and then I think it's probably too late. I mean, you want you want them to build the capital buffers when they're still 
you know, making profits and and uh, and, uh, and their credit losses are low. Once once they they start losing money in the downturn, the ability to go out there and raise more capital or retain uh, more capital is going to be uh, much more challenging. So, uh, but I think there's a very active debate on that, and, and good for uh, people like Leo Brainerd, who's been talking about this, Eric Rosengren uh, from the Boston Fed. Um, they're they're out there, and uh, and I really hope that the leadership of the Fed listens to that. And that's that's what they should be worrying about now. Eight, raising capital requirements, not not uh, reducing and weakening uh, the leverage ratio. So, um, you know, I, I want to talk a little bit about this uh, this Republican effort. You know, and I hate to say it, it's a Republican effort uh, to to uh, to weaken capital rules uh, across the board. And I, I am so disappointed in my own party because Republicans should like capital. That's market discipline. That, that's that's skin in the game. That's forcing equity owners to put more of their own money. Uh, into the bank to fund the bank and creating more incentives to monitor risk. And um, so to really be pushing the, for Republicans, you know, and I, I understand there are going to be disagreements with Republicans on the CFPB, maybe on the Volcker rule, maybe on some other things. But capital, I really never thought uh, we would lose our consensus. But it appears that we have. And uh, I would just ask uh, those Republicans who have signed some pretty aggressive letters to the Fed. They've been in the press. I assume you've seen them. Go, go Google it. If it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, I'm completely uh, shocked that they're doing it, uh, would take a second, uh, you know, think about this a little more hard, about who they're listening to, and probably bank lobbyists who are paid in, in bank stock. So, you know, they, you, know, you lower capital, you increase shareholder returns. So I just, I just think it's over the top, and I would ask them to think, uh, you know, listen to groups like the Systemic Risk Council and the Americans for Financial Reform and in better markets and others who have uh, who are speaking out uh, and speaking to the public a voice in this because this is absolutely the wrong time. We shouldn't be lowering capital. And I, th this is just to talk about amnesia. This is exactly what happened to me in 2006 when I was at the FDIC. When I got there, the FDIC had already been fighting a good fight against these new uh, international capital rules called the uh, advanced approaches, the Basel Committee advanced approaches. And this is basically a way to let banks use their own models to determine what the risk-based risk capital requirements should be. It, it is simplest. That's basically what was going on. And our quantitative impact studies showed that the major banks, it would be a, a median reduction of 30 percent. It was a huge reduction in capital requirements. This was 2006. And so we fended it off and fended it off in both Republicans and Democrats. Uh, I was getting hammered, uh, getting a lot of political pressure. We held our grand drum. We slow walked it, and then the crisis came, and nobody was nobody was talking about that anymore. But you know, ironically, the argument they were using then is exactly the argument they're using now, which is that our stronger capital rules, and the U.S. does have stronger capital rules, hurts our international competitive position. And again, if you look at the dominant, the dominant. Um, role that U.S. banks now play in global finance, uh, it's just, it's laughable that anybody would even make that argument. I'm embarrassed for them. So again, I hope uh, they would look at the facts, and uh, and I would also hope that their constituents, uh, since some of them may be up for re-election, their constituents will ask them, what in the world are you doing? You know, you represent us, not bank lobbyists. So the other thing that, uh, that I'm... Uh, kind of worried about is this call for new bailout authority. And I'm, I'm sure you've seen Tim Geithner led a group of the G30 that came out with a big report. And, and its main conclusion was that we need more bailout authority. And then Brookings did a 10-year retrospective last week. And I was not able to attend. But reading the press events, I think that the big, big thing coming of that was government needs more bailout authority. So that really is exactly the wrong message to be sending right now. I, I think the people who are calling, I mean, it's good faith. I understand they're proud of the tools uh, that were used and the fact they were successful in stabilizing the financial system and weren't very successful in helping the broader economy. They did stabilize the financial system. But we never should have gotten to that place to begin with. That's where our priority should be, preventing it, making sure it doesn't happen again. And so for very prominent people to be out there saying, we need more bailout authority, I really wish what they would be saying is, we need to tighten regulations. We need to institute a counter-cyclical capital buffer. We need to signal to the banks to be prepared, to be resilient. We're very long in this recovery. We know a downturn is going to come in the next two years. Be prepared. The Fed itself is preparing by raising interest rates. They want some some headroom so they can lower again when the next uh, when the next downturn comes. Why aren't the banks uh, preparing as well? 
And, uh, and that's the signal they should be sending. And the other signal they should be sending is not, we need more bailout authority. They should be sending, you know what? There's something regulators now have called Title II that they didn't have prior to the crisis. And that means if you have another Lehman Brothers situation where Dick Fold had several opportunities to raise capital or sell his bank throughout the summer of 2008 and decided he didn't want to because, you know, I assume based on the press reports, he thought he was going to get a bailout. If you had Title II, I don't think that would have happened. I think he would have sold his bank for, you know, a very small amount of money, and that was fine because it probably wasn't, it wasn't worth much. It was highly leveraged, had a lot of toxic assets. But if he knew the, the alternative would be Title II, where he was going to lose his job and three years of compensation, and all of his shareholders and bond, unsecured bondholders were going to uh, probably get their investments wiped out, and his board, was, they would lose their jobs, and his top management team, I think he would have resorted to some self-help. And this is important because, you know, regulation can't accomplish everything. I know, um, ironically, I think the people who argue for more bailout authority secretly, or maybe not so secretly, are skeptical of the um, ability of regulation to stabilize the financial system. And they kind of throw up their hands and say, oh, you know, can't do it, can't do it by regulation. We're always going to need to do bailouts, and the public just needs to get used to it. I agree that regulation can't do it all. But where that takes me is, again, more market discipline with higher capital requirements, a robust and credible resolution mechanism to signal to banks and their creditors and their investors and their counterparties to pay attention to how well that bank is managed. Because if they fail, you're going to take losses. The government is not going to come in to bail you out. But if you signal to them, yeah, bailouts are the thing, you know, we did it in 2008, worked out so well, we're probably going to do it again. We may even double down, right? We want even more authority now. Um, then the signal is going to be, okay, we can just keep doing what we're doing and uh, taxpayers will come in again and everything will be fine. And that's basically what happened in 2008. And if not for everybody, there were a few that we did uh, let fail and uh, pro uh, with appropriate uh, repercussions, but mostly uh, we didn't. And that in of itself is destabilizing. So uh, I, I think this is very dangerous right now and, and sends all, all of the wrong uh, signals. You know, um, a lot of people talking, Emma, thank you for, for acknowledging this, that I was very early on on the subprime mortgage problem. So this, the, this issue goes back to 2001 and 2002 for me when I was the Assistant Secretary of Financial Institutions at Treasury, and I worked with Nick Graham. Like, we were seeing this kind of unaffordable lending, abusive lending really going on. It, right then it was targeted mainly in minority neighborhoods around Baltimore, Boston, Chicago, Ohio. There were, there were pockets where uh, minority families with home equity, I mean, they were the ones that were targeted. And actually, this idea that all this was being done to expand home ownership, it did go up by a few percentage points and, of course, fell back down to historic lows. Most of these are refis. People already had a home and a nice, safe 30-year fixed-rate mortgage. They got refinanced out into this toxic thing they didn't understand with the steep, you know, with pull all their equity out of their house, high fees, steep payment reset. And, you know, in the short term, they thought it was fine because they could pull out the cash to, you know, for a new roof or, or whatever. But uh, but longer term, it, they were uh, they were uh, eviscerating their uh, their uh, their safety net. So I, I did see that early, and uh, during two thousand six and two thousand seven, I was first to call for loan mods, and I got beat up and saying, "Oh, you're overreacting. It's not that big a deal. I can't help these deadbeat, deadbeat homeowners." I kept hearing, "Can't help deadbeat homeowners." But we were we were out there on capital too, and we were out there uh, raising deposit insurance premiums early on. I got a lot of flack about that. You know, we haven't had a bank failure in three years. Why are you raising deposit insurance premiums in 2006? So um, I'm proud of that. And that wasn't just me. That was the agency behind me raising these issues and vetting them and studying them and 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 helping inform me to make a, a principled uh, arguments uh, to my colleagues about this. But I would really have preferred they just listened as opposed to ignored me and then, you know, apologize later. And I, I so fear that this is, you know, this is what's going to happen again, that uh, there are some fairly obvious warning signs. But, you know, the group think is uh, economy is great, robust, the over 3% uh, uh, annualized growth rate, it looks like, finally seeing some real wage growth. And there are, you know, in the short term, there's some really good things, but I don't think we're looking behind at the drivers of that and dealing with the core issues of une uneven distribution of wealth and income inequality, uh, more of a real wage growth. Those are the things we need to address, not you know, helping, trying to help people sustain their, their standard of living by borrowing. 
uh, we need real wage growth and we need uh, to help um, be more focused on our middle class if we want a sustainable economy and a sustainable financial sector. So um, sorry to sound so pessimistic, but I, I do think uh, I, I am very worried now about what's going on in Washington. I know a lot of people uh, in this audience see a lot of uh, familiar faces, and I know you're fighting the good fight, and thank you for that. It's an uphill battle, uh, but uh, hopefully we keep, uh, don't, you know, don't back down. Even if you go down swinging, go down swinging, because I think it's, it's important to push and make sure even if we, they start undoing a lot of these rules that uh, we draw attention to it and, and make it painful. So anyway, thanks. I, I'd be happy to take some questions if we have time, Emma. Yep, please. Yep. Right. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. All right. And uh, the other is pension funds. Yeah. That as this uh, big population <laughs> group goes into retirement, yeah. and these pension funds have not been earning yeah. the interest right. to support themselves. Yeah. And then finally, student loans. Yeah. How can those loans be paid back? Yeah. Well, um, European banks, I think, are, are, are still struggle. I would agree with you. Um, whether they would catalyze a global crisis, I, I don't know. I think um, they have a different relationship with their government than we do, and they've been bumbling along for a long time now. So, you know, I think uh, it, I think it's a drag on economic growth in Europe, but it, it being a source of a financial crisis, I hope, you know, maybe wrong, but I, I'm not sure. Pension funds, um, you know, I worry, I do worry about pension funds uh, related to the other issue I raised was the inflation of financial assets. Right, they're underfunded now because interest rates have been so low. They've been certainly trying, they've been going, investing in riskier and riskier assets, I'm quite sure overvalued, to try to get yield. If we have a correction and there's a correlated drop in the stock and bond market, which there probably will be, I mean, that's that's going to exacerbate their problems. And so, how that you know impacts um, financial recovery? Uh, that that could definitely hit consumer spending if they have to to cut back on you know current beneficiaries or even future beneficiaries, or it could hit us fiscally if the government has to step in, which it probably would. not Same thing with student debt. That's not on bank balance sheets. It's on the government's balance sheet. But it's certainly a crisis at a human level, and uh, it will stretch our our fiscal resources, which are already stretched. So. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, and just what it's doing to families. I just, I, you know, I was a college president for a couple of years, and there's so many um, bad skewed in, in economic incentives with their student debt program. For, for one thing, they call it financial aid. I hate that. It's a loan. It, it's not financial aid. It's like they're doing your favor. Oh, here's some financial aid. Here's a loan for you. Oh, well, you have to repay it later. And, uh, and, you know, and the whole paradigm is, well, to try to help them borrow as much as they can, right? Because it's financial aid. No, it's a loan. And let's figure out, you know, and how much are they going to be making? And, you know, is that kind of just basic, you know, better financial education around the, what the kind of financial obligation they're assuming once they graduate, I think, is, is, uh, uh, is one of many, many issues I have with the program. Uh, and, I, you know, I, I hope there are good ideas out there for solving it. I hope they can come uh, come to it. But I, I don't think you can. I guess that's a fiscal problem, not so much one for the financial sector, but it's a huge problem nonetheless. Anybody else? Thank you. So um, one idea that actually I, I haven't heard. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm uh, Alexander Martone. I was a uh, class of 15 here at Georgetown. Mm -hmm. um, one idea that hasn't come up much today, you hear a lot in more political circles than sort of folks in industry and in regulation, is the idea of, of breaking up the larger, more right. complex institutions. Right, right. Um, you know, we heard talk before about how you know, people at the top are really prosecuted, and maybe that's because they seem so remote from things yeah. down chain. Is there not just too big to fail, but too big to succeed in terms of a, a, a strong compliance structure? Right. Um, you know, and perhaps that's the, sort of the flip side of, of stronger you know, capital requirements. You make the bank smaller and more manageable. Right. Is that a an idea that has a sort of serious place in, in discussion, or is that more just a sort of convenient yeah. political rallying cry? 
Well, it's a good question. I don't see the political climate now for it. I mean, I think uh, an indirect way to do that is to, to is to really ratchet up capital requirements. You know, if you had a 15% capital requirement, non-risk weighted, you would force a lot of them to downsize because they they just can't make their return on equity. They're they're too inefficient. Um, and you know, the smaller banks have much higher capital levels on a non-risk weighted basis than the larger banks. But that's because they're they're more efficient because they're you know they're the traditional. They take deposits, they make loans, they don't get into all these. Uh, other complex areas, and this idea that the diversification creates um, economies is just wrong. It, it's just the opposite. So, I don't, I don't think there's a political will to do that now. I think if there's another crisis, you know, more bailouts. Assuming our democracy survives another round of bailouts, and I think that's a question. I can only assume that, they, that it's going to go one of two directions: either they're going to be nationalized, or they're going to be broken up so they're truly or no threat to anybody. Um, and, you know, again, I hope the wiser uh, heads on Wall Street, I, I hope, realize that. And whatever government's telling them to do or not to do, they, they're responsible for their own institution. And act prudently, prepare, and make sure you're resilient and, and can handle a downturn and not, not manage your bank based on the assumption you're going to you know, get all these bailout programs again. Yeah. Sir. Uh, Sheila, the student debt has risen significantly since the start of the financial crisis. Right. Has it become a systemic risk? Yeah, so I think it's uh, no, I, not for the banking system now because it's not on, it's not banks don't have exposure to it. It's it's on the government's balance sheet. So uh, I, I do think it's it's a source of stress for young people. I think it's a and it's a source of stress for the economy because it, again, it diverts the, the, all the money that those folks are paying back on their student loans. They're not going out to eat. They're not buying a car. You know, the trade-offs. There's only so much uh, discretionary in, in, income you have. And if you're taking a big chunk to pay off a loan, uh, that, that hurts the economy too. So um, I don't, I think it's bad. I don't think, but I know it's not systemic risk for the financial system. Yeah. Hi, uh, Frank Pasquale. And uh -huh. it's an honor to get to I'm a big fan. Um, I just was wondering, in terms of thinking about what the sustainable debt level is for contemporary economies, we know there was the whole controversy over Reinhardt and Rogoff and you know their findings, or lack of finding, I guess, about a 100% uh, yeah. debt to GDP ratio. Right. We see that Japan seems to be able to keep going, even though it's right. significantly higher than that. Right. And I'm wondering if maybe the solution to some of these problems is to ensure that, uh, better ensure and to unite the fiscal and monetary perspective such that the monetary system tries to ensure that uh, more lending is going towards things that um, improve the overall ability of the real economy to support right. the debt. Right. And I'm wondering if that, yeah. that has any place in modern monetary policy. Well, I think it is certainly, uh, I guess I would look at fiscal policy. Like I've always been a big advocate for infrastructure spending and why we didn't do more and why we're still not doing it. I don't get because infrastructure. Look, we've got a, a the global environment is going to be increasingly competitive, and we just need to get used to that. And we can lash out and point our fingers at other countries and say they're evil and they're ripping us off and all that. And I don't, you know, there's some legitimate trade issues that are being dealt with, but we need to look at our internally at what. What can we do to make ourselves more competitive? Infrastructures, there's a lot of frictions in, in our infrastructure is, is very bad in uh, in many areas. And, uh, you know, our education system, too, we spend a lot of money on it. And But whether we're meeting the needs of, of uh, young people who are entering the workforce and are meeting our nation's labor needs, I think that's really up, up for discussion. So, yeah, better attention to how our, the money the government is spending. Are we getting a return on that investment? I think that would... Uh, that would be good, and that's something that democratically elected uh, people should should have some some sense of. In terms of fiscal, uh, you know, monetary policy, I don't know. Then you get into government directed lending, and um, it's uh, you can argue it both ways. I mean, we we got into a little bit with quantitative easing, right? So they pick mortgage bonds to invest in. So that you know, some people didn't like that, created distortions. I think it'd almost be better if you're going to use monetary policy to just, you know, buy the government debt, but let the the political, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, apparatus decide the appropriate use of, of you know, was infrastructure or whatever. Um, because I don't know, you know, uh, government directed lending is not doesn't have a good <laughs> doesn't have a good history, and it sounds great, and we all know where we would put it, and we would hopefully make some good decisions, but. Unfortunately, that it hasn't always worked out with with countries that have experimented. 
You know, I think with Japan, too, be careful with that. Because what I worry about with the U.S. is that we're so reliant on foreign investors to buy our debt. In Japan, it, it does not. You, think, you know, it's, it's mostly, it's in, I haven't checked the numbers recently, but traditionally, it's, you know, most, most of their debt is held by their people in their country. So um, we are heavily reliant on foreign investors and somewhat at the mercy of their continued willingness to buy our debt. So I do think, I know there's a lot of rhetoric now, well, it doesn't really matter. And if we can borrow the money, why not? Right, so that's a seductive uh, that's a seductive argument. But the thing with debt, you become reliant on it. Eventually, you got to pay it back or refinance it. So, right now, people may be willing to lend us money, but a year, five years, ten years from now, we need to refinance a lot of debt, or they're going to still be lending us money. But we're we're still relying on it. It's cooked into our budget. So I, I do think that there needs to be some pushback on this this idea that that to, you know the government so long as people will lend to us so we can borrow indefinitely it just it doesn't work like that and i think it's really playing by fire and we've got away with it for a long time and uh, but i you know I, I i do worry about it i think i think we need to to uh, be a little more fiscally responsible i'm in that camp Hi, Sheila. Hi. Um, my name is Veronica, and I'm a 2L here at Georgetown. Good. And I was wondering if you thought that requiring the banks to do these resolution plans has been helpful with the FDIC really rely on them and yeah. use them if it came about. And should something similar be required for non-banks, since yeah. you said that they're yeah. a major concern now? Yeah, that's a really good question. So first, yes, I do think these uh, these living room plans have been helpful. We, you know, we when we were trying to tackle this during the crisis, and I joked about this in her book. And by the way, I, I think Citigroup is a, is a much better run institution now, but they were clearly having their problems during the crisis, and so we were looking at different options on how to resolve them. And uh, we joked we couldn't even find the bank. We, we didn't know. <laughs> you know the, the bank was basically a place to book assets. There was, there was no bank. And um, so what? one of the many good things uh, the Title I planning process has done is to force these guys to think their legal structure and define their legal structure and let us know where, where assets are, where risks are, where exposures are, and who the counterparties are. So if you, need, if you get in a situation where you need to break them up, uh, you, you know, you have a severable uh, operation versus before we kind of just had one big blob. We weren't quite sure what to, to deal with. And yeah, I think it's a great idea to have it for non-banks, but they don't. That, that that was the idea of Title I designations to get them to do resolution planning, or one of the when you know one of the benefits of it. And this administration just doesn't seem inclined uh, to use Title I designations. So the tool is there, but it's not being used. Yeah, but you know, like BlackRock, for instance, right? Not that I think BlackRock's getting in trouble. What happened? You know, <laughs> who knows what's in there? <laughs> Anything else? Okay, great. Thanks very much. Okay, we'll take a break, and our next panel starts at 2.45, Innovation and Risk. the rude train conductor, here I am. We are at the point for the next part of our program. One of the joys of conducting something like this, I think Sheila and I, like I said, she's the unindicted co-conspirator with me to uh, arrange this conference, but one of the joys of this is you get to get deep into conversation with George Akerloff and uh, dispute with him whether there was enough information to value AIG. And we did agree on one thing, that that lawsuit that AIG brought against the government for takings was the essence of chutzpah. You know, you go bankrupt, you cannot get loans anywhere else and you get loans from the government and then you sue the government because they took your shares. I weep for you. Okay, so that was one of the joys that I was able to have was standing there t talking to our very own, I know you're really Berkeley, but you're on loan to Georgetown, our very own Nobel Prize winner in economics. Uh, so that 
kind of conversation. I know all of you are having those wonderful conversations. Okay, so we're at the point where we're going to talk about innovation and risk, and I'm just going to turn it over to our associate dean, uh, Jim Beinerman, to tell you about the panel, what it's about, and uh, everyone who's on that panel uh, should just come on up, and Jim's in charge. Thanks, Emma, and uh, I'm very glad to uh, be here today and to, to join this uh, distinguished gathering that has uh, so much talent brought together to deal with, uh, obviously, what's a, a still very important topic and something that created the recent modern financial landscape uh, because of uh, what happened uh, 10 years ago uh, this month. Um, we have on our panel today uh, three distinguished speakers, each one of whom uh, has had a, a key role uh, in both dealing with and uh, writing about uh, what's happened uh, both in the financial crisis in some cases and uh, definitely in dealing with the aftermath. Uh, and I'll just introduce them in the order that they're sitting here uh, on the dais uh, with me. So uh, first, Michael Greenberger, uh, who is a, a distinguished professor uh, at the uh, University of Maryland Francis King Carey School of Law. Um, and he, uh, aside from being the founder and director of their Center for uh, Health and Homeland Security uh, is also uh, a professor who's worked and, and taught a lot in the area of uh, financial law and financial services. Um, he's had a distinguished career um, before coming to the University of Maryland, uh, both working in the, the government, uh, where he was uh, the director of uh, trading and marketing in the Commodities Futures Trading Corporation, uh, and uh, shares uh, time in that. Uh, August Institution with our next panelist, uh, Gary Gensler. Uh, but uh, he also was a, a partner in the law firm of Shane Gardner. Uh, and he's had a, a, a great deal of experience um, working on the uh, issues over the last uh, several decades, actually, that have shaped uh, the nature of modern finance uh, and also with the regulatory uh, bodies that carry on the work here in Washington, D.C. Um, our next panelist, uh, Gary Gensler, uh, is now at MIT, uh, but uh, he has also had a distinguished career, including uh, his work as the chair of the, uh, the CFTC uh, in the Obama administration. Uh, and uh, his, uh, his, his resume is, uh, is equally long, but I would just uh, highlight a couple of things that I think are, are worth mentioning, um, uh, aside from his uh, Obama administration work. Uh, first of all, um, He's uh, previously been the senior advisor to uh, pr Senator Paul Sarbanes in writing the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, which is probably the key financial legislation of the last uh, two decades. He was Undersecretary of the Treasury for Domestic Finance uh, and also Assistant Secretary of the Treasury. And uh, in recognition of his service, he received the Treasury's uh, highest award, the Alexander Hamilton Award. Um, he's uh, obviously uh, worked uh, in political campaigns, including most recently as a CFO for uh, Hillary Clinton's bid for the presidency in 2016. Uh, he's the author of a number of books, uh, and uh, he's also uh, been, prior to his many years in public service, uh, at Goldman Sachs, where he was a partner in the mergers and acquisitions department. Uh, and finally, uh, Frank Pasquale, who is uh, a colleague of Mike Greenberger's at University of Maryland Francis King Carey School of Law, um, is an expert on uh, many things, uh, including finance, but also the law of artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, and algorithms. Um, and he's in another field, one of the most cited scholars in the country in health law. Uh, but he's here today to talk about uh, things that he worked on in his book, The Black Box Society, uh, which are uh, the secret algorithms that control money and information. This book was published uh, several years ago by Harvard University Press, um, and it develops a social theory of reputation, search, and finance, uh, and tries to uh, offer suggestions for improving the uh, information economy. Uh, it's been uh, it, it reviewed uh, very highly in the most distinguished journals of uh, science and economics, including the journals Science and Nature, uh, and it's been published in translation in Chinese, French, Korean, and Serbian. 
Uh, he's also had uh, time in government service, uh, working for the House Judiciary Committee uh, of Energy and Commerce, uh, and uh, also on the Senate Banking Committee in the FTC, and in the Directorates General of the European Commission. He's also advised uh, officials in Canada and the United Kingdom on law and technology policy. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to let our panelists speak. Uh, and I know each of them uh, is going to make a presentation of uh, 10 to 12 minutes, and then I hope to have some discussion with the audience that's here. Michael, you're sitting there, Michael. Uh, Michael, Michael Greenberger is going to go first. Okay. <laughs> I usually like to go last because I get canceled. Um, well, thank you very much, and uh, hello to everybody, and congratulations on this excellent conference. Um, uh, several things have been said already that lead me to want to rewrite my paper, uh, which is already very long. I put up for my slides, my paper is quite long. Uh, I'll try and summarize it in the time allotted. Uh, the paper, I, and I have handouts for this if you want to take it with you. The paper is in these links, and we have bullet points and blogs, and we've had, actually it was uh, shown out for the first time on June 19th by the Institute for New Economic Thinking. Uh, Paul Volker was on uh, the panel, and we have the video of that, and I have a video of a terrific interview. I wasn't so terrific, but Rob was the guy who interviewed me. He was terrific. And, some, and a lot of media about the piece. So if I confuse you a lot, please use some of these uh, uh, cliff notes uh, to give you some help. The panel is innovation and risk. I'm not quite sure. I know that these two, Gary and Frank, are going to talk about innovation. But I don't know why I'm on here except to say maybe the innovation here is the most clever exception created by four big banks from the uh, swaps regulation under Dodd-Frank. 90% of the swaps market, when properly calculated, is conducted, the trading is conducted by uh, four very big banks, Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, uh, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, and uh, did I say Goldman? Uh, there's one I've left out. I forget which one I uh, left, left out, but four of the big banks. Um, Gary Gensler, let me just say from the beginning, was President Obama's chair of the CFTC. And uh, I would never tell him this to his face, but uh, from my view, he was the most successful progressive regulator that was appointed by President Obama in his capacity as chairing the CFTC. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit why. Uh, you. Uh, <laughs> um, hopefully you've either read or seen the movie The Big Short. And it's, it's a wonderful book. I teach a course in derivatives and swaps, and I start out by having the students read uh, the book, whether they've seen the movie or not. And it's such a funny, engaging book that the main thesis that I think is important gets lost and isn't contextualized. And the thesis there was where there was these very bright, investors working separately all over the country who saw the mortgage market about to fail and said, how can I short that market? How can I get money as a result of the failure of that market? I certainly don't want to be giving loans uh, out because I'm worried those loans will never be paid back. Now, how do I, knowing in 2005 and 2006, that there are going to be massive defaults in that market, how do I take advantage of it? And if you've seen the movie, you've read the book, uh, these investors separately, some of them from big institutions, some of them from smaller hedge funds, decided to use an instrument that, and, and in this area, the names given to financial instruments are mind-boggling with a purpose because if you really understood what they were, you'd say, why aren't they regulated? Uh, what they decided they wanted to do was to ensure against the failure of mortgages that they did not own. They, in other words, if somebody defaulted on a mortgage that they had decided they wanted to bet on as being a failure, they would get the full value of the mortgage. Uh, that 
in the terms it's called a naked credit default swap. Really, it's insurance. No one ever wanted to call these things insurance because insurance is regulated by the states. And uh, an interesting scenario happened after Dodd-Frank was uh, being uh, developed was the state insurance administrators came in and said, hey, wait a minute, this is all insurance. We should have jurisdiction over that, which immediately led to the preemption of state insurance regulation. At the same time, uh, the gambling association came in and said, you're betting on the failure of these mortgages, that's gambling, and they preempted state ga gaming laws as well. So uh, these investors, uh, uh, Paulson, not Hank Paulson, but another hedge fund investor, made $3 trillion in 2007, betting that these mortgages would fail. In fact, I was meant talking to somebody uh, earlier about the fact in 2009 or 2010, there were 60 Senate Democrats. Your mortgage, your default on your mortgage can't be put into bankruptcy. Uh, the, the Democrats decided we're going to help these homeowners by putting mortgages into bankruptcy so you can work your way out of it. Uh, the uh, Democratic leadership went into the caucus thinking they had 60 votes. When they walked out, they had 40 votes. They weren't going to get it passed with any Republicans. And Senator Durbin, who was the minor, majority whip at the time, said, quote, the banks own this place. Why did the banks not want that people put their mortgages into default because if you were betting that it would be defaulted and you could work your way out of default, you lost that bet. They didn't want to lose those bets. Now, the fact of the matter is, the funny part of the big short is, as these investors got closer and closer to the meltdown, they started saying to themselves, oh my God, the casino may go bankrupt too. Uh, the casino being especially big Wall Street banks. They're on the other side of my bets. Why were they on the other side? Because they thought housing prices were always going to go up. And the idea that there would be defaults on mortgages was naive and silly, but it happened. So the big short people sold their investments before the meltdown, thinking that the AIG or some of the other banks would never be able to pay off the bet. What they didn't understand was that you paid off the bets. The bank bailouts, US taxpayer dollars, uh, some calculated, uh, I don't know if Dennis is still here, but uh, America, uh, Better Markets, uh, some of the progressive se Democratic senators said, there was $20 trillion in bailouts. The irony, of course, is those banks who got bailed out are in bigger and better shape than they ever were. And we, for the most part, are not. Uh, now, Dodd-Frank, its number one purpose, number one goal was to prevent future bailouts. It was signed into law in 20, July of 2010. Uh, there was a recognition, uh, and I have 50 citations for this, including uh, the Financial Inquiry Commission, that these naked credit default swaps that were not capitalized, not transparent, were a major reason for the market failing. And just to carry that through, uh, the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission said there were some mortgages that were bet on nine times. You're betting through vehicles called collateralized debt obligations. But nine times that they would fail. There were no limits to the bets you placed on failure. My theory is if we had just had defaults in mortgages and not these multi-trillion dollar side bets, that we would have not, we'd have had a financial crisis, but not of the kind that we ended up having. Dodd-Frank passes, people criticize Dodd-Frank, but my view is one of the good things Dodd-Frank said, said was, these naked credit default swaps, and they're all kinds of swaps, interest rate swaps, currency swaps, energy swaps, these swaps cannot be private bilateral agreements. They must, for the most part, be traded on exchange, so we see what their value is. The people dealing in this business must have capital set aside for the day that the debts become bad. And this is sort of a complicated point so aren't, people aren't familiar with these markets. The swaps, for the most part, have to be cleared, which means if AIG 
is entering into one of these swaps, they have to go through a clearing facility that promises AIG or its counterparty will make good when D-Day comes. And the way that happens, if AIG starts losing money, the clearing facility goes back and asks for margin. Uh, AIG went on for years losing money over this. Not only did the public not know about it, but the whole AIG holding company didn't know about it. So the clearing facility would be a corrective action. And Gary was chairman of the CFTC through all this. Not only was he instrumental in some of the very good provisions that came out of Dodd-Frank, but under his leadership, the CFTC promulgated about 60 rules to implement Dodd-Frank which has been called by people heroic, uh, and I, I agree with that. The last thing the CFTC did, and they had to wait till they had the rules, was a question, what happens if you trade the swap outside the United States? Are you regulated by Dodd-Frank or not? There was a provision in Dodd-Frank, and I think Gary had something to do, or his staff, writing it, which said, if you trade a swap anywhere in the world and that kind of swap could cause economic chaos in the United States, Dodd-Frank applies. Uh, on July 13th, uh, 20, I don't know what day in July, but 2013, the CFTC issues a, a guidance on how that extraterritorial provision would apply. It was lengthy, 80 pages in the Federal Register, 662 footnotes. 563, footnote 563 said, if the foreign, if the a subsidiary of a bank is in another country and it's guaranteed by the bank holding company, that subsidiary and the trading will be covered by Dodd-Frank. Now that's an interesting point because at that point in time, every foreign subsidiary a trading in swaps under the standard template of swaps was guaranteed. Uh, that comes out July 13th. August 14th, the Association of Swap Stealers, under cover of darkness, writes a letter to its members and says, de-guarantee your subsidiaries. That way you'll be out from under Dodd-Frank. And so, not publicly, they don't tell the CFTC, people start rewriting the templates to de-guarantee subsidiaries. And then they start moving swaps trading from United States affiliated institutions to the de-guaranteed foreign subsidiary claiming, voila, we're out from under Dodd-Frank. Now there's a lot of reporting that's been done on this. Some reporters have said as many as 95% of certain lines of swaps are being traded through de-guaranteed foreign subsidiaries. That means a lot of this stuff is being moved out from under Dodd-Frank. Now, there was a big New York Times article done about my paper, and the banks came in and said, oh, you know, this is, this is making a big deal. Not 95%, 5% are being traded outside of Dodd-Frank. Well, even at 5%, you must remember the swaps market is a $600 trillion market. So even if it's true that 5% is out, and I doubt that seriously, I doubt that seriously. You're still talking about $30 trillion in potential defaults and failures. If it's not under Dodd-Frank and say it's in London or Germany, the answer is, well, you know, you got the European Union. If, if Dodd-Frank doesn't apply, the European Union will apply. Well, many things have been said today about the status of financial institutions in the European Union. And uh, if the number one protection here was to save the American taxpayer from paying trillions of dollars in another bailout to banks, I can tell you right now the United Kingdom isn't going to make that bailout. The European Union country is going to make that bailout. When, when Mr. Geithner, who wants to get this stronger bailout provision, when somebody like him or in his place wants to do a bailout, the taxpayer is going to have to do that bailout. Now, the, the two final things. The Obama administration in October of 2016 recognized this problem, proposed a rule, and said, this de-guarantee stuff is absurd. We're not looking at whether it's guaranteed or de-guaranteed. 
is the subsidiary on the financial books of the holding company. And those of you who know rulemaking know you can propose something in October. It's going to take a long time satisfying the APA to, to make a final decision on that. And sure enough, Trump gets elected president. And there is absolutely no interest in doing away with this loophole. In fact, I could go into this. The new chair has some new theories that would, in its own way, make the new loophole worse. So you have huge amounts of money now that were thought to be under Dodd-Frank that are not under Dodd-Frank. Uh, my paper ends by saying Trump isn't going to solve this problem. The Republican Congress isn't going to solve this problem. And my hope is state attorneys general have a parents patriot right of action to go into federal court to support Dodd-Frank. And I think, given the statute I've described to you, if your swap could destabilize the American economy, it's covered by Dodd-Frank no matter where it's transacted, I think that's a pretty strong case, except for the fact I thought that the nature and makeup of the Supreme Court, when I published this thing in June, would lead to the fact that state attorney generals could be successful. I'm not so sure of that now. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for uh, uh, including me in your remarks. Should I take your computer down, or do you want me? Take what? Do you want that? Yeah, still? no, you take it down. I don't know. By the way, I have paper handouts of that if anybody is interested. Um, uh, I want to thank Georgetown uh, Law for inviting me here to speak today uh, on this panel. Uh, my notes are on this little card. Ted Newton, <laughs> thank you for giving me your card. That's not my notes. Um, all right. So uh, the, the panel that we're here to talk about uh, is innovation and risk. And um, so I start with just thinking about finance. I now teach at MIT. I have the honor of uh, be, be teaching there. But I started, as uh, the introduction said, at Goldman Sachs. And then I worked in the Clinton administration and the Obama administration and with Paul Sarbanes. So I've been around finance my whole life. I think if finance is doing uh, really two things, moving money, and secondly, moving risk through uh, the 7 billion people that live on this world. It's no longer just the 320 million here. So in essence, it's moving money and risk through a distributed network, 7 billion people. Now, money itself is just a social construct or a social consensus and, consensus, and there's, there are many wonderful books written about it, many great debates about whether it's uh, uh, what it means, but it t plays three roles. A medium of exchange, meaning that you can use it to in, in, in commerce. A unit of account that in commercial settings somebody says it's worth this. And then if you have extra, and that only really started uh, for the general population um, probably as we came out of the dark ages, um, it's a store of value. Uh, earlier, it might have been a store of value for sovereigns and nobility, but for, for more broadly. Well, the other thing about finance that goes to the core of innovation and risk is since its beginning thousands of years ago, it's had a symbiotic relationship with technology. It, it has. I mean, even if you go back thousands of years, it's thought that the first written uh, things were numbers, not words. And the cuneiform tablets that you find are about uh, uh, numbers and accounts and ledgers. Double entry bookkeeping is a technology that was done 800 to 1,000 years ago and, and helped us get out of the dark ages. My point of this little bit of history is where we are now is finance and technology uh, have sort of accelerated quite a bit. We absolutely live in a digital age today. And that digital age is that 90 plus percent, probably 99 percent of commerce in, in developed countries is done electronically. And we move money, this social construct, around electronically. So where is innovation and risk today? Uh, you've heard the word fintech or financial technology. It's usually meant to be about 
uh, disruptors, companies trying to take on the, the big banks, uh, whether it was PayPal in the 1990s or Robinhood, which is, uh, I don't know if anybody in the room, uh, probably the students might use. Does anybody use Robinhood, by the way? There we go. Three. Three. And then there are others in the room saying, I wonder what he's talking about. <laughs> Um, but they have 5 million users now, and it's an app that's only about four years old, and it allows you to buy and sell securities in the stock market for free. It's an interesting business model. Oh, now I see somebody's going to download Robinhood, huh? Huh? There you go. There you go. Um, we can talk offline later as to how they make money. Um, but financial technology of disruptors are real, and it's around artificial intelligence, it's around machine learning, it's around chatbots, my favorite, you know, when you think you might be speaking to somebody, it's just a chatbot on the other side. Um, biometrics, just in terms of identity and how, how things are, are done, something called open API. I could go on, but the one thing I'm going to chat about in my three remaining minutes is blockchain. I teach a course now at MIT called Blockchain and Money. It's kind of a popular course. We just stood it up, and there's about 100 students in there, wonderful graduate students from across the Cambridge community. We've got some folks from Harvard and elsewhere coming in, too, because they want to learn about this new technology. It's not the leading thing that the major banks are thinking about in terms of their fintech policy. Artificial intelligence and machine learning and chatbots and so forth are, are higher up their list. Of blockchain. But blockchain was a, a remarkable innovation that came together really over 20 years. You may have heard about some uh, paper that was written 10 years ago by Satoshi Nakamoto. Has anybody heard that name? All right. Does anybody know who Satoshi is? <laughs> oh, you, you do? Because you shouldn't be at this conference if you do. Nobody knows who Satoshi Nakamoto is, but it's important to note it was, the paper was released on October 31st, 2008. Now, I'm fairly certain that Sheila Bear and her role as chair of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation was not thinking about Satoshi Nakamoto on October 31st, 2008, and probably didn't even think about Satoshi Nakamoto for some number of months later. But right in the heart and the crisis, Halloween of 2008, this paper is put out on, on a, a cryptographic mailing list of a bunch of people that call themselves cypherpunks. Uh, I don't make this up. It's a great story. But from a libertarian point of view, the question was, how do we move value on the internet the way we move information on the internet? The internet has no central authority. I will say that again. The internet has no central authority. If you send an email now, or if you were looking at that Robin Hood app, the packets of information move around, and there's no central authority. No government can stop. I mean, the Chinese government and other governments try to partition the internet, but there's no central authority. Well, that, that was the riddle. How do we do that with money, a new technology? Can we do it with money? And Satoshi Nakamoto came up with something that, that does that without a central authority. So what are the issues that it raises? What are the risks that it raises? Ten years on, there's no broad adoption yet of blockchain technology. But I do think it could be a catalyst for change in the financial sector. It's a new way to keep ledgers, ledgers, that multiple thousands of year innovation, that technology. It's a new way to keep ledgers. It's a new way to move value on the internet and to, with something called smart contracts, which was a 19-year-old Vitalik Buterin's innovation, uh, a remarkable technologist, but to move computer code and execute computer code on the internet. So if you just keep that core there, it kind of goes to the core of finance. Finance is moving money and risk amongst a distributed network, 7 billion people. Blockchain technology can move data, which can be money, or computer code, which can kind of be risk, through a distributed network, the internet. And that's why the two I think overlap. There's a bunch of big public policy issues which we can get into in a Q&A. Um, it's largely an, uh, a, a field right now that though compared to the world capital markets is small. It's about 200 billion to 300 billion dollars in size on any given day and it bounces around a lot. The worldwide equity markets are 90 trillion. The worldwide debt and bond markets are closer to 250 
trillion, trillion. I got to get my T's and B's right. So at a quarter of a trillion dollars, this is not yet at this stage kind of something that's going to be a systemic issue. But it could be. It could grow. The real public policy issues around right now are around illicit activity, that no government wants to shrink their tax base and have a bunch of activity kind of going outside of the tax base of that country. And most countries, not all, most countries don't want to promote drug running or money laundering or child trafficking and the likes that you can do maybe in a, in a, in a pseudonymous Bitcoin uh, environment. Um, so illicit activity is something that everybody's grappling with, and then investor protection. And this is where most countries uh, haven't yet sort of gotten their hands fully around it. Jay Clayton at the SEC and Chris Giancarlo at the CFTC and those, those remarkable uh, dedicated public servants are trying to get their hands around it. Uh, but it's going to take some time. This is not going to all happen in a few months. It might take a few years. Um, but in essence, to bring the same sort of logic of making sure that the public is protected when they're investing, if there's an issuer, and there's a debate about when there's an issuer, but if there's an issuer that uh, they have some additional uh, disclosure and marketing requirements. So I'm going to leave it at that, but I think that the financial sector has always been symbiotic with finance and technology go together. Frank's going to tell you some of the risks. I'm going to largely agree with them. The risk of artificial intelligence, of biases in the code, the biases in the machine learning. So there are risks in blockchain. There are risks in artificial intelligence. There's risk in even chatbots and biometrics. But I also believe there's great benefit. And that's just the nature of uh, finance today is that it's electronic. And it's almost like most CEOs of banks should have a bunch of technologists in the C-suite these days. Uh, Frank. Thanks. Well, thank you. And it's just a real honor to be on this panel with um, uh, folks that have, I've read about doing uh, fantastic things to try to make the uh, financial sector more stable. And today's talk, um, I was thinking there's a lot of points of uh, attack I'd like to make, but uh, I have written on blockchain and I have a piece out on SSRM called A Rule of Persons, Not Machines, where I offer some critiques of some applications, but some hope for uh, positive regulation. I have talked uh, in my testimony for the Senate Banking Committee last year about the risks of big data-driven underwriting and artificial intelligence in some areas. But today, um, at the invitation of Emma, I wanted to focus particularly on looking back on the Black Box book, the Black Box Society that I published in 2015. And my spin on it is going to be that part of my book has become, I think, obsolete or outdated in the past three years. And as an author, that feels bad. But it's important to take an accounting of it and to describe how it happened, I think. So we, as um, people who are interested in policy, as academics, can think about the future and think about what will the future of uh, financial regulation and policy look like. So just to give a very brief overview of the book, in chapter four I talked about some problems that I saw in the financial sector, focusing particularly on information asymmetries. And that's sort of the black box problem that a lot of people didn't understand the degree of interconnection and the degree of risk that was involved in sophisticated financial instruments. In chapter five of the book, I looked at particular technocratic innovations within Dodd-Frank that would empower things like the Financial Stability Oversight Council, the Office of Financial Research, other entities to better understand what was going on. And that was the result of you know, a lot of reading, talking to people in different financial agencies, uh, talking to folks overseas, et cetera. But then in chapter six, I said, you know, that regulatory infrastructure, particularly the degree to which uh, it's able to keep track of you know, what's going on in an increasingly complex financial system, is quite fragile. And we might need to move beyond it. Right? And I'm reminded of a very interesting uh, article by Henry Hu called Too Complex to Depict. And the argument of that uh, article, I think, is that some aspects of contemporary finance are so complicated that we really can't represent them. And that's a fundamental challenge to a financial regulatory regime, going, which, you know, going all the way back to the debates during the New Deal, was really focused more on disclosure and a disclosure model than on a more substantive vision of what 
the government should do to either nudge or direct finance in certain areas. One thing I said in the book and that I followed up in a 2015 article on high frequency trading, uh, which was uh, recently critiqued by SEC Commissioner Pierce, um, was that to really maintain this regulatory apparatus in the midst of increasing complexity, we would need three things. First, a broad bipartisan consensus on the value of regulatory entities. Second, um, good funding for those agencies to make sure that they could actually understand and monitor what was going on. And third, um, real consequences for violations, things that wouldn't be a slap on the wrist or merely be held on, uh, passed on to shareholders, but things that would really matter to decision makers involved. And the realization that I'm having, um, you know, especially given work like Jesse Eisinger's, um, others, some of the uh, points that were made by Dennis Kelleher today, is that none of these really hold right now. Um, when I think, you know, of rulemaking processes where one of 70 or one of 80 people is representing the public interest, hard to see that as legitimate. When I think about, you know, some of the ways in which uh, big law in Washington and D.C., Washington, D.C. and New York has almost become too good to the point where when a large financial client comes to them, it's like the focus is not necessarily on having a fair fight over an existing regulatory regime, but to gut it altogether. I think clearly that's the stakes of the Kavanaugh uh, uh, nomination. There's going to be a lot of effort to simply gut and get rid of entities like the lawsuit to just destroy the CFPB. When that's out there, and when, when big law sort of sees its role not as just sort of helping clients win particular disputes, but sort of destroying and undermining agencies altogether, uh, Haley Sweetland, uh, Edwards' article on the CFTC uh, with respect to a swaps position rule is also really good on this. Um, and when the consequences seem so rare or so fleeting or so small, that the deterrent effect is questionable, then the overall apparatus of technocratic financial regulation based on a disclosure model, it starts to crumble. It starts, and, and when there isn't a sort of an agreement on its value. So where do we go from here? Well, I'll preface what I'm going to say, which I know will probably sound a bit radical to some in the room, by saying that even if you disagree with what I'm saying, you should probably be glad that I'm in the room. Because if the debate is always between centrists that are trying to maintain the technocratic status quo and libertarians who want to get rid of it altogether, there will be an inexorable movement of financial regulation toward deregulation, toward less of it. We need to have a counterweight on the other edge of the table. And fortunately, I think a lot of people are providing that counterweight today. I think that particularly considering the work of, uh, on methodological pluralism, that's a first step. Right? When we can bring in economic sociology, when we can bring in people beyond the usual suspects within financial economics, et cetera, and extend some credibility and credentials to individuals beyond the usual folks, that's important. We've made some initial moves toward behavioral economics and the works of Robert Schiller. That's great. And you know, some other sort of insights from that group. But we need to get even more methodologically pluralistic. We need voices talking about inequality. And I think here, uh, Professor Coleman Jordan's work uh, in the Journal of Law and Public Affairs last year on the Fed and inequality is foundational, particularly both in terms of the substance of bringing inequality in and also in terms of the methodology, in terms of bringing in diverse methodologies. At this very moment, there's a conference on modern monetary theory going on in New York City. And some of my friends at that conference, people like Raul Carrillo and Rowan Gray, have been advocating for a federal jobs guarantee. And it's very interesting to think about what might have been the political fallout of the financial crisis of 2008 if instead of, quote, unquote, foaming the runway for the banks with respect to certain forms of highly complex mortgage relief, such as what HAMP administered, there had also been further effort put into something like a modern-day Civilian Conservation Corps, WPA, or other things like that. And I know that I will get criticized for uh, confusing, say, monetary and fiscal policy with such uh, proposals. But I think the people who do the job guarantee and people like Sandy Darity and Derek Hamilton, who've really theorized this, have pointed out the ways in which certain decision making that is in some ways trying to be characterized as purely procedural or done according to purely financial metrics does encode political values and will continue to do so. And that we have to be able to push certain political values that maybe are undervalued right now in order to make up for systematic biases within the financial system. I think, moreover, that my work with the Association for the Promotion of Political Economy and Law, it's at politicaleconomylaw.org if anyone's uh, interested in, in joining us with some of the folks in finance in that field, has taught me that if we can expand this conversation, I think we can do a lot more 
to promote financial inclusion. And I think also, for example, the work of Marisa Baradaran in thinking about the unbanked. There's a lot of energy in perhaps saying that computer technology will expand and will uh, bring in the unbanked. And I know when I testified before the Senate Bank Finance Committee, Tom Cotton really believed in that point of view and was pushing it. But what Baradaran says is that we've also got to be able to learn from other countries and maybe have postal banking, right, to include and to bring in people who are unbanked. And I think that that's the type of creative idea that we've got to be able to experiment with and, and understand. And I'll close with a few sort of potential objections. One is, you know, again, if people think it's just, it's not uh, monetary, it's fiscal, but, you know, 10 years ago I was writing a lot about Google and I was and about the potential monopoly problems there. And virtually every member of the antitrust establishment I talked to said, you're not talking about antitrust, you just want to regulate Google. 10 years on, Google antitrust is one of the biggest policy issues around the world, and in fact in the United States itself, and the whole Open Markets Institute is working on it. Um, I also think looking at the work of Mariana Mazzucato and her success in influencing European policymakers, that there's a lot of room here. So I would just urge everyone in terms of thinking about the future of finance policy to think big to think about breaking down some of the traditional barriers between monetary and fiscal policies, and to consider that we've got to have, I think, more diverse voices at the table, more diverse personnel. As Professor Coleman Jordan once noted, um, in years and years of Fed, Federal Reserve minutes, the concept of racial discrimination was not mentioned once, right? That's a really damning problem, I think, with finance regulators. So if we, but we've got to open it up, and when we do open it up to more diverse perspectives, more diverse methodologies, I think we can do more to move beyond the current paradigm. Thank you. Now, I believe there is some time for questions, although we are running a little bit behind schedule. So I'd like to invite people who have a question to come up to uh, one of the mics. And uh, if you have a question addressed to a particular member of the panel, uh, please identify him. Uh, I'm, I'm curious if any of you have uh, given thought to a central bank issued digital currency and whether you, whether that could work, how it could work, and whether that would uh, promote financial inclusion. Um, do you, oh, no, I, I'm sorry. So the, the, the question is, is whether uh, we have a point of view on central bank digital currency and would it promote financial inclusion? Um, right now, uh, by World Bank statistics, 1.7 billion people around the globe are unbanked. What's interesting when you sort of peer into the statistics in Africa, for instance, that half the adult population is unbanked, but half of that half has mobile phones. Mm. It, it's, it's a remarkable thing. So unbanked, but not necessarily without mobile te telephony. So um, uh, in some countries like Kenya, what took off is a f means of payment mechanism is a uh, started on mobile phones in 2004, and it's grown now. There's 20 million customers using something called M-Pesa in uh, Kenya, which is basically a means of meth, meth and payment on a telephone. Now, how does this relate to central bank digital currencies? Uh, it does. <laughs> it's basically to say there might be new means that are not sort of doesn't feel like the traditional banking structure, where you have the central bank in the middle and the commercial banks, as we do in the US, about 9,000 commercial banks have digital reserves. So we already have central bank digital currency. It's just only allowed that 9,000 banks can tap into it. The question, the policy question for central banks around the world is do they open that up to either broader wholesale merchants or the retail public? The country that's closer to it, closest to it is uh, Sweden and their e-krona project. Uh, there's some West African countries that have dabbled, but they've really had the commercial banks issue it, so they keep it within the commercial bank structure. Um, but I think, uh, to uh, Sheila's question, I think one country will do it. I don't know that in, an, in a Sweden that it's going to broaden inclusion. I do think, though, in these West African countries, Senegal is one of them, that it's not technically a central bank digital currency because they had a commercial bank issue it. And so it's almost like a private banknote of the 19th century, in, in a sense. But, but, but it's a digitized bank deposit, but it's on 
a blockchain. Um, I think that this can promote inclusion, um, but it's not quite to your question. Um, in the developed countries, I think it's less about inclusion and more about sort of competition. I was wondering, Gary, uh, had you thought about the implications of blockchain for financial stability? Uh, the distributed ledger technology is important, uh, but it's also a place where there's a hybrid opportunity for the illicit activity, the quasi-illicit activity, and all of the others. Uh, and innovation that is uh, meaningless in the sense that it doesn't add value to the real economy. So. I wondered if you thought about the implications of this technology. So far, we yes. don't have enough of it to predict, but had you thought about the stability implications? Uh, uh, yes, and if you're ever in Cambridge, you can come to the class on Tuesdays and Thursdays. But next Tuesday, we're talking some about this. Um, Send me your syllabus. I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the blockchain technology, uh, and then there's the crypto finance. The blockchain technology itself, uh, there's two cross currents. It could uh, enhance financial stability because there are fewer single points of failure. So centralized clearinghouses, centralized authorities, bring great benefit. I mean, there are efficiencies of scale and so forth, but they also have single points of failure. So there is an argument, and I think it's a valid economic piece, that blockchain, can, uh, blockchain technology itself, uh, having a distributed ledger, and it does come with a lot of attendant costs and complexities, but it can be more resilient because it's harder to take any one. You take down some part of the network, the rest of the network is still going. So that's just purely the blockchain technology. <laughs> Having said that, I think central banks are right to say, wait, if, a, if a, a large part of the commercial banking system or a large part of the capital markets adopt blockchains, they want to be able to know what's in the black box, so to speak. Is it resilient? Because you're really relying on, there is still trust in something. There's trust in the code. I mean, no, has, how many people in this room have ever owned Bitcoin? Okay, two, two people. Um, uh, three, I'm sorry. But you've probably, you probably not really uh, went and gone to GitHub and looked at the underlying code and so forth. You're trusting the underlying code. In fact, these three people are probably trusting a big crypto exchange as well. So there's other points of failure and other points of risk. I do think that if this market were to grow and if there was leverage in the market, when you, when you associate leverage, like the swaps market had, you could have uh, uh, challenges to financial stability. So the underlying technology could be positive. The crypto finance world, it's too early, it's too small. But if it were to grow and you layer leverage on it as well, it could be destabilizing. So those are the things to watch out for, I think. Just to follow up a little bit, uh, isn't it the case that this technology, technology is neutral, but that it would attract higher leverage, more risk taking? Uh, or do you think it's absolutely neutral on that question? Because I think that the complexity can be a way of masking and uh, participating in activities that are unregulated and... I, I, I think you raised an excellent question. I'm going to broaden it, not just to leverage, but illicit activity for a minute. Yeah. So the question sort of broadly is, does this technology and the crypto finance that it's birthed somehow uh, uh, raise the possibility of either illicit activity or just uh, excess leverage? You, you didn't use the word excess leverage. My feeling is, is that cr criminals aren't new, and even excess leverage isn't new. Um, but they might find a new avenue. And so on the leverage, the question is, is, is if, we, if we bring it inside the public policy norms, the banking rules, whatever they are of a country or of a time, the capital markets rules of the country and the time, 
I think there's less chance of that happening, what you're saying. But I think there's a great chance of it happening if it stays outside of the public policy envelope. And so if it stays outside of the public policy envelope, however it's defined, on leverage, on criminal activity, but if it stays outside of the envelope, then yes, uh, the, the, the illicit activity will flow there, the excess leverage will flow there. Yeah, when you say um, outside of the public policy envelope, that's regulation. And as we're moving to a deregulatory return, the amnesia uh, that we were talking about earlier, why isn't that uh, impulse toward deregulation uh, when combined with the availability of this technology going to lead to the risks that you just identified, either in the illicit or the excess leverage? I, I think you're right. I think there's another impulse is that around the globe, not just here in the U.S., there's a, there's a sense to compete for innovation. The, in the name of this panel, innovation and risk. So you have usually small population centers like Malta, Liechtenstein, Gibraltar, who have all passed, or their, Gibraltar has passed it, Liechtenstein's about to. Um, but they're, they're looking at legislation to attract the crypto finance and crypto exchanges. And, and these are sometimes uh, enterprises that are leaving countries like South Korea and Hong Kong or even Singapore that are not necessarily the regulatory regime we have in the U.S. and moving to Malta because the prime minister says, come, come hither because we, we want some of this activity. Mm -hmm. and, and so there's a lot of regulatory competition in this space right now as well to attract what's thought to be innovation. I just had one concrete uh, example. I want to just back up uh, uh, Gary's perspective there, which is, you know, it, it, there's this incident where Ethereum had a distributed autonomous organization that was gathering money, et cetera, it had over, I, I don't know, hundreds of millions of dollars. Or, 168 million. Right, so you're, <laughs> 168 million. Um, but then it was hacked by someone who figured out a way to sort of drain the overall organization. And the question becomes, did everybody who put their money in, did they agree that the code was law to the point where if someone figures out how to hack the code, that is the proper distribution of the money? Or are, is there an ex, something outside of code that's going to govern the execution of the code and the manipulation of the code by someone within it? And I think it has to be the latter, right? I mean, it just has to be the latter. I mean, and I think, but I, my worry is that if you get people that are true crypto, true believers about the power of code, they're going to opt for the former. And if they do that, then it becomes extremely unstable. And that's where I think the, inst the stability risks really lie. Yeah, and I think that it, it, uh, we're not there yet, and we may never be there, but a country that says, I want to adopt uh, code is my monetary policy. It might be a country in distress who just, their, 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 their currency collapses, a Venezuela or something, and in, rather than turning to the US dollar, they turn to code. But in that m mechanism, um, then, the question, then, then you're really over into the hard monetarist. And there are some, there may be some in the room that think that we should have more hard monetary policy rather than the human involvement and the judgment and the so forth. And those are great economic debates that have gone on for a couple hundred years. But this new technology, it, it, you know, is tends towards the immutable hard monetary policy approach, which is kind of an interesting add on. And I think we have time for one more question before we finish. Yeah. Gary, you saw the quants help blow up the financial system in the financial crisis. Doesn't um, that gave you pause now when you see, um, you know, this, you know, the uh, high techies of this day and age, um, you know, promoting blockchain and crypto? Uh, I'm at MIT. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I listen, I, I think, I, uh, you know, I, I, I'm going to be lighthearted, but Ted, I'm going to say this. I think technology net-net benefits society. I, that's just who I am at my core. I think that for thousands of years, but it's, it's not without its challenges. It, 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 it certainly affects who gets a job and who doesn't. It's a very challenging thing for our, our country, just, you know, as this rapid change of technology in terms of the labor force and, and, and re, re, you know, really allowing everybody to get a chance. And, and yes, in the terms of the world of finance, 
in the service of the world of finance, yes, every technological innovation comes with additional risks. Uh, but net net, I would say I would be more inclined to the positive than the negative. But does blockchain have risk? Absolutely. Artificial intelligence, as I briefly said, and machine learning. There's a lot of biases that end up in um, uh, anybody getting a credit score or getting allocated lending right now could have biases in that machine learning. The criminal justice system has biases also using machine learning and artificial intelligence for judges. And speak about I mean, the, the book, you should read his book, The Black Box. Sorry. You know? you. But, but it is a black box. Uh, and so there are risks, uh, Ted, I would agree with there are risks. But I still do believe that net net society is better off kind of exploring, moving forward, bringing things in the public policy debate and in the public policy envelope. Well, I think we're out of time uh, for our panel. Uh, and uh, before we uh, thank this distinguished group for uh, sharing their wisdom with us today, uh, I, I just want to thank them and, uh, and Professor G uh, Jordan for putting this incredible group together. I know it's a whole day uh, in a, a rich uh, intellectual banquet. Uh, and uh, I'm very glad to have had a little part of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, we're ready for our next panel. Uh, Anna Galpern, uh, oh, Rob Johnson, and uh, we've got one more on that panel. Eric Girding. She's been of council for several years and you know, joined the intelligence chief, chief of information for CIO as well in the city. She did 55 international settings here in China. China. Took her like that. I will. Big brown. Our consumers, our users, and our regulators want to know more about what's in our marketplaces. Right. We're not well, very strong. Adequate. We want to have a very good back where they have a wonderful but we can still have more street party at the forefront. Because, frankly, they said the most important consumer is really helping to make our credit scores. Because my state is really a credit decision. But now that it's in a black box, there's more that we need to be able to I was there in the early 80s. It's so exciting to hear because I, I do a lot of work on the European right here. There's obviously a right to be right of explanation in Europe. And they're going to be more I think, in the right of explanation. Why I teach among others. Do this group. That's exciting. That's, I'm so glad that they're like getting into the. Yeah, now they're doing part of it. I will. I hope it still is. Thanks for Thank you very much. Yeah. I think one of my former colleagues did that. Did that just yeah. open it? Or did it? I'll probably, because I've spoken before today, parsimonious in my first round. Again? They're not using it. He wanted it up so that. Uh, All right. So thank you to Professor Jordan and thank you to everyone who has stuck around. Um, it has been a very rich day indeed and um, I am acutely aware of the fact that we stand between you and George Akerlof. So um, um, our task, and I think that's been very much uh, true of the afternoon panels, is to try to look forward, to figure out where exactly are we 10 years later, um, rather than where were we on that day, um, and to um, figure out what our current institutional and political and economic setup means for our ability to tackle the next crisis. Um, and it's a nice time to uh, take that look back because and uh, assess where we are. Um, the institutions have matured. So the crisis was 10 years ago. Dodd-Frank was in 2010. Um, rulemaking has happened. There's been litigation. Institutions have had some time to get into their routines. So we can say in a somewhat sensible and fact-based way that we have a 
financial stability infrastructure of sorts, and we can try to assess it in a reasonably um, meaningful way. But we're also, of course, um, entering a different stage. We've entered a different stage of the financial, economic, and political cycle, um, where we've had legislation this past spring um, that is um, uh, charitably aims to um, deliver regulatory relief. Um, we've heard it called um, less charitable things uh, in the course of the day. We've also had uh, regulation. We've talked about the Volcker rule, and we're going to talk about that some more. Uh, liquidity rules that have been uh, either put on hold or rolled back. Um, and then we've also had this um, uh, sort of informal and uh, very much behind the scenes change in attitude, all of it informed by a very broad and rich um, statement of uh, a new regulatory philosophy, right? So the president's executive order um, and the uh, half dozen treasury department reports really tell us a lot about what the current administration's view is of what the financial sector should do, and also what the role of regulation is. And um, that is quite a different view than uh, what we saw in 2008 and 2010. Um, moreover, uh, all of these developments are happening, um, are not happening in isolation, but rather in a global context of regulatory and uh, uh, so that um, push and pull um, forces between uh, those who want to preserve resilience and uh, believe that enhancing regulation and strengthening regulation is the way to make financial systems more resilient, and those who want to, who think that we have overreached. Um, so our panel will uh, try to take stock of these developments and, uh, again, see where we are vis-a-vis -vis the next crisis. Um, we're very lucky to have a fantastic panel with us today, starting with Gaurav Vasisht, who is Senior Vice President and Director for Financial Regulation at the Volcker Alliance. Um, and he has deep background in uh, bank and insurance regulation uh, for the New York State. And he has uh, written some uh, very thoughtful, uh, he has done some very thoughtful work uh, recently in the field, but he's also been at the forefront of reform uh, while he was in uh, the policy world. Then we're going to have, uh, we're going to hear from Eric Gerding, um, who is Professor and Wolf Nickel Fellow at Colorado Law. Um, and Eric is the author of one of the earliest, actually the earliest and still the most interesting and creative book on financial stability regulation. My in, mom uh, paid her. True that. Um, he's also my co-author, but not on that book. Um, in the law literature, um, so Law Bubbles and Financial Regulation. If you haven't bought it, if you haven't had your library buy it, go buy it. Um, and then we are going to wrap up very appropriately with Rob Johnson, who, of course, uh, helped us start the day. And uh, uh, he is president and co-founder of INET. Um, he is both an economist, appropriately an innovative economic thinker, also a market practitioner, a successful investor. In fact, I assigned an interview with him from 1998, I believe, and it's still one of my students' favorite um, assignments uh, on the Asian financial crisis. Um, he is also a policy practitioner who has been at the cutting edge uh, of these uh, uh, developments uh, for a long time. Um, Gaurav will set the stage, uh, and then Eric will focus on institutional issues and our financial stability toolkit, and Rob will bring us home with a global perspective, as well as um, uh, considering how our crisis management has contributed to the economic and political developments um, that have led us to this moment. Um, with that, Gaurav. So uh, uh, just a, a quick anecdote that while uh, Eric was writing his very thoughtful book on bubbles, um, uh, I was uh, on the eve of the financial crisis in 2007, uh, May. Um, I was uh, uh, a young lawyer working in the council's office in the governor's, uh, in the governor's office. 
um, writing an executive order uh, that was going to create, in fact, did create um, the Blue Ribbon Commission for modernizing financial regulation, um, which uh, of the members of which included Lloyd Blankfein, uh, Chuck Prince, uh, Bob Hendrickson, and Martin Sullivan of AIG. So this was three months before the onset of the financial crisis, and that's what people were talking about. This was May of 2007. In August of 2007, you saw uh, problems in the asset back commercial paper market, and yet the world uh, was talking about international competitiveness, the same arguments that, that Sheila was talking about uh, just now. So in some ways, the world is exactly the same as it was in the eve of the financial crisis. They're making the same arguments back then, and that commission just, you know, out of sheer embarrassment, just never came into being, and everybody pretended like it just never happened. So, you know, leave the room and don't talk about it. That's that's kind of what happened at the, in those days. Uh, but I thought I'd I'd, uh, I'd I'd give an overview of what um, the deregulatory frontiers actually look like and what what the specifics are in terms of uh, what's happening. So, for the starting point uh, for me. Uh, is the executive order that President Trump issued in February of 2017, which directed the Treasury Department to do a review of all existing laws, uh, rules, regulations, statutes, uh, and financial services to identify those that uh, were inconsistent with certain core principles that uh, the President articulated in his executive order. That led to a, a full-blown Treasury review. Uh, and uh, the Treasury Department released five um, uh, reports the first one on banking, the second one on the capital markets, third on asset management and insurance, uh, the fourth was on the FSOC, and the fifth was a sort of a related, not really coming out of the executive order, but a memo that uh, was issued alongside, and that was the orderly liquidation authority, and that's um, something that Sheila referred to in her um, talk as well. Um, collectively, these five reports are hundreds of pages long. Uh, each report, for the most part, is at least 100 pages. Some are more than 200 pages. Some are slightly less than a, a 100 pages. But collectively, they make uh, close to 1,000 recommendations um, in, in every aspect of uh, finance and financial regulation. Simultaneously, there was, a, a, there was an effort in Congress that predates um, uh, the executive order um, and uh, that was led by Senator Crapo that culminated in the passage um, of, uh, of what's called, um, it's a very long title, uh, it's the Economic Growth Regulatory Relief and Consumer Protection Act. Um, yeah, no, that's right. They should, have throw, they, they should have attached that, put that in the name as well, but there wasn't enough room. Uh, uh, and, and that um, uh, legislation was um, uh, intended to primarily benefit small banks, uh, but like uh, everything else in Washington, it came with certain sweeteners for the large institutions as well. Uh, and then the, the third uh, prong of the deregulatory universe is the administrative process through which uh, regulators uh, propose rules, and there uh, you've got a recent proposal on the su uh, supplementary leverage ratio, uh, basically pegging it to what's called the GSIB surcharge without getting too technical. It's, the, uh, it's a surcharge uh, that, that uh, the, the calculation gets pegged to. Um, and some changes to stress testing assumptions um, and, uh, and also a rule um, to, to make some changes to the Volcker rule as well, which is a ban on proprietary trading by banking institutions. Um, so that is the, the universe that I'm thinking of. There are other things as well. There, there are rules the SEC and the CFTC are working on, but primarily that's kind of the universe of um, uh, deregulation that's out there. Um, my uh, overarching view of this is that while there are some good things uh, in this uh, deregulatory effort, um, on the whole, uh, I think it's a net negative. And uh, the reason I say that is because it runs afoul of some core principles. Um, number one, it's grounded in um, the unsubstantiated claim uh, that somehow the post-crisis regulatory regime uh, is a drag on the economy or has reduced market liquidity. And, you know, these are very convenient talking points for lobbyists, but uh, unfortunately the facts just don't bear them out. The data just aren't there to substantiate it. It's very convenient as a talking point in Washington to get people to act, to say, oh, you know, uh, a la May 
2007 when I was writing the executive order. Um, it's, it's sort of the same disingenuous argument. Uh, number two, uh, it runs afoul of, um, of the basic notion that we should keep uh, the historical context in mind. Um, the seeds of banking crises are sown uh, when uh, things are good, times are good. Um, and uh, you know, I think we're seeing the same dynamic now. We're, we're, we're in, a, in a good phase, people are making money. There are certainly some storm clouds ahead. Um, some people are choosing to ignore those storm clouds. But now is the time to implement counter-cyclical policies as opposed to um, you know, pro-cyclical policies. And we've done this over and over again, and, and it's, uh, perhaps it's human nature, or perhaps it's just sort of you know, ignorance of the past, but uh, we, we succumb to the same temptation um, to, to reduce the requirements. And, and, and then after the fact, we, we always tighten regulation as if this time we're gonna get it right. Uh, but then the cycle continues, it, it perpetuates and, and, and on and on and on. And I think um, we should be, policymakers should be looking inward to see, you know, are we at that moment again and are we, are we uh, acting uh, the way we should be? And then finally, I think the third uh, core principle is um, that you need to recognize that a resilience, that, that a resilient financial system is absolutely critical for sustainable economic growth. Um, you can certainly make politically expedient short-term decisions, and it might get you some accolades, but um, if your goal truly is economic growth, uh, uh, then, uh, then you know, I think resilience should really be at the, at the fore of, of, your, of your thinking. And unfortunately, that's not the case. And so we see that in the Economic Growth Act uh, with the custodial banks, as, as Sheila talked about. Um, uh, taking, having the ability to take out their central bank reserves from the denominator of their supplementary leverage ratio, and you take things out of the de denominator, the effect is that you know goes up the overall uh, fraction. Um, you're seeing um, that in the rule um, on the enhanced supplementary leverage ratio that the Federal Reserve and the OCC put out, uh, that the FDIC did not join um, in. Um, and I think that that was the right move. Uh, and you're also seeing that uh, on the Volcker rule where uh, some very important protections um, that were put in place to uh, make sure that, that certain exemptions under the Volcker rule are not evaded, um, uh, you know, that also is, uh, um, is being eroded. So we, we see that. Layered on top of that is um, the fact that we have a regulatory structure in this country, and, and others have alluded to this, that is extremely fragmented and, and, and antiquated. It's a, it's a regulatory structure that, that no one person at one, or, or a group of people at one time put together. It, it's sort of accreted over time. It's the result of political quid pro quos um, uh, over generations. And, and the people who put it together didn't know what the system was going to, what the financial system was going to look like when all of it was put together. It's extremely fragmented. And so we said in, in Dodd-Frank, let's get everybody in a room together, and we established the FSOC. And I think that that was um, very important uh, to do. But um, the FSOC does bring the underlying dysfunction of the regulatory system into the FSOC. Um, and, uh, and that's problematic. And um, it, it's also a, a little problematic that if you look at the Treasury report on the FSOC, and there's this talk now about activities-based regulation, which means different things to different people. To me, um, you know, when I, when I think about activities-based uh, regulation, and this is, uh, you know, maybe it's um, uh, too good of an example, but um, if, if one were to say, okay, the, the repo market was at the center of instability during the financial crisis, can we designate repo as an activity that's problematic? Um, and I was hoping uh, to see something like that in the Treasury report, but it was nothing like that. Uh, under the Treasury report in November um, uh, 2017, they articulate a three-step plan. The first step is um, the FSOC will get together um, and, and try to figure out if there's a problem, if there's an activity or a product or an instrument um, that is problematic. If they decide it is problematic, then they're going to go to the functional regulator to, to, to uh, beg that functional regulator to do something about it. Chances are they're not going to do anything. Then they're going to write them a letter 
They're going to say, we recommend under Title I of Dodd-Frank that you do something about this. And if that doesn't happen, then the third step is we're going to designate individual institutions. Well, how is that activities-based regulation? It's, it's, it's not, uh, in my mind, certainly. But um, there's some indication that uh, we're going to see some more uh, activity on this, uh, uh, on this front. And so we're going to look forward to, to, to seeing that. A related point uh, is uh, the Office of Financial Research, um, uh, which uh, deals with data. Um, and it's very important. Uh, one of the most important points of the financial crisis was we didn't really have data. We didn't know what was going on. And so we established the OFR. Um, but the OFR is now under attack. Uh, it's not like the CFPB. There's no political constituency. There's nobody protecting it. It just sort of sits there as an orphan. Uh, but it plays a very important role. And uh, the person heading it up now is a dual-hatted employee of the Treasury Department. Uh, the person who's been um, nominated is, is someone who's been hostile to the to the agency in the past. Um, and uh, and I think that that is problematic. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll stop. Thank you so much. This yeah. was both... Uh, rich and timely. Thank you. And a perfect transition to Eric, if, if you could elaborate on the institutional developments and where are we and where should we be? Sure. So I will make uh, five points. I'm told that's what you're supposed to do as a public speaker. Um, <laughs> one, I'm going to talk about um, tiered regulation and, and ask some questions about whether um, the May statute really makes any sense uh, at all. I'm going to ask some questions about the administrative law design of Dodd-Frank and make maybe some of the progressive people in the room somewhat uncomfortable. Um, I'm going to talk about baselines um, uh, and how we're going to be judging regulation and whether we've succeeded or failed. Um, I'll talk about what Dodd-Frank didn't do and how we've sort of um, left some things completely off the table. And fifth, I'll talk uh, as a segue to our final speaker of the day about incomplete information and what um, we don't even know we don't know. Um, so let's talk about uh, tiered regulation and thresholds. Um, I came to the conference down from the mountains, so I'm a simple country lawyer. Um, and I'd like somebody to explain to me just how Senator uh, Crapo set the, the thresholds for the May statute. Um, we talked a little bit, or an earlier panel talked a little bit about bumping the um, SIFI designation threshold from $50 billion to $250 billion. I'm not even sure I understand the $10 billion threshold for smaller community banks and why they receive the exemptions that they did. Um, the, it, it doesn't, I understand the idea of having a tiered regulatory system where we regulate riskier institutions more um, intensively. But that doesn't necessarily correlate with size, and it doesn't necessarily correlate with how that statute actually is written. Um, to me, it makes sense that you would base exemptions on having institutions that actually have simpler banking models. But the statute actually does it kind of backwards, right? It says, we're going to allow some exemptions, including some that, that you mentioned, um, for smaller banks. Um, and I guess I don't understand why smaller banks are even doing some of these activities to begin with. So um, I, I'd like someone to explain to me why we shouldn't have tiered regulation that says we're going to have um, somewhat easier regulatory standards if um, you have a simpler, narrower, whatever adjective you want to use, narrower banking model rather than just having size and 10 billion be the magic number. Um, and I'm also not um, entirely sure that it's right to be focused just on um, lower regulation for smaller institutions. So I'm only in my mid-20s, but I was told that um, there's something, at least Anna left. Because um, you look so young. Uh, the, the SNL crisis, I think, taught us that we should be worried about herd behavior by smaller and mid-sized institutions, too. We shouldn't just be worried about um, risky behavior by the biggest of the big financial institutions. 
All right, so my, that was about thresholds and questioning whether um, tiered regulation actually um, makes sense. And I think tiered regulation is here to stay. We're going to see this in the next uh, wave of deregulation, having different um, regulatory standards based on size. And that's sort of the political reality here in D.C. And I think we have to really ask whether the tiered or the thresholds that we have for regulation are actually protecting us from systemic risk. Okay, the second point, and I promise to make some of the people who are progressive uncomfortable, is I, I think we have to ask whether some of the administrative law design questions that were made or reached in writing Dog Frank actually came back to bite people. Um, so the best example is having a single director of the CFPB. That's great, right, if um, you like who is the president. Um, if you don't like who is the president, um, what works very well in terms of um, rolling out quickly new rules also works in reverse, right, where you um, can uh, roll back rules much more easily if you just have a single director rather than a multi-member commission. Um, so for those of you students who are going to be writing the next wave of financial reform legislation, think about how administrative law mechanisms work the same regardless of who's in the White House. And I think you could also say that for FSOC as well, and this is a point that, that Anna has questioned. Um, FSOC is really good at coordinating regulatory activity, or maybe I shouldn't say really good, that's an overstatement. Um, good enough. Um, it, that's its purpose, right? Coordinating regulatory actions by all of the major um, banking and securities and insurance uh, players. But it's also possible, and again, this is a question Anna raised, that FSOC could also be used as a vehicle for coordinating deregulation. Um, so um, students who are taking administrative law, think about how the choices you make um, are going to be true no matter who is in the White House and who controls Congress. The third um, point I want to talk about is baselines. Um, and what I mean by baselines is how are we judging um, financial regulation? So um, in one sense, um, some of the media reports around the May statute were, well, it's better than it could have been, right? It's better than the House version. Um, and, um, you know, I question whether that's really the right standard, right? So um, it's quite likely that Dodd-Frank is going to suffer a death by a thousand cuts. Um, and this leads me to my fourth point, which is, is Dodd-Frank even the gold standard? Um, because um, Dodd-Frank um, was a pretty complex form of regulatory engineering, and it kicked to another day questions like regulating the shadow banking system. Um, and um, you seem to like music a lot, given your earlier presentation, right? So, oh, not at all. Uh, to quote Cregan's Clearwater Revival, right, someday never comes. Um, so we never really got around to regulating shadow banking before the deregulatory system, the deregulatory uh, wave really kicked in. Um, and I think that's, um, that's a real unfinished business. So we, I think we have to keep our, our eye on not only sort of fighting a rear guard action about preserving um, good things in Dodd-Frank, but asking, okay, what could we never really get um, into the 2010 statute to begin with? And I think that's really important because, um, frankly, it's just no fun um, and I, again, I'm not from the Beltway, so I, I'll speak for people who are a little bit closer to it. It's just no fun fighting the rear guard action all the time without some idea of where the vision for financial regulation should be. Um, and my fifth point um, is let's put regulation um, to the side um, for a minute. Um, 
And this is a segue to our, our final speaker of the day. We don't even have really good, high quality information about a lot of markets, um, even after Dodd-Frank. Um, so how do you regulate or how do you even conduct central banking policy if you don't have all of the information you need about repo markets, about uh, uh, over-the-counter derivatives, which is a point that was made in the last uh, uh, panel, or um, hedge funds. Now, Dodd-Frank made some progress in all of those fields, right? We have registration requirements now for hedge funds. Um, we supposedly moved more swaps to central clearing and um, exchange trading. Um, but we still, if you try to actually write in this area, it's hard to get really high quality information about the size of these markets, about the amount of leverage in these markets, uh, about what's actually going on. So even if you don't want to, even if you're not um, looking to heavily regulate these markets, um, I just don't understand how the Federal Reserve or the central bank is really um, has a good grasp of even doing monetary policy without that kind of basic information. It's kind of like f flying a multi-trillion dollar airplane without with analog instruments without radar. Um, so uh, to quote one of my favorite TV shows from the 1980s, knowing is half the battle and we've already lost that half. Thank you, Eric. Um, on that cheery note, um, Rob. Thank you. I, uh, what do I have to do here? Okay. Is that, can you hear me? Is that good? Yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, seeing Sheila Barrett today reminds me of years ago, uh, in between the passage of the House and Senate bill, <clears throat> of Dodd-Frank, I was on a panel with Ariana Huffington, and, I, and she was right, and she said, Robert, you are quite despondent about this first bill that's passed. If you could wave a magic wand and do anything you wanted, one thing to make finance better, what would you do? And I don't know why, because it wasn't premeditated. I said, oh, that's easy. Only women get to regulate finance. <laughs> and then I said, Janet Yellen, Sheila Bear, Elizabeth Warren, and Brooks Lee Bourne been running this place since 1985. We wouldn't have these problems. Now, uh, Sheila, as you know, because we couldn't work it out, but uh, we ran a conference at INET called Women, Finance, and Society, where I said hello and goodbye, and everybody else that spoke was a, uh, was a woman. And the, there may be some truth in that, but it's a little bit how we're socialized, how we're educated, what, what feels intuitively holistic to a person. And I guess without making that, how you say, lash to the mast of gender difference, I think we have to re-educate ourselves a little bit about what it is we're after here as a society. In essence, I think finance is a mechanism and at some level, it's been far too deified in recent years relative to uh, what it produces. <clears throat> Going back, uh, I've been asked to talk a little bit about international ramifications. And for the young people who are here, I'll, I will tell you something that uh, has helped me quite a lot. I read the Bank for International Settlements, BIS quarterly report every quarter. I've been you're, doing you're. it since I was in financial speculation in the late 1980s, and I find it very informative. Uh, secondly, uh, just in relation to recent concerns, there are various scholars like Helene Ray and Hyun Shin, who's at the BIS now, who've talked an awful lot about how monetary policy doesn't quite work like we suggest it does meaning there are all kinds of problems in developing countries with incomplete financial markets so that when we shake our rattle here in the United States or in Japan or in China or in the UK uh, or the Eurozone, it makes a whole lot of ramifications and disruption and that the traditional notion that if you just floated your exchange rate, you could make it all work just doesn't bear out and the evidence is very profound when you find that people do what 
currency traders, which is what I used to do, do something called a carry trade, where essentially you buy the high interest and you finance yourself in the low interest currency and you bear the weight of the exchange risk uh, while earning that interest differential. A lot of Chinese businesses in the last few years have funded themselves in dollars and then they deploy, they transform into renminbi. And what happens is in a period when we come out of something like quantitative easing and start to raise our interest rates, tighten our credit conditions, it starts to make the dollar rise. These people with the mismatch start to lose money. They then cover their exposure, which exacerbates the rise in the dollar and, and intensifies their losses. So I think that uh, there's still a lot of work to do on the interaction between emerging underdeveloped financial markets and the behavior that, how they say, uh, emanates from our own attempts to manage our markets. Moving a little bit uh, now towards the American challenge, I guess I'm always haunted because we're 10 years after Dodd-Frank and, or after the crisis, not Dodd-Frank, excuse me, about eight years after that. And I still don't feel like, because it was such a controversial circumstance that we really come clean. The people who were critics then are still critics. The people who implemented things are, are very defensive. And how would I say, we're all humans. We all aspire to have a, a, a powerful experience in life and a legacy that we can be proud of. I mentioned earlier today, and I'm going to repeat it again now, I do not think making this about personality is productive at all. We had people named Paulson and Geithner and Bernanke and others, Larry Summers, Sheila Bear, and others. People use their moral discretion, but the systemic pressures were enormous at that time. And I, I hindsight is not even 2020, but it, but it sometimes lets you cheat a little bit in how you judge people. And I think, uh, I, I think it's quite unhelpful. I think we have to understand when we go to that point of going over the edge of a cliff, how did we get here? We have to learn why we got to the place where these people felt like they had to exercise something called TARP and preventive medicine has to be designed. Uh, I'm a little distressed right now, I must say, personally, having just read the Group of 30's most recent report about how to manage bailouts, because it acts like the game starts on the day when you inherit the crisis. And what concerns me is fortifying bailout capability generates the mother of all moral hazards. And the bailout that you can do much more confidently because you have all the tools is bigger than the one you would have if people had doubts about whether you could deliver. Now, I think these people who have advocated that, Tim Geithner played a big role in it, come from a healthy place, which is they know that going over the cliff is a lot worse than doing a bailout once you're there. But I think we have to spend as much energy on that ex ante upstream period of preventing getting there as we do in fortifying things downstream. And the more you fortify things in the bailout realm, the more re prior restrictions you're going to need to stop that moral hazard from coming to life. Uh, I, I also would say uh, that some of what's insinuated in the Group of 30 report is that we need more discretion for central banks. I think that discretion for central banks, given the poisoned atmosphere about financial bailouts without consequences for the perpetrators that's already in the wind, is a disaster for the independent, future independence of central banks. I think they'll get carved up and their political charters will be changed if the next crisis is done essentially by them away from the democratic process. I think that will in further intensify hostilities. And I think the repair 
the, the best reason to do a re-examination now is not, like I mentioned, not to harm people and make people culpable, but it's to put us back on a trajectory towards regaining trust and legitimacy in governance. You can follow, just like I have for years, the Gallup poll that's done every April on all of the government institutions in the United States. It used to be the Center for Disease Control and the Federal Reserve were right at the top. And it basically 2007, eight, the Federal Reserve crashed down to the bottom to the point where one April, I believe it was 2009, it was less respected than the IRS in the month of April. Now that, that's hard, that's a hard result to achieve. At any rate, uh, I think the, uh, I think that George Soros and I recently wrote an article, which is not an ex post revisitation. At the time of the TARP legislation, the two of us were working in, an, I used to work with the Senate Banking Committee, so I knew a lot of the staff with Dodd and Frank. And we were advocating that TARP include equity injection coupled with mortgage overhang relief. There were two reasons that we did that at the time. We thought we got more bang for the buck with, through equity than asset purchases. And secondly, we thought the distributive justice, essentially writing down bank creditors and wiping out bank equity and giving relief to people who were liquidity constrained, particularly given this little funny institution called the discount window. The, the big banks aren't gonna be liquidity constrained. The people with underneath or mortgage overhangs will. And uh, so we put this into an article for Project Syndicate and uh, Larry Summers recently wrote a rebuttal I, I encourage you to read. And he used what I thought was a magic word. Everything that Rob, and George Soros put together is not feasible. Feasible is the word that we have to unpack now about what we did in 2008 that led me to say earlier today, quote Steve Bannon, that it brought you a Republican House. A Repo I used to work for Pete Domenici. I used to cheer for and be on the Republican side. So, but, but what you see right now is a change from democratic control of House, Senate, and the White House under Obama with tremendous enthusiasm coming in the door to Republican control of both and Donald Trump as the president. And I do not think that what happened in that period with all those people I mentioned earlier who were responsible was a failure of imagination. I think that the what you might call incentives, the vested interests, the pressures of money politics, cognitive capture, revolving doors, are the, are the context and the structure in which decisions are made. And so I think uh, for myself, we've got to move in the technocratic sense. For instance, these new studies by Pasquale Noal and his author, uh, Professor Ganong, Amit Siro, the recent book a year or so ago, I guess it's now about two years ago, Atif Mian and Su uh, Amir Sufi did called House of Debt, about the macro and aggregate demand ramifications of doing mortgage restructuring, uh, and whether you involve which you might call extending maturities and lower cash flow burden or whether you change the principle. All these things I think really should be studied. So if we get to that brink again with regard to large asset markets that are signif systemically significant, we have a little more confidence in exploring a broader menu of alternatives than we did last time. Uh, but, but I think, you know, it was said to me in recent uh, months I was preparing for this and oh, a scholar who came through INET said to me, uh, Rob, the art of being a great financier in the 90s and up through the present is to learn how to work the government to create one-sided bets for yourself. And I, I think that may be a little strong, but we've got to make and enforce rules that make every, if we're going to be a market system that make people play 
So I think we need, I, as I advocated in my earlier talk today, public financing of elections, some uh, perhaps media credits. You know, people who own radio stations, television stations, they should sacrifice some of their bandwidth so not that you don't have to pay as much as Procter & Gamble to run for office by advertising your candidacy. And lastly, and my last, and I think perhaps most important, is I think we have to, you can argue about how broad or narrow the mandate of a government should be, but you should not argue that whatever mandate you decide on, the personnel, the public servants, are well-trained and well-paid and well-supported. And when I go on Fox News, what I always say is, you should support financial regulation with the same vigor and intensity that you supported the Navy SEALs that went after Osama bin Laden. Thanks. Thank you so much. I don't think we have time for questions, right? I think we are at our poetic end, and we also got this terrifically rich research agenda. We can, you know, those of you students taking notes, Activities regulation, informing effective fact-based financial regulation, um, and designing legitimate institutions for crisis prevention and crisis management, I think, are uh, worthwhile things to write about. Um, huge thanks to our panel, uh, and uh, thanks to all of you for sticking around. I want to I offer you a musical anecdote. Um, that, <laughs> you inspired that me. I had to come up with one. I think the theme of this conference should be named after a song by Sonny Boy Williamson. And the song goes a little bit like this. It took me a long time to find out my mistakes. It took me a long, long time to find out my, stake, my mistakes. But I bet you my bottom dollar I'm not fat and no more frogs for snakes. Whoa. Amen. All right. Thank you very much. Well, this has been a fabulous day. My colleagues who served as moderators made a big contribution to the coherence of this conversation. And I want to thank them all. Uh, they're not all here. They went back to their offices for the most part to do work. Uh, but Rob, you did double duty, and the Institute for New Economic Thinking has been a supporter and a very important part of the generation of this conference. So I thank him for that, and Georgetown as well. Uh, let's just take a stand-up break of a minute or two, and then we'll come back, and we have a treat for the very last set of comments uh, coming up from our Nobel Prize winner, uh, Dr. George Akerlof. All right, he'll be back. He's here, and uh, you get a stand-up break, and then we'll uh, start with Dr. Akerlof. Hi. Yeah, I'm more of a country law professor, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, he get got out well. I'm just going to minimize it for you. You want the first slide up there already? Okay. Uh, that's the one I need to do, right? Okay. Um, do you want water? Water would be. I'm gonna get a glass of water. Uh, no. Who was the most first? You know, I like my life. Who was the most first? I didn't hear my name last year. Oh, really? Oh, that's funny. Do you remember that? No, I wouldn't remember that. Thanks for reminding me. I'm just a country lawyer. <laughs> How are you? Yes, hi. Hi, how are you? Yes, right. Nice to, you gave a good talk. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, good.
It's that organ. So it's sort of an emergency. Thanks. Give you real Do you mind if I go for half an hour? Is that okay? I think it's fine because it's okay, just that's what I people who are the these are the uh, people who are committed. Then yeah, right. Yeah. We are ready to do the last act. And boy, is it a doozy. We have George Akerlof here. I love to tell the story about his career. He was at UC Berkeley. He wrote an article called The Market for Lemons. He said that it was turned down by several Publications. Now, I didn't do too badly. It did wind up in the uh, Journal of Quarterly uh, Journal of Economics. Quarterly Journal of Economics. Um, and the reason this is such a good story is that in 2001, the market for lemons, that article became the basis for his Nobel Prize. So much for those people who didn't accept the article when he first submitted it in 1970. He's a whiz, a wonder, and someone who has said in his Nobel biography, he's going to devote the rest of his career to interdisciplinary focus, sociology and other disciplines beyond economics. He did give me my marching orders. He said, keep it short. So I'll obey and thank you introduce our speaker. Let's give him a round of applause. He's the last one. And he, he deserves it. Thank you. Alan. This is, so I feel this has been a wonderful conference. I've learned a lot. And maybe I'll have to change my views on many things So if, from all of the speakers. So, so what I'm going to talk about today is about a book called Fishing for Fools. Uh, and let's see. And so that's the book. Uh, and maybe the best thing on the book is the cover, which is by uh, Ed Corrin, the New Yorker cartoonist who does these shaggy animals. And you can see some of them up there. OK. So the first and most fundamental motivation of this book is to challenge the view of the public and of economists that whatever markets do is right. Now, that has special application to financial markets. Of course, all economists would take into account income distribution and such things as pollution. But that does not exhaust, that does not exhaust why competitive markets yield bad outcomes. Contrary to free-to-choose thinking, our book shows that there's not only a good side to free markets, there's also a very serious downside. It explores the notion that markets are the playing field for deception and manipulation. Why? Because they spawn what we call fishing for fools. Now, all economists know this, and everybody here in this room knows this, but that leads to the second very general motivation. The rule of what can and cannot be published in economics leaves holes. 
There are some important things to say, but there's no way to say them that would be acceptable in any economics journal. For example, quite a few economists thought that financial derivatives would lead to something like the financial crisis of 2008. But economists could not figure, could not figure out a way to express these views in the form of a paper. So I believe that fishing for fools is one of those holes in economics. Because we all know it, it cannot be published. And because it cannot be published in journal form, it is ignored. And because it was ignored, we had the financial crisis, which is the central event, even now, of the economic history of our times. But then the book also has a subtext. It's a subtext which gradually becomes increasingly important as it proceeds. The subtext leads to a rather different view of economics. So let me begin there uh, with the theory. Okay. The book's based on conversations with the psychologist Danny Kahneman some 30 years ago. In a conversation then, Danny told me the basis for psychologists is is that we humans are machines. We humans are machines that are prone to error. The job of the psychologist is to ferret out that error. In contrast, he said, the basic notion, the basic notion of economics is equilibrium. That equilibrium, if there's a profit left on the table, someone will take up that opportunity for profit. You see such an equilibrium every time you go to the supermarket. People sequentially uh, choose what they think is the shortest line. And in equilibrium, the lines are almost the same length. That's why it takes so much time. You go to the supermarket and you can't figure out uh, which line to choose. So how to put Danny's insight into economics? Danny's insight says the free markets will just not, not just provide what we really want. That is only the case if we human machines are making the right choices. But free markets will also provide us wrong choices. They will do so as long as there's a profit to be made. To restate, the principle means that if we have some weakness or other in the equilibrium, that weakness will be taken up if there's a profit to be made. So that means amongst the business people uh, looking around and deciding where they're going to make their next investment, some will look to see if there's some unusual profits from our weaknesses. If they see such an opportunity for profit, that will be what they choose. So economists will have an equilibrium in which every chance for profit more than the ordinary will be taken up, but that includes our willingness to make the wrong choices. So let me give you some examples. So first example is Cinnabon. The motto of Cinnabon is life needs frosting, but the question is, does it really need that much frosting? <laughs> so all those sales of Cinnabons are a natural result of a free market equilibrium. And you'll find them wherever you think you would find them, like at the shopping mall or out there at Dulles Airport. So the second example comes from a metaphor. Okay? It's invented by Bob Schiller. Ken, Keith Chen and Venkat Lakshmi Narayan and, and Laurie Santos, they taught capuchin monkeys how to use money to trade. The monkeys developed an appreciation of price, they saved, and they did other transactions. But let's go beyond those experiments. Let's do a thought experiment. Okay? Supposing we open the monkeys up to trading with humans. We would give a large population of capuchins substantial incomes and let them be customers of for profit businesses run by humans without regulatory safeguard. Well, you can imagine that the free market system with its taste for profits would supply whatever the monkeys choose to buy. We would expect an economic equilibrium with concoctions appealing to strange capuchin tastes. But in this monkey cornucopia, the monkeys would not be happy. We know from Chen and Lakshmi Narayan and Ann Santos that they love sweet, sweet, fruit roll-up tacos with marshmallow fluff. So capuchins have limited ability to resist um, temptations, and we have every expectation that they would become anxious, malnourished, exhausted, addicted, quarrelsome, and sickened. So that line comes from Bob. I didn't write this. So let's now see what this thought experiment has to say about humans. Our view of the monkeys has analyzed their behavior as if they have two types of what economists call tastes. 
The first type of taste is what the Capuchins would exercise if they made the decisions that are good for them. The second type of taste, their fruit roll-up taco taste, are those they actually exercise. Well, we humans are no doubt smarter than monkeys, but we can view our behavior in the same terms. We can imagine us humans, like the Capuchins, as also having two different types of taste. The first concept of taste describes what's really good for us. But as in the case of the Capuchins, that's not always the basis of all our decisions. The second type of taste is the taste that determine how we really make our choices. And those choices may not, in fact, be good for us. So the distinction between the two types of taste and the example of the Capuchins gives us an image. We can think about our economy as if we all have monkeys on our shoulders when we go shopping or when we make economic decision. Those monkeys on our shoulders are the form of the weaknesses that have been exploited by marketers for ages. Because of those weaknesses, many of our choices differ from what we really want, although alternatives stated, they determine, they differ from what's good for us. So we're not generally aware of that monkey there on our shoulder. So in the absence of some curbs on markets, we reach an economic equilibrium where the monkeys on the shoulder are substantially calling the shot. So what does that say about economics generally? This takes us to a further proposition. Adam Smith's invisible hand statement, that's the central proposition of all economics, says that in the equilibrium of a competitive free market uh, economy, it's impossible to improve the economic welfare of everyone. For example, a change that would cause my welfare to go up would cause your welfare or someone else's, perhaps Emma's, to go down. The theory, of course, recognizes that such an equilibrium of competitive free markets might be blemished by externalities such as pollution and bad distributions of income. But with those qualifications, with those qualifications, the result is believed by economists to be true. But then, think about it. With completely free markets, there's not only freedom to choose, there's also freedom to fish. The equilibrium will still be optimal, but it will be an equilibrium that's optimal, not in terms of what we really want. It will instead be optimal in terms of those monkey on the shoulder taste. Standard economics has ignored this obvious difference for, for a simple reason, because most economists think that for the most part, people do know what they want. That means there's nothing much to be gained from examining the differences between what we really want and those monkey on the shoulders taste. Okay. But that ignores the field of psychology, which is mainly about the consequences of those monkeys. And it ignores the fact that markets enable fishing for fools. So the onus on Bob and myself in the book is then to show that in real life, fishing for fools does affect our laws. So we see that in four areas of nobody could possibly want. In all of these, we're seriously fish for fools. Area one of no one could possibly want is personal financial insecurity. Fundamental fact of economic life has never made it into the economics textbooks. Economists think it's easy for people to spend according to a budget. On the contrary, the book shows that it isn't. So no one wants to go to bed at night worried about how to pay the bills, and yet most people do. Area two of nobody could possibly want is financial and macroeconomic instability. So fishing for fools in financial markets is the leading cause of financial crises. And I'm going to talk about that presently. Area three of nobody could possibly want is ill health. But in his five-year, just to give you an example, in his five-year career, Vioxx alone caused 26,000 to 56,000 cardiovascular deaths in the US. No one wants bad medicine. And furthermore, the food industry, food with a pH, it fills us with sugar, fault, salt, and fat. According to the CDC, and this is a remarkable statistic relative to me who wrote this book, 39.8% uh, of American adults are obese, 
If you go back to the book, it says it was 35%, and that's because there's been a difference of 4% or 5% since when I finished this book, which is amazing. No one wants to be a beast. Um, and then there's, of course, tobacco, which has its own ill effects. Area four of nobody could possibly want that Rob was talking about is bad government. Just as free markets work tolerably well under ideal conditions, so does democracy. But politics is vulnerable to the simplest fish. Politicians silently gather money from the interest and use that money to show that they're just one of the folks back home. <laughs> OK, so these are prefatory notes. Okay, I'll now give an interpretation of the financial crisis of 2008 as an example of fishing for fools. Now, I believe that the interpretation I'm going to give is 100% standard. Okay? I believe it's something that probably almost everybody uh, in this room knows. Not sure whether you 100% agree with it, but I think, it, I think most people do. Okay? But I'm going to go over it in detail because I'm going to use the details of what I'm going to say to, ma to make a point. OK? So um, that's going to be useful, this detail, because it has policy implications. All right, so now interpretation of the financial crisis. So if I have a reputation, if I have a reputation for selling perfect, beautiful avocados, I have an opportunity. I can sell you a rotten avocado at the price you would pay for the perfect one. I will have mined my reputation. I will have also fished you for a fool. Okay. So such a story lies at the heart of the financial crisis of 2008. The reputation mining in question involved the subversion of the system for rating fixed income securities. The reputations of the ratings agencies, such as Moody's and Standard & Poor's, had been built up over the course of almost a century. Their task was to rate bonds on the probability of default. But in the late 1990s and early 2000s, the rating agencies took on themselves the task not just of rating bonds, but also of rating more complex derivative securities. The complexity of the payment structures made them somewhat hard to rate, and also the underlying assets, such as mortgage, they were even difficult for the raters to access. But the public, the public out there would believe whatever ratings were given to them by the agencies. And so an industry grew up, an industry grew up to do a reputation mod. So by analogy, by analogy, rotten avocados were being labeled perfect. With that label, they commanded premium prices. And so a whole Central Valley full of growers went into the profitable business of producing such avocados. And this mining of the ratings is the basic story of the financial crisis. But that's not all of the explanation. We must also explain why the production and sales of these overrated securities brought down the financial system. The answer, I guess, is simple. The ratings of these securities played a major role in their pricing. That enabled commercial banks, investment banks, and also hedge funds to borrow huge sums of money short term and invest in the overrated securities. Though the interest spreads were small, the high leverage allowed these institutions uh, to report large accounting profits. That borrowing was made with the rotten securities as collateral. For the moment, they seemed as good as gold and the ratings indicated little chance of default. But then the truth was discovered. Those avocados, perfect as they were on the outside, were really rotten on the inside. They were much, worth much less than the bankers and the finance managers had paid for them. So from Frankfurt to uh, New York to Reykjavik, financial institutions owed much more than they owned. Without bailout, they were bankrupt. So the four questions. The chapter gives the theory historical answers to four questions. So how did the ratings agencies initially establish their reputation? Well, initially, the ratings agencies did not depend upon their uh, income on the investment banks that owned, overwrote the, underwrote the securities. And the underwriting investment banks also had major incentives to oversee the ratings given to the securities they sold. As a first incentive, 
unexpected default on a highly rated bond would cause a loss of reputation to the bank. Second, the investment banks were partnerships. And the partners had most of their wealth invested in the partnership. The partnership could then be sued, so the partners could lose their whole investment. To give you an example, in 1970, with the bankruptcy of Penn Central, Goldman Sachs was sued for misrepresentation of Penn Central banks. Its total capital was about $50 million, and it was threatened with it, and the, part, the, partners, uh, uh, the partnership was threatened with bankruptcy. Thus, the underwriters who selected the ratings agencies had an incentive there to oversee them for honesty. Question two, what then changed? Well, then two things changed. The investment banks went private. And also, the ratings agencies lost their independence. The ratings agencies began to charge the banks who were underwriting the securities. In the new equilibrium, the account executives at the investment banks had an incentive to see that the securities they issued would be rated as highly as possible. So each person, you know, they're trying to sell their investment bank to this other account executive at one of the, and so what they have to promise is I'm going to get rated as possible as high as possible. Um, furthermore, uh, that's what that's what the uh, account executive at the investment bank needed because it was no longer a case where there was relationship banking in which basically it was his roommate from college, and I say his because it was his, um, from college who was going, who had now gone to Ford Motor Company or something like that and they were friends. But it was no longer, they had, it was a competitive market. Furthermore, privatization made a future bankruptcy of an account executive's bank only a marginal consideration. Thus, in the, this brave new world, both the executives of the credit agencies and those who commissioned them to do the ratings had a mutual incentive for ratings as high as possible. So it is said, and it may be true, that the ratings agencies were just naively optimistic. But if so, there were also huge incentives uh, uh, to have that naivete. And somehow, somebody who decided that they weren't going to be so naive, well, they had to worry about their job. Okay. So the first, so why were the buyers of those rotten securities so naive? Well, the first reason, reason is, well, maybe the buyers were just naive and so naive. That's one possibility. But even for some sophisticates, there were still individual incentives to buy those overrated securities. Because with the virtually unregulated market for financial derivatives, there was now a way to purchase insurance. Purchasers of such overrated securities could purchase a form of portfolio insurance if their bet did not pay off. For example, they could purchase a credit default swap. That meant if the cost of the insurance was sufficiently low, they could pocket higher spreads as long as those payments lasted. And in the event of default, they could collect the swap payment. Then question four, well, why would anyone sell such a portfolio insurance at a low cost? Well, again, the seller of the credit default swap might just be naively trusting in the ratings agencies. That's a possibility, all right? But even in the absence of such naivete, the account executive who sold that swap might have a great deal to gain if the incoming premium we're seeing it as his contribution to the firm's profits. Now, this is the classic example. For example, the AIG management back home in New York failed to see the risks that Joseph Cassano was putting onto the firm in London. Cassano was amply rewarded with annual bonuses in excess of 38 million per year in the, from all of the years from 2002 to 2007. So the huge liabilities he took on for AIG were then discovered, as we know, they were discovered in the week of the crash. OK, so that's my review. So now I'm going to draw some conclusions. Those conclusions, I think, differ from what some of you are saying. Perhaps I'm wrong, but I want you to listen at least to what I'm going to say. Um, so I'm sure the story I've told you about the crash, that's familiar. I think probably most everyone knows it. But I've reviewed it because its details are important for current policy. 
So I've been saying, and I've been hearing here at, the, at this conference, a crescendo of reports about current overextension of credit and so forth in various forms. Okay? So there's a fear about a repeat financial crisis. So I, you know, economists are not allowed to talk about this. Actually, I'm not allowed to talk about this. This is only the second time I've ever said this publicly, and I'm saying it uh, much more firmly. So I think that's a theme of this crisis. I sort of see of this conference. I see in many, many different talks such a fear. So Fishing for Fools says that if there is an unregulated opportunity for profit, that profit will be taken, whether or not that opportunity is benign. The account I've given then has described the equilibrium fish for fools that generated the buildup to the crash. We now come to implications of this description for economic policy. So I think there's an erroneous view that financial crashes occur only because of moral hazard. In this view, they only occur because people take on undue risks because they expect to be bailed out in the event of bankruptcy. Based on such view, and we've been discussing this, Dodd-Frank now greatly restricts intervention by the Fed, Treasury, and then FDIC in future crashes. It makes it, it, makes it difficult. It's both cumbersome and difficult. Now, but as he saw, the financial crisis crash, in my analysis, did not occur because of moral hazard. It occurred because of a version of fishing for fools. Some people were telling themselves wrong stories. The immediate profits from taking advantage of those fools were tremendously juicy. I've underlined juicy for you. The possibility of bailout then for, these, for most of these people, I believe that it was a marginal consideration at most. So AIG serves as a good example. Whether or not Cassano personally understood the risk, he still had massive incentive to sell all those credit uh, default swaps, et cetera. That means the curtailment of policymakers' ability to intervene in financial markets will not prevent all such crashes from occurring. So, my view is that 2008 would have occurred whether the bailouts were fully anticipated or not, that at most they played a secondary role. Thus, there's not only a need for regulatory powers to prevent such crashes from ever occurring, and I've heard many of you give very good pleas, and I agree 100%, 1,000%, wherever you see some, such a thing, you, we, you want to have regulation and you want to prevent it, okay? But also, if and when such crashes do occur, there's a need for additional powers to make emergency interventions. So, as we've been discussed, has been mentioned, just two weeks, Bernanke, Gartner, and Hank Paulson made a plea for additional emergency powers in the event of another crash. I see such powers as urgently needed. That, of course, I see as one of the messages of this conference, even though other people seem to disagree with me. So, it may be difficult to predict where and when the next crash is going to come. I don't see anybody here with a clear prediction as to exactly when, it, when, it's going, when and where it's going to come, but people are touching on the types of things which are going to cause it. So, let me give just some history. This is fairly recent history. Um, 1988 gave us the portfolio uh, insurance crash. Ten years later, long-term capital management threatened to bring down the financial system, and luckily there was a tough night at the New York Fed, and that was avoided. And in the absence of heroic intervention, 2008 is widely led, believed, uh, that it would have led to the second Great Depression in the absence of that intervention. So, um, natural occurrences. Fishing for fools, then, I think the theory that we have here says that such threats are natural occurrences in insufficiently regulated financial markets. 
They are a natural outcome in competitive free markets. This is just what is going to occur. Um, so we need regulations to prevent such crashes, and we also must be prepared for them when they come. So that's what fishing for fools economics tells us. This, is from the mo this is, comes from one of the most basic principles of economics that you see every time you go to the supermarket. It's just as simple as those lines at the supermarket. OK, so thank you. George, do you want to take a question or so? Yes. If, if there are questions. If there are questions, feel free. Yes. Uh, in this format, or we will go for our reception here, and you can talk to George there. But if you have a question now, okay. we have let, a mic for you. Let me take you. the question from Rob. Okay. So oh, Rob. I want to have a question here. from Rob, because I almost always agree with everything Rob has to say. This may be the only time that I've ever disagreed. That's why I'm asking you a question. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I think I was uncomfortable with your characterization of moral hazard as being kind of like a deliberate strategic action. Okay. What I sense is that when you do things like let Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs come into the discount window one day before the crisis, when you do all kinds of things to show the world that these people will not fail, you take the default risk premium out of their funding cost. And without thinking about moral hazard, they start to gain market share and be able to take more risk because the price system's not telling them anything. So I don't, I don't think it's a okay. commission of moral hazard, almost, almost immoral action. I think it's a consequence of how the market prices okay. what takes place. OK. Um, OK, I, I agree with that. Uh, I mean, I believe that the people who were doing this thinking, uh, so I think we don't know whether the people who we thought who did the bad stuff in the crisis, I think we don't know whether they did it intention intentionally or whether they did it unknowingly. But the thing is that those bad intent, those bad unintentional I think we can't, I think that we don't know why we think what we think. So that I think we may never be able to know whether it was intentional or not. So now deal, now Rob's second part of Rob's question. Okay, so I was thinking about this talk today and whether I was right or wrong. Um, I decided I was right, but I may be wrong. So going back to the savings and loan crisis, of the 1980s, I feel that was 100% a, um, a, a moral hazard crisis, that the reason the savings and loan, uh, loans, the especially, the, especially the worst ones, were able to get their money was that, that, that they could get, that it was guaranteed, they thought, by the FISLIC. Now, this other crisis, I just don't, I, I don't see that, that that logic applies. I, I don't see that the people the, that uh, the people who were being loaned that money that the, that it was their the people who were loaning who were taking out the loans. I don't see that the loan the people who were giving them the loans were thinking about whether the bailout would be there implicitly or not. So that's my that's my view. I did think about your question. Yeah, right. So. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I, see, I mean, maybe we haven't said it. Maybe we didn't say it yet. But I agree with you. It, it needed to be further. It needed yeah. to be more conscious of bail and those yeah. issues that started to show up. Yeah. So I, don't, I think uh, I think that there's a problem with more happens to liability holders mm. than yeah. uh, the BS. Um, and I, and I, I, think, I think those who invested in bank debt absolutely have been exempted from much state bank debt. I, I absolutely think that mm. there was a sudden cost. I think that attitude is being enforced from the yeah. show up. Particularly in the yeah. short term um, yeah. money markets. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I think 
the assumption was the government would not let these big banks go down. And um, so, and, and I think that's, I agree that that's where the moral hazard is. It's not with the bank manager so much making a conscious decision, it's that you lower their, their borrowing cost, which increases them their, you know, then they game it. They take on a lot more leverage, which makes them even more unstable. Um, and on the bailout authority, um, I don't, I think I only have a disagreement with, the, with, with Tim and Hank and Ben on the 13-3 authority. Okay. The you know I, I really don't understand so the, the 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 liability guarantees it's not a priority with me to undo that but the liability guarantees were were actually I think more effective in terms of uh, minimizing distortion you could put them on you could take them off quickly they didn't add to the money supply whereas some of the the, the credit facilities the Fed put in place. It, you know, or I think still, some are still being wound down. So there really is no logical reason to leave thirteen three in place and, and limit those two. But the, the only thing, the only way thirteen three is limited is with a one off. So they they can't take a city group or an AIG or whatever and say, okay, we're going to give you loving attention. Okay. And I think that's appropriate now that we have Title II. And and I I do think that you will have you will create incentives for large financial institutions to uh, rely too much on their government relationships if they think there is this discretion at the Fed. And, uh, and I find that very troubling. So I would also say that Dodd-Frank expanded bailout authority. That's something yes. that people haven't talked about. But yeah. Dodd-Frank expanded the Fed's bailout authority. They can now lend to clearinghouses. They could not do that before. That. Yep. And they can do that on a one-off basis. So they can, yep. you know, that doesn't have to be generally available support. So I, I'm not sure there are huge lines of disagreements here, but but I, I do think it's fair to point out that 13.3 uh, uh, is only for a one-off bailout. And the Fed still I, has I know a, lot of, yep. a lot of authority to okay. provide. So, so let me make two points there. First of all, I'm worried about the FSOC. Yeah. As mentioned, the FSOC's a cumbersome institution. Yes, it is. I agree with that. Second thing is, uh, I think it's easier uh, to uh, rescue the first domino rather than to go, rather than to wait till you get to the next dominoes. Now, it may well be that in a crisis, you could. You, you can have a loose definition of who is the first domino. So let's, in the case of Lehman, you could always say that it was some other thing that had, there were other things that, have, smaller things, as you know, which were failing. So may, maybe they could stretch it. But, um, but if you think of Lehman as the first domino, I would have liked them to have yeah. come in for well, Lehman. Well, no, it, sorry? Bear and Bear Sturts. Well, but yeah, so I think. Uh, I think, that first, I think that first domino will go into Title II now. The first domino will be the weakest domino. That would go into Title II, which I think would send a market signal to others that they need to, you know, there was a lot of self-help that could have been done that was not done. I think we assumed when we were writing this that there would be a triage and that if, if you know, is it a domino, is it an idiosyncratic, or is this the starting a cascade? If it comes truly system-wide, then there would be system-wide support coming in. Yeah. But um, but I think the first domino would absolutely go into Title II, and I think that's that's a good result, because that sends a signal that okay. take care of yourself, right? And uh, and don't just rely on the Fed to now come in and lend you trillions of dollars again. I, I you know, I, I think, too, just the economics of this are... are, are, are um, you know, if you look at financial crises in the past and they've really led to deep recessions or depressions, it's because government didn't do enough, right? So historically, I can understand why the bias would be that. But I think if for our democratic system, the the impact that this had on people's attitudes towards their government and whether the game is rigged, and to go through that again and kind of have a financial system where bailouts become the norm, that really scares the hell out of me. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think that's... Uh, Regardless of whether you agree in the technical provisions of Dodd Frank, whether there should be more or less or whatever, mm -hmm. just in terms of how we talk about this publicly, I think the direction should be prepare, be accountable. Okay. It shouldn't be we're going to write big checks again. Okay, I think we're close to agreement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I would like to start. This is I'm Ed Kane from Boston College. I had this problem about the supermarkets, and I realized that after a little while that I was getting in the wrong line, that to look at the shortest line, the people moved up 
You know, they looked shorter, but there were more people there because the guy was slow. I see. So I look for the spacing. I see, yes. And so I think everybody should learn that eventually, that the spacing tells you uh, a lot more than just the length of the line. But about the SNL mess, you know, yeah. uh, people that, I mean, I've studied this all the way up. I talk with lots of uh, SNL managers, mm -hmm. and th they understood the, that physics could never support mm -hmm. the size of the hole in their their uh, yes, uh, right. uh, no, yeah, aggregate balance sheet. Uh, they were sure that politically they were strong enough to influence the, the government's reaction. Yes. So that's, I don't think that's moral hazard. I think it's, it's wrong to call that moral hazard. Oh, okay. I think I it's a bargaining situation mm -hmm. where you say, I'm, this, I'm moving in this direction, and when I get there, what mm -hmm. can I do? And I think that's illustrated in the last crisis. So when you had a big meeting that they've described in all these books, uh, the world's going to come to an end. What are we going to do? And investment bankers were in charge. You know. Um, George, I had a question uh, about your fishing definition. You said that the unregulated opportunities for fishing, when there are these unregulated mm -hmm. opportunities, fishing will occur. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, then it strikes me that the primary effort should be focused on prevention, not bailouts. 13.3 is a bailout provision. Yep. So why do you put your solution in a basket that's not related to your diagnosis, which is when there are unregulated opportunities for fishing, fishing will occur. OK, so this is what my, so yes. I, I was careful in what I said. Okay. I didn't put huge amount of emphasis, but, I, but my view was, of course, you want to keep this darn thing from occurring. But, you know, so you don't, want, uh, you don't want your teenage kid to go out in the car and have an accident, okay? But you don't want to have a, you're not so worried about moral hazard that if there is, is an accident, that there's not a hospital or an ambulance to take care of them. So my view is, yeah, this is like the teenager go, teenagers going out and driving the cars. Some of them will have accidents. You want to have a good system of medical care for what, for what happens after the accident occurs. So yeah, so I'm exactly where we don't want to have any of this, but just think about it now. And just think about what we heard from some of the speakers about the, uh, the extent to which there's deregulation occurring that, in fact, there's deregulation occurring, which is going to make this more difficult. There are capital requirements that are too low. I think there are markets that, that we haven't discussed uh, that, are, that are much too frothy, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. And so, so these things are going to occur. And then I think I'm arguing for the, for the ambulance system, for the fire department, and so forth. Okay, uh, but Rob's point is that this is mispriced information about future rescues and that that is built into the behavior. So your distinction between whether it's intentional or accidental really doesn't make a difference because yeah. Yeah. it is an accident that causes externality. Yeah. And that is mm -hmm. the question, who should bear the cost of those externalities when there is an incentive built okay. into the structure, hospitals, comfy beds, and all kinds of other rewards, 13.3. Okay. Uh, OK, so let, I can give you my opinion on this. Yeah, it's that's what It's not going to be hear. an opinion that other people are going to like. Okay. <laughs> Good. My view is I'm a macroeconomist. What I see is if, you don't, if we don't have a sufficient system, we're going to get the Great Depression. And we have to remember that the Great Depression 
ended up in World War II. I feel that the costs of, of not coming in at that appropriate moment, of not having the appropriate ambulance system, is going to be so hugely costly that I don't even care very much where these costs come from. I think they're trivial relative to what. So that's me. I'm a macroeconomist. If I were a microeconomist, yeah, I believe, yeah, I care about those costs. But, but I consider they're not that big. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, professor, a quick question, a uh, big picture question. Uh, you mentioned that we are all susceptible for this type of fishing. Yeah. And it seems like all our regulation is based on economic models that assume rational actor hypothesis, right? Do you think, given what behavioral economics uh, brought to light, that we will have in a foreseeable future a better model than the rational actor model? Yeah, yes, of course. It seems to me that the uh, that behavioral economics is just more general, that it includes rational behavior, but then also irrational behavior. And furthermore, I don't believe that the, that the current state of behavioral economics is sufficiently inclusive. It's mainly based on psychology, mainly based on individual thinking, whereas it, I think that that a much more general story is that what motivates us, what causes action are the stories that people are telling when they, when they take their actions. And we have to incorporate the how those stories are generated and what, what, it, what is being told. And so I think there's a much greater generalization of how to do economics that's embedded in this. So it's possible to make it operational. Yeah, right. Yeah, but we can't, yes. So I think we're getting there. But, uh, but one step at a time. That's a, this is what, one of the things that, that I net. Oh, OK. Rob, this is the last question. And uh, we're all due to have a glass of wine, a soda, a uh, refreshment after this last question. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> I want to wait, but George, you talked about the savings and loan bailout. And my sense is there's a dynamic in the history of financial discipline, where at the time of the Depression, they installed deposit insurance. And then they said, we've got to restrict the asset side of the balance sheet because we've anesthetized the concerns of the depositors. Then as banks got larger, they started to use what we call wholesale liabilities. And then people said, well, those are the smart guys, the big wholesale people that own you know, bonds and subordinated debt and what have you, they can discipline what the asset side does. Then we got to the place where the concentration of big banks were intertwined with each other. And people said, we need to do something where we guarantee and stabilize the entire liability side for these big banks because it's systemically dangerous. And we had a notion, which I know the Minneapolis Fed really promulgated, called prompt corrective action. Like we have a goal line in a football game and knows to put his hands up right as you cross the goal line and then you can stop deep losses. You don't have forbearance and that's how you protect the system even though all the liabilities are anesthetized and that just didn't bear out, I don't think. But my, my concern about the moral hazard of today is that the big guys are treated like they have no fault default premium, the little guys are treated like they still do, which gives them a competitive advantage as the big guys, and it does misprice risk and lead to, how you say, excessive, how you say, excessive capacity without other restraints being explicitly put in place. Okay, okay so I don't see, the th I don't see, I may, I agree that it Thanks, misprices Rob. risk. I don't see that we have any choice, any reasonable choice, other than what I'm proposing. And so we're captive to fishers. Yeah. Well, the that, thing that's is, what so, you're no, describing. I'm sorry. I want to. I want to take that back. What I <laughs> see as the. Uh, I think that what we ought to do is exactly what Sheila said we should do, which is we should get be sure that the banks, et cetera, are capitalized, and that you're not allowed to be a SIFI. You're not allowed to be strategically 
a systemically important financial institution uh, without regulation. It just seems that that's okay. common sense. But then we need we need the ambulance or the fire department. Okay, so thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. That was the last question. Thank you for your patience, staying until the end. Your reward lies at the back of the room. Thank you very much. A wonderful conversation. And Well, also, what's, what's worse is, you know, the subways. I figured if you ever want to get an airborne disease, right. you, 